welcome to Krillpet Arctic World Series. Today we're in our third day of the Femin race. And with me in studio, I'm honored to have Bruce Lee, uh, the Yukon Quest winner and seven time finisher of the Adidarod. And I also have producer and uh, reporter. Greg Heister. Hi and welcome. Hi, Marie. Hello. Great to be here. Day three, right? Yes. And what a race we have. Yeah. yeah this is going to be crazy right to the finish. W uh, when do we expect the finish? Well, uh, we're sometime tomorrow morning, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's And it's tight right at the front, so it's going to be dark when they finish, it looks like, or right at sunrise. We'll see how fast they cover this next section of trail but of course we're coming up on a six hour layover and that will probably push them into the wee hours of the morning yeah and overnight uh, Lars Monson scratched uh, on his way to the fourth uh, checkpoint Drevsjö um, uh, in a video he posted on Facebook he says that it's no drama uh, but his knee hurt so bad and he didn't want to risk his leg now uh, what do you think about Lars Monson scratching it's always disappointing for a musher once they put in the effort of training and showing up at a race to not be able to complete it. But it's always a, de it's always a decision ba based upon, one, what's best for the dogs. If they need to go home, they need to go home. You don't want to overstress them. And I know there's been this constant conversation about his knee hurting and maybe that's it maybe and that would be a reflection about dog care too because if he can't keep up with them you you just have to throw in the towel so to speak and maria in all my years around these events when when mushers have to make that decision it's excruciating and you know lars is tough so this is something that i'm sure was a very difficult decision for him and one that uh is probably still difficult at this moment knowing that he's not out on the trail where he wanted to be so uh, for them to make these decisions, they're very, very difficult to make. Yeah. Uh, yesterday, he had a bit issue with some of his dogs got diarrhea. But in this video on Facebook, he says that they got rid of it. So, but at least they got a run. Yeah. They, uh, they had some miles out there, right? Right. And if he's going to do other races, that's something that's always on a musher's mind, too, is I don't want to really run these guys down so much that my next trip or my next race is being impacted by how I misjudge the dogs in this one. So it, it, as Greg is saying, it's usually a highly emotional decision for a musher to pull out of a race. And it's like a climber being on a mountain, right? If you go up there with an injury or you go up there with something that could get worse, inevitably it does. When you put yourself in positions like these mushers or a climber does where you know that you're heading into a place that uh, is physically demanding emotionally demanding injuries get worse and i'm sure if he's suffering through a knee injury and if there's some sort of structural damage to that knee because we're not sure he's been in front of a doctor yet to really get that knee checked out it's something that he could make worse and certainly affect the rest of his racing season and i know he's got big hopes uh yet to come this winter yeah and greg you said he's a tough guy yeah. uh, large Monson actually crossed canada like he, yeah. he walked across the entire Canada and that's a, a long way. Yeah, he's the real deal. Uh, you know, that's what we love about Lars and that's what we love about uh, these mushers, right? Is that they're, most of them are, have the spirit of being great adventurers and they're willing to go anywhere uh, that the globe is covered in snow and ice with a dog team. And so uh, Lars is certainly one of those guys that encapsulates what it is to be in this lifestyle and why it is that, that people still run across the north country of this planet with dog teams. It's an excruciating decision that he made today, but I know in, in the long run it's probably best for him to get off the runners, to get home, to get that knee fixed up, and to get on with this winter. Was uh, Lars one of the big favorites in this uh, race? Well, he has a lot of history of competing in races, but you know, I would say Lars, more than being a highly competitive racer, would be in the category more of an adventure race racer, and he says that himself. I, d I don't mean anything about him not having a good dog team, but he likes being out and having adventures. Like you said, he walked across Canada. That wasn't even a race, right? That was just fun. something to do for fun. <laughs> so as far as our highly competitive rate teams, which we see up front right now, I don't think he ever really fell into that category, to be honest. But. 
No. Now, uh, I know Dallas have an update for us, uh, looking at the graphics for where the mushers have been this night. It was an exciting night last night as the teams left Tristel checkpoint and took off. We watched a little bit of this yesterday evening as we wrapped up our live coverage. We had Thomas Warner take off in front, uh, Barbara Inuin, uh, Petra Carlson, Brigitte Ness, Robert Sorley, Vicenin um, kind of taking off in our lead pack there. And these guys had a nice run over there. And this is a really fun time for me to start watching the run speeds and seeing how the mushers progress. Now, if we watch number five, Robert Sorley, we see that he had a very good run time and made up quite a lot of ground on the mushers ahead of him there. Um, towards the back of the kind of the end of the top 10 here, uh, we have Johansson, Fred Inland, Janssen, Hoffman, and uh, I think we had um, Hagenson in there in number 10. Rogne. So these guys all were making their way down the trail. As we move down a little bit farther, we see Werner held on to his lead as he was heading over to the uh, Drevsha checkpoint for the second time. And uh, however, he did lose a little bit of ground in this top five pack here. We see the numbers kind of shifting. We see uh, number three at this point, Birgitta Ness, making a good run, making up a little bit of time. Petra Carlson's speed was a little bit less so strong. Sorley was able to make up quite a lot of time there and actually uh, progressed a few positions. So this is a very telling run. I think this is where the race starts to shake out a little bit as they made their way over to Drivshu checkpoint uh, for the second time. Again, they went out, stopped at the Trestle checkpoint, and then came back down the same trail to this checkpoint here. Piling in here, the mushers uh, start to decide how long to rest because this is not a mandatory stop. So as they pull in here, it's the big question of how long is each musher going to stop at this stopping point. Um, there's quite a lot of race left. They're going to have a good distance to go before they reach the next mandatory stop. So some mushers might take a longer break here, some a little bit of a shorter one, and then take a longer one at the next stop. So uh, what we saw here was a few of the mushers um, Kind of predict predictably, Thomas Werner stayed a little bit longer at 323 and will not leave as the lead musher. Um, behind him or coming into the checkpoint was Robert Sorley and Brigitte Ness. Robert Sorley had a very good run time coming over here, um, as did uh, Brigitte. And they t both stayed about uh, two hours and 46 minutes um, approximately taken off. So here we have in the lead, Birgitta Ness taking off in first now, Robert Sorley in second, Thomas Werner in third after taking a little bit longer rest, but he also had a bit slower run time, so he's probably trying to get some of that speed back. Behind him, we have Carlson in fourth and uh, Barbara Inuin in fifth now, and they're kind of our top five pack, and you see they're starting to build a little bit of a lead over the rest of the mushers that'll be coming along behind them here. This run is also really interesting to watch as now the mushers are not having the long mandatory stop and we're going to see which teams can sustain the pace they've been doing on the amount of rest that they can kind of uh, take on this competition while staying near the lead. Behind them we have kind of our second pack here, uh, the next group of mushers and this is a thick one. We're going to see a lot of positions chaining, changing but in that group uh, we have towards the front Johansson, uh, I'm sorry, Rolf. Yeah, Johannesson, Hagenson, Rogne, Friedland, Janssen, Volen, Hoffman. Uh, these guys are all super competitive mushers. This is such a competitive race that we're seeing a, a tight second group, and this is going to be a real battle for getting that sixth place, and some of them may even be able to catch up with the lead. Coming into the checkpoint of Servo, we had uh, kind of that same top five group pile in there. It was very interesting to look at the run times in that section as well. Uh, we saw Rover Sorley's speed come out again as uh, his real strength, his real weapon here. He did that run in about five hours and three minutes. So he made up about 27 minutes on Birgitta Ness, who left ahead of him there. Um, very good run for Robert, and I think that's going to put him in a solid position as he leaves this checkpoint. Behind him, had, we had Petter Carlson in there with uh, another good run time. Uh, Brigitte Ness a little bit slower. Thomas Werner at 532. So this is the checkpoint of Servan right here. We have uh, kind of the aerial view. 
You can see it's a little more forested in here. Uh, this looks like a great camping spot for dog teams as they pile in there and they all get lined up. A little more protection from any wind. Uh, the dogs will be more calmed down now, so I expect this would be a quieter checkpoint, providing for a very good rest. You can see there's not a lot of people, not a lot of distractions. This is a great spot to stop and rest dogs. You can see that there's some teams still remaining there. Many of the teams have moved on on the, on the trail at this point. Now we looked at the map and uh, now we'll get an update of the highlights from uh, yesterday. He's taken off out of checkpoint number three, having completed his mandatory six hour rest. So he is now in the lead of the race and out of uh, Tristle checkpoint. And you see completely different body positions with these dogs leaving versus coming in. Their tails are up. They're in a little bit different gait. They're excited to go, but it's different than looking at his team coming in. And that's just merely because they're getting up off the straw. Yeah. They're beginning to stretch out. Yeah. They're getting back in to the running mode. Also, they're kind of excited. They're like, hey, we're going again. This is fun. You see, they're looking at the watch. The official keeping track of the time here as well. We're getting down to the last few seconds and minutes. Uh, so obviously, she's going to be aware of where Thomas is right in front of her. And it looks like she's uh, got the all good or all clear here, ready to go. Big Gets smile. The second snow anchor picked up there. This is a nice looking dog team. They're ready to rock and roll out of here. Off they go. And here we go. Petra Carlson heading out of Tristle Checkpoint. I've been impressed at the way these first three teams have left the checkpoint. Now, obviously, they've been well cared for and, and well rested, but they've looked really good leaving this checkpoint. I like how these guys are looking, though. There's obviously no, not any serious stiffness in the, in the muscles, um, which tells me that after doing the first section of the race, that wasn't too hard for them. It wasn't more than they were prepared for. It wasn't, it wasn't more than six-hour rest could fix, and that's what she had. It was a you know, little over a six-hour rest here. So that's very important to, to have them leaving this checkpoint looking really, really sharp. And I think Birgitte has done a very good job of positioning her team to be leaving this mandatory six in a good position with a nice team. And there she goes, taking off out of the checkpoint of Tristle. And you can see the moisture. And that's an even looking team. Footprints there that the dogs are pushing down into that water. And these helicopter shots are great to show what the trail is like, how there's overflow, what we call overflow on the ice for quite a distance there. So back out to five kilometers out on the trail, we have Barbara here um, cruising along nicely. You now she's definitely setting a brisk pace out here. We still see this really soft trail and it's gonna be a few more hours before things start to cool down. So it might be a while till this trail starts to freeze and we might see the teams that leave a little bit later than them um, have, a, have faster run times than them. But at this point, I don't think you can afford to be too far behind here, at least not when we're talking about a couple hours or how much time it would take to make a significant difference on the trail. So Robert hits the trail. That's nobility, right? That we get to watch go down the trail. And, and what a great character of the game, uh, a tremendously dry sense of humor, and obviously a, a real professional, an elite guy in these sports and uh, in this sport and, and just a wonderful guy to have out on these trails. All right, here back in the checkpoint, um, this is, I think we got uh, Johan Vesenen. Yeah, uh, Johan Vesenen uh, getting ready to go. Very nice looking dog team here and there's some familiar faces. There's <coughs> many dogs in this team from kind of our genetics. So I, I, I like what this team looks like because it has a lot of similar athletes in here. Johan's getting ready to go. And it looks like he's taken off here. He may have to pull up and stop at the starting line. Nope, it looks like he's uh, good on his time, ready to go. He's taking half the straw bed with him, just in case. <laughs> and you see him hop off the sled there to kind of let that stuff clear out from underneath the sled. The, the brakes and the track that we use to slow the dogs have a lot of spikes. So when you leave that straw, oftentimes it does collect a lot of it with you. Right, hey, real quick, guys, I'm going to cut in here. We've got uh, Thomas Warner about... Uh, 30 kilometers outside of the Tristle checkpoint. We're catching him here live as he's coming cruising down the trail. That's almost uh, 19 miles out of the checkpoint there. 
But nice looking team. At this point, we can start to see what these dogs look like out on the trail. They've settled in, they've had time to warm up, and they're moving nicely out there. He was coming by, they still got spectators out there and they're happy to see him. And he's leading this race and it seems like he's caught another gear here. And this is uh, Barbara um, coming along here with a nice looking team. Yeah, Barbara Inuin, I'm trying to get a good clean look at the dogs. So they went down a little hill and then climbed up the next one there. So got a little slack in the line. As we're looking at the map here, we see Thomas Werner out in front here in first place, um, last year's champion and also last year's champion from the Finnmark Slopa. Behind him, we have Barbara Inuin in second place. Um, Stannis, about an equal distance there. If we drift on back down the trail a little bit here, we're gonna see Petter Carlson in third place. Now there's that other dot there, but that's still a musher going the other way. Behind him, we have Birgitta Ness. Um, Moving along nicely. She had a nice looking team leaving the checkpoint there. As we drift on back down the trail here, we have Robert Sorley in fifth place, and then uh, Johan uh, Vesenin coming along in sixth place. And they are the mushers we have currently on the trail out of the trestle checkpoint. And I think soon we'll have some more joining them on the trail here. So going back out down to the trail, this is uh, Johan Vesenin coming along right now. I'm, I'm liking this team. Again, I, like I said, uh, I like the look of the dogs because some of them kind of come from the genetics that I am used to working with and mushing. In fact, some of these dogs I was uh, had the privilege of racing last year. But nice looking team, cruising along. Guys, I think I think what we're seeing here is Birgitte has actually overtaken Petter Carlson. Okay. I think she left behind him, um, okay. passed him on the way here, and and so now he's probably drafting off of her, right? So again, when a team passes from behind, like we were just talking about a few moments ago, that's actually beneficial for both teams because now essentially Petter has faster lead dogs if he can keep up and if he wants to keep up. What I hate to see here is a faster team pass me and then my dogs try to keep up with that team and that's not the speed that I want to go. We got a team coming along. Who we got here? I think this is... Oh, and dog's trying to <laughs> take a little bit of a detour, and we're going to have a few clothesline oh. people, I think. Oh, there we got the dog team stopped. Um, dog's a little confused as to where we're going here. <laughs> but all the fans are <laughs> helping get the team lined out, getting these guys figured out in the right course. This is Robert Sorley. That's, uh, yeah, that looks like we got Robert Sorley here. Yep, there he's got her lined out. Does a thank you high five for everybody as he goes on by. It can be confusing when you got a big crowd and uh, you know there's trails all over, everything's packed down. It's not always clear to the dogs where to go. And we're gonna take a quick look at our leaderboard as it stands right now. Out in front, we have Thomas Werner. He left the checkpoint in first place and is still in first place as he makes his way over to the next checkpoint, checkpoint number four. Um, behind him, we have Barbara Inuin in second place. Um, Really nice looking dog team as well there. All, every team we've seen so far has been beautiful. As we drift on back the trail here, we're gonna see Brigitte Ness, and she's starting to pull a little bit ahead of Petra Carlson. Now she left the previous checkpoint behind Petra Carlson, has moved up into third place, Carlson in fourth place. As we drift back down the trail a little bit farther, we should encounter Robert, Robert Sorley here in fifth place. Another beautiful looking dog team and a very uh, a talented musher as with all of these guys. Man, this is a loaded field up here. One good musher after the next and it's anybody's game at this point. Um, next, we have uh, Vesenin, Johan Vesenin in sixth place. I always struggle with that name, but another accomplished musher there with some nice dogs. Then we have Pete Johnson, or I'm sorry, Ralph Johannesson in seventh place and Ronnie Friendland in eighth place moving along down the trail, kind of close together there. There's kind of interesting to see these little gaps and then next two mushers are closer together and they're gonna kind of begin to meld into packs in this race. I think they're gonna start to separate out some of these guys. Uh, then we have Pete Janssen and Lars Hoffman and then Daniel Hagenson in 11th. So that's nine, 10 and 11, Pete Janssen, Lars Hoffman and Daniel Hagenson there. As we work back down the trail, uh, here we go. We have Nicholas Rogne, and then uh, yeah, that team was a that was a nice looking team we saw leaving there. A lot of enthusiasm from Nicholas. Um, going back, we have uh, Lars Monson in 13th position here, and then on the trail we have Volen, and I'm trying to get a clear view of who we got behind him there. Um, 
Gerard right next to him there. These mushrooms are right together. And uh, there's a few more that should be on the trail and getting out of uh, the trestle checkpoint soon. But that gives us our top 15 right here with Gerard and Volen uh, very close together. So Robert Surly has taken the lead and uh, following up is uh, Birgitte N Ness really close. What do you think? Well, it's going to be a good race, and uh, Greg and I were just looking at the tracker here that we have, and they're within sight of each other, we figure. So they've kind of passed a couple times. Uh, it's really great to see her, Ness's team in there. You know, if you remember yesterday, that was one of the teams the helicopter followed, letting us see leave the mandatory six. And I think we all commented on how good her team looked yesterday. She had a big team of 12 dogs, and they were moving really really nicely uh, out of the checkpoint um i'm not surprised robert is where he is versus looking back on how we saw him set up the beginning of this race and that's what we were talking about a little more rest and strategic points using speed as his main weapon and adding rest to it you know, and the, the thing that I would like to point out is, you know, we have this kind of upbeat music behind all this stuff. You watch Dallas go through the tracker and what happened overnight, and you see teams kind of zooming down the trail and ending up in a place. Well, that was a lapse time of over 16 hours from where we went off the air yesterday to where Dallas had them today. So think about that in 16 hours. Uh, so a lot happens in over overnight. And so even though right now, according to this tracker, and there is always a plus or minus margin of error with these numbers and with this tracker, because there's a ping that goes up to a satellite, the ping comes back down, it takes time, they do it at different points. And so there's always a plus or minus margin with this. But you know, according to the tracker right now, they're within 350 meters of one another. You should be able to see that. But when you consider they're only going to go nine or 10 miles an hour, one might be going 9.1, one might be going 9.2 miles an hour. So think about the amount of time it takes for that team that is a tenth of a mile faster to catch somebody who's 350 uh, meters in front. It's it's a really slow evolving race uh, and we can't lose track on that. No. And our expert Nina Skramsta is on site. Nina, can you give us a report from uh, the trails? Well, Maria, what happened last night was quite surprising actually because one of the absolutely most profiled mushers of Norway also competing in the ID three times, Lars Monson, he actually had to scratch from the Femin 650 race. He was going out of the three seal checkpoint with a very strong team of 12 dogs and climbing to the mountain, going over to the checkpoint of Dresha, he actually decided to scratch. The reason is that he has a very bad knee. This guy is uh, one of Norway or Europe's or the world's most uh, famous uh, adventurer and explorers. He's been crossing the whole of Alaska. He's crossing the whole of Canada for used three years. He's been having so many meetings with polar bears, bears, wolves, and you know, different difficult situations, swimming, crossing lakes, crossing, crossing rivers during the winter time. And now he actually had fallen down from, fallen down from his car a couple of weeks ago after a training run while putting the sled on top of his car. He actually fell down and hurt his knee. And he told me yesterday that his knee is bothering him a lot. But, you know, this guy's pretty tough, surviving a lot of experiences with polar bears and grizzlies. And he actually had to scratch. So, while going over to the Drevshu checkpoint, he actually made a selfie video, which he put out on his uh, Facebook page, telling what was going on. But this video is only in Norwegian. He was sitting on his sled. He has a sit-down sled. And he had no uh, ability to help the dogs while kicking, with kicking or running. His knee was too bad. So he decided to scratch from the race. And he also had his handlers picking him up by the car, with a car at the first road crossing at a place called Kvilten. Lars has finished really, really well in the Finnmark, uh, sorry, the Femin race uh, many times. I believe his best result is uh, result place number three, actually. And it's a bit disappointing. I'm sure Lars is very disappointed and he had hopes for much 
better result than actually scratching because this guy is not a quitter. Nina, well, and, that and was that, Lars. And we, we know it that is you, sad. Yeah, we know go that ahead. you know, we know that you know Lars well, and so give us a sense on, on how difficult of a decision this must be for a guy like Lars Monson to, to leave a race. Oh, that sure is a very hard decision for him because this guy is absolutely not a quitter. I know him pretty well, being my ex, actually, and <laughs> he has been doing the most most adventurous uh, explore, uh, explorations. Uh, he's been doing really crazy stuff, but this guy is really taking risk management. This guy is so knowledgeable about uh, moving in the wilderness. He is is absolutely unique in his way. So scratching from a race, that has got to be the most uh, disappointing thing for him. And I know his dog team looked great. Uh, yeah, after Tricia, he actually told me a little about, about his dogs uh, uh, having a diarrhea. But after a six hour rest, his dogs were fine again. And he's fine as well, except uh, having really big problems moving with his leg. Go ahead. Uh, Nina, I wonder, uh, have uh, Lars uh, signed up for more stud dog races this year? Do you know that? Yeah, uh, Lars has actually signed up for the long Finnmark race, uh, 1200k in uh, March. That's the same time as the ID Trod. So this year he'll do the Finnmark. I heard him saying in his video that uh, at Facebook he p posted last night directly from the trail actually. Uh, you know, I just got to say that first. In Norway, we are allowed to have cell phones while mushing. So you might uh, communicate with your teams. You might post uh, post at Facebook, yeah, uh, etc. And uh, Lars told us said something about uh, having to take care of his body, his knees, because there's going to be a lot of strangers months to come. He's going to have a lot of plans for the next months, so he would need he would need a knee which is not uh, which is functioning well actually. So he just took the decision uh, of concern of his own body actually. And Nina, you're there in Orkelbogen, and obviously the leaders of the race are headed towards you. So tell us about the conditions. How cold is it there? We see a little bit of a breeze blowing the fur cap. So give us a sense of what, what it's like out there right now. Well, you know, Gray, it's not as cold as you would think. I think it's about f minus five degrees Celsius. And I know you guys have to calculate that into Fahrenheit. I don't, I'm not familiar with the Fahrenheit system. I'm sorry for that. Okay. Uh, it is windy. It is a bit more windy than you would actually think out of the picture. It is windy, but at the moment, you might see some dog teams behind me. Those are the dog teams of the 450 class who were not in Trisil. They've been going directly to Orkelbogen. So that's the, at this part of the race, we'll see the 650 catch up with the 450 runners. The, t uh, the leaders of the 450 have already left. So these are the, uh, the later ones, but there's still a lot of 450 teams on trail. And the first 450 runners got, getting into uh, Orkelbogen, they did not have any big problems in the weather crossing the last mountain about uh, 10 miles from here, 15 kilometers. Uh, but the, the later front runners, the later or the later 450 class runners, they have been experiencing really, really bad weather in the mountains. I'm 10 miles from here coming down to Orkelbogen. And this weather is still pretty tough in the mountains here. So uh, the first um, the front runners of the 650, they'll sure have a lot of wind uh, in the mountains. Um, I do have some more information. There was actually a 1450 team that lost the dog while well, the dog ran away, got out of the team. So there are like security snow machines searching for that dog now. And I also heard that there was one team who lost their musher in the 450 class. So there are also a snow machine out in the mountains now uh, trying to help the musher get back to her team. The team is located and it's safe and sound and everything is fine. 
but the musher needs to uh, get on the sled again. So people are taking care of that. We have a very good security, te- uh, good security teams on snow machines. Well, so it's really windy uh, in the mountains, um, also here as well, but we are a little bit more down in the valley. It's a little more calm here, actually. The sky is pretty clear and very little snow drift. So as long as it gets lighter, these 650 teams will have no trouble getting to the weather because these are really experienced teams who are used to training in the mountains. Thanks, Nina. Now, uh, looking at the race, we see that uh, Dallas was talking about a second pack and uh, a first pack coming in. We have some pictures here from the race. Let's look at this. Um, We see some uh, five of the mushers running up in the beginning. Yeah, so obviously Dr. we've got... Carlson out on the trail here, and uh, he's running a nice-looking Tin Dog team. He's running in third place at the moment. Um, he left the last checkpoint uh, a little bit behind these other guys. He's about an hour and 17 minutes behind Sorley, who's uh, leaving that one. Uh, and so, you know, he's, he's a little bit farther back, but he's had some fairly good run times. He took about a three-hour and 14-minute rest at this last checkpoint. Prior to that, he took about a three hours and 10 minutes. This is on average about 25 minutes more than Sorley and Birgitta True. Ness, who are in front of him right now. So um, I think that extra rest may help him. On this last run, he had a good run time of about five hours and 18 minutes compared to Robert, so- uh, compared to, uh, I think it was Robert Sorley at five hours and three minutes and Birgitta at five hours and 30 minutes. So he's right in the right range. Um, he's doing very well. He's got a little bit uh, long distance back to try to make up here. But I think he's uh, in a good position to at least hold on to the position that he's in right now. So I think he's um, sitting well for at least third and hopefully for him to be able to move up a position or two. Yeah, sitting about 17 kilometers behind these guys. And he's a good distance into the run uh, now, but not not so far. So there's still quite a long ways to Orkelbogen for him, where there's a mandatory six-hour rest either there or at the following checkpoint, Tolga. But I don't... I think that most of these guys are going to take their mandatory six at Orkelbog, and I, I mean, I'd like to hear Bruce's take on that. But um, that's kind of what seems to be the, the smart play here. They're going into about a 112-kilometer run. That's 69 and a half miles for the non-metric system people out there. But this is a long haul, and if you can get to the end of this run with a nice speed, get that six-hour break, I think he's looking good for the, for the top three here. Yeah, I would agree with you, Dallas, that that is the strategic place to take this last mandatory rest because of both what they've just gone through and needing that long rest and then to set up for the run to the finish line. Taking it at Tolga, only about a 44, 45 mile run to the finish line isn't going to do the dogs the greatest amount of benefit. So to me, this is a really critical run that they're in right now. These teams that look fast right now, Uh, that are at the front, these top three, four teams, you throw a six-hour rest on there, they're going to come out there charging all the way to the finish line. It's a really good setup that they've all worked themselves into in that position going into this six. And let me play devil's advocate here. Obviously, Nace and and Sorley appear like they're going to have to take their six-hour in Oracle Buggin. But with Varner stopping in the checkpoint prior, is it possible he puts three or four hours rest on there and then goes all the way to to Togla before he takes his six-hour with a sprint to the finish? Is that possible at all? It it's possible but the thing is in 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 my way of looking at this right now the time that he is setting in the checkpoint is kind of giving time away towards the end of the race compared to them because he he's still going to have to take that mandatory six and when they come off that six they're going to kind of slingshot forward with that added rest and and have a lot of speed and th- and there just isn't enough trail left in my opinion to make that happen if it was a longer longer race like if they had another 600 kilometers to go or something like that then i could see that playing in but then we have to assume then that thomas varner stopped at that checkpoint and in a sense he's conceding the championship that would be one I, way of I'm looking at it, it for this sure one here as well bruce and greg because yeah. um it's not that these other mushers didn't stop. They just stopped for a little bit less time. So what I'm seeing here is, uh, I'm just getting my numbers to make sure I'm correct here. 
Yeah, so what we see is that um, Petr Carlsten, Carlsen stayed at the last checkpoint of Server uh, for a little bit longer. He stayed there for three hours and 14 minutes, while Brigitte and Sorley stayed for closer to two hours and 40 minutes. And that's exactly what they did at the previous checkpoint, I think, uh, of Drevshu. They took 2.46 and 2.27. Um, meanwhile, Petr Carlsen and Thomas Warner both stayed at you know 3.10 for Petr Carlsen and 3.23 for Warner. So yes, I do think that they're kind of conceding, and I wouldn't say conceding so much as being aware of the teams behind them. First place is not the only position. This is a very competitive race, and there's a lot of pride and prestige in having a consistent finish. So being able to come in third or fourth and not getting overtaken by that big pack of teams coming behind them is important. So I think for both Thomas Werner and Petra Carlson, they're looking at an extra 20, 30 minutes of rest at each of those uh, two checkpoints of Serval and Drevshu. It allows them to hold their speed and stay ahead of the pack behind them, but it probably is going to make it very difficult for them to catch Sorley and Birgitta, or Robert Sorley and Birgitta Ness there, unless they were to have an issue. But I think that's unlikely when you have two mushers out in front. Both of them aren't going to slow down dramatically. One of them might, but I think it's unlikely that both of them would. Now, Nina, you're at Urkelbo again. Do you have an interview? Yeah, I'm right here with uh, Didrik Lindeberg Sam, and uh, I was going to ask you a little bit about how does it actually feels to scratch from a dog race. Well, you know, it's it kind of depends on uh, the reason why uh, you scratch. Um, it's of course uh, disappointing. Uh, we have put down so much training and effort uh, to reach the start line, and uh, like doing the feminine race, that's the, maybe the the main goal for the season. But also, it's uh, like when I scratched here uh, yesterday. It was that was the only right thing to do. So uh, it's a bit disappointing, but um, uh, and um, but I felt it was the right thing to do for my team uh, last year. So um, it was okay, really. Uh, Didik, because you actually did the 650 last year, and uh, you scratched here at the Orkipogen checkpoint, right where we're standing. And why did you make that decision? Actually, I was standing. Um, my team was exactly where we're standing right now. So, but um, the, the reason why I scratched uh, last year was that uh, I hadn't been able to prepare the team good enough for the race. Uh, I had enough uh, kilometers in training, but not uh, the right kilometers. So uh, some of the younger dogs, they were, um, uh, they got tired and mentally more, uh, and no injuries or anything, but they were just uh, tired, so I had to take them out early in the race. Uh, so when I came here, I had uh, six dogs uh, left, and uh, I felt that uh, it was not the right thing to do to push them further. Uh, they started to get a little bit sore uh, wrists, so uh, I could have massaged them and, uh, and probably carried on, but that would be just for my own ego, not for the dogs. So uh, the dogs, uh, they were happy. We finished uh, the F500 here <laughs> at the Eutelbogen, and uh, I, th I thought that was the right thing to do. But while coming into Orkelbogen last year, did you know you were going to scratch while com before coming in here? Or where and when did you make the decision? Uh, I made a decision after taking uh, the six-hour mandatory rest. Um, I was very tired coming in. Um, I had to work up in the mountains uh, to get in here. I had a good rest, uh, went out to the dogs uh, and fed them and uh, took care of them, talking to the veterinarian. And then I uh, saw that uh, one of the leaders had a little bit sore wrist. Uh, and uh, I then took the decision that uh, we should uh, end it here. So uh, and we had a good uh, journey for the first uh, 500 Ks last year. Uh, so, and yeah, that was the right thing to do. But you finished the 650 many times before and also the long fin mark. So, you know, it's how do you feel yourself when you are decided to scratch? You're out taking the dogs down to the car. You're heading home or to the finish line to watch the other mushers come into the finish line. How do you feel? You know, I think that um, when I scratched last year, that was I felt it was the right thing to do. So that I didn't really feel uh, very bummed out or anything. It was uh, the right thing to do. Had it been five years earlier, I would have felt more disappointed, more empty inside, sort of. 
Uh, so I guess that's also with experience. It's uh, I've done it before. I don't have to prove anything. So, uh, but of course, it, it's kind of. Uh, it is disappointing because this is what you've been training for. You spend a lot of time and uh, money and all this uh, on doing this. So, um, but um, yeah. So how, uh, we're talking about Lars Monsen. He scratched uh, last night uh, after he uh, deciding uh, that his knee did not function very well. So we wanted to scratch to save his. Uh, uh, knee uh, for further uh, uh, pain and to use his knee further uh, on in the Finnmark race maybe. How, how do you think uh, Lars is feeling today? I think, I mean, it's, uh, he's probably also a bit disappointed. I mean, this is uh, one of his main goals, but uh, I mean, he's been around so many years and uh, he he doesn't really have to prove anything uh, himself, so I think that was probably the right decision to do. It is a very tough course coming in here, and uh, the trail, and it, I mean, the feminine race is a tough race. If you have uh, a knee injury or a back injury, I think that's uh, it's a pretty uh, you, you're putting on a big risk on going crossing up in the mountains here with a bad knee. You can uh, and also if uh, you're uh, if you are injured, you're not able to take that good care of the dogs. So uh, yeah. But you said coming into the mountains here. Could you just give us a short recap of how the leg from Sevolan coming here, at least the last part? How is this? I heard some rumors that it's a really tough last part of this race. Oh, this leg. Yeah, the, the part from uh, when you go from uh, Tynset and up to, uh, I think it's called uh, Gröta. Uh, that's pretty easy. It's, I mean, you go on uh, some places the, the, on roads uh, and uh, a nice trail. But the last part up here, it's, uh, it's tough. And uh, now they changed uh, the direction from last year. Uh, but um, I think about 20 kilometers from here, you, you really have to climb up again in the mountains and it's a very exposed area. Uh, and if you have not really prepared for that part of the, uh, the tra this uh, leg, you will get a surprise. And I think that's uh, for a lot of the Mushers who are uh, with a tired team, uh, not that experienced, that can come as a shock, really, because it's uh, it's a very tough end of this uh, this run from a servo and up here. So you're actually saying it'll be a big uh, advantage to have quite a large team at the last uh, coming into Gotteklebog and to have some power in the last sure. 10 miles, 12 miles, let's we'll say 20k in Norwegian. Yes, it's definitely an advantage. If you have a tired team, a small team going up those uh, hills, you will uh, really uh, feel it uh, yourself. So. So I think that's important for the teams coming in now to uh, to save some energy and power in the team going up uh, for the last part. Also, uh, on the, some parts of this trail, it's, uh, it's it's really fast. So you may have had some soft trails, and then suddenly you are on uh, very hard trails, and it's easy to just let the team uh, charge on, and then it's easy to get sore wrists. And so so you have to keep the pace a little bit down and uh, yeah and we actually know at the moment that it's really really windy up in the mountains for the 450 class because uh, the 650 is pretty far away at the moment and we know the 450 runners who are in, in uh, the checkpoint at the moment they've had big problems uh, with the wind um, fortunately it'll be less wind when the 650 arrive but as as long as you say it's a hard trail coming in here that the, there's a lot of ups, uphills and then you have the wind and the bad weather as well how do you think the team will look like coming in here in the 650 class i think you will see that uh, they are starting to feel now i mean when they come in here they've done uh, 500 kilometers the, the, the front runners have uh, not rested that much so you will probably see them uh, look a little bit more tired than uh, from some of the previous checkpoints obviously uh, but then again, the, the, the front runners are so uh, well trained and uh, experienced mushers. So, uh, but you you will probably see it from the the teams coming a little bit further behind. They will be more tired when they come uh, come up here. So we're actually at the Orkel Bogen checkpoint, waiting for the 650 teams to arrive in the late afternoon. Uh, 
they have been it will be expected in some hours time we'll make sure to give you some info what's going on here at the checkpoint this is a really nice intimate checkpoint everything is located very close the mushers are able to go inside a really nice cafe a warm cafe get warm food drinks norwegian waffles uh, they have straw they have water for their dogs here uh, the area is in a high mountains uh, well not about tree level but tree level but it's pretty close above the tree level hill here and it's um as I said it's a very intimate uh, checkpoint and all the handlers are the, all the handlers are here waiting for their 450 teams and we'll pretty soon start meeting the 650 handlers arriving and I'll try to get some into you with the 650 handlers later on thank you Thanks, Sina. Now, we actually got a hold on the Facebook video that Lars Monsen posted as he scratched from the race uh, tonight. And uh, it's in Norwegian, but we'll have a look at it. Hi, I'm Lars Monsen. In the end of March, it's a camp in Denmark, and I'm going to go up again, I don't know. So it's a new camp in Denmark. I'm going to do it for a few weeks on Hundersleian first. Then we'll see you there. Yes, uh, he said that. Uh, <laughs> since you, what, what did I, I, he say? Did you understand it? No, well, almost. Three days I in was Norway. almost there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, uh, he said that uh, in March he is attending the the Finnmark okay. race. So uh, we'll we'll get an. Uh, yeah, he w would uh, rest a little bit before that. And, you know, I think the critical thing that in making that decision is what's just been touched on here is that he with his knee hurting, it's more of a matter of he can't take care, he can't give the dogs the level of care that he needs to, like going up there and changing booties as often. So it, it's that aspect besides just maybe the pain of the musher, it's more your condition to take care of the dogs out on the trail. So he made the right decision. Yeah, and also uh, we're heading into the longest haul, uh, the longest legs, and uh, he might be not be able to kick and help the dogs. Can yeah. this uh, make a, a big difference too that is that as well yeah these more remote longer runs so you know you've seen the trail where it's soft and it's sliding around and, and they need to be very athletically capable of of moving around and helping the dogs in those situations and these are images i think of just before we signed off last night i believe uh, a dog team moving in the darkness there or as the sun was setting but you're right bruce he's going into the more or would have been going into the more wilderness sections of the, of this trail where i think it puts a premium on the musher being able to physically drive a sled uh, being able to, to care for the dogs in these longer stretches and you don't want to get into a position where you're now 50 kilometers or, or longer from a checkpoint where you might need supportive somehow and get caught out there so Lars Lars knows his physical ability certainly knows the ability of the team he's the only one that can make the decision of that sort at that moment yeah, and then he'll be um, uh, good to go to the Finnmark race later yeah. now uh, Dallas will give us an update from the trail all right, so we're taking a look at uh, kind of how the map has been playing out here. We just recently had Barbara Inuin hit the trail, taken off from the Silver Bowl checkpoint. Um, you know, I think she's getting a good position here. The previous run, she had one of the slower times from the mushers, or at least compared to the mushers ahead of her, but correctly so in my mind, she took the longest rest of any of the mushers on the trail thus far. She stayed at the Silval checkpoint for about 3 hours and 24 minutes. She left there about an hour and 47 minutes behind Brigitte Ness, the leader of the race. So I think it's unlikely she's going to catch up with the front of the race there, but she's only six, six kilometers behind Petter Carlson at this point. Um, however, Petter also stayed at three hours and 14 minutes. So uh, he's going to have a similar rest time there. I don't think we're going to see a huge difference in his traveling speed over the last run. And on this last run, he did cover the trail about, about 18 minutes faster than uh, Barbara. Barbara's daughter, uh, Amelie, uh, just won the junior race. So I guess they, they've got one victory in the bag here anyway. So here's Petter Carlson just a little bit farther up on the trail. You know, he's making good time out there. We saw some video of him earlier looking really strong on the trail, but there's a large gap between him and the lead pack, which the lead pack right now consists of Robert Sorley and Brigitte Ness. And I think these two are gonna be duking it out all the way to the finish line. 
So Carlson's about 18 kilometers behind these guys. Sorley and Ness have been running very close together for the last bit of this trail. At the last checkpoint, Sorley uh, stayed for about two hours and 40 minutes, uh, 48 minutes. Birgitta stayed 2.43. And here we get to see Robert Sorley and Birgitta Ness leading this race. Awesome. I mean, right next to each other, only maybe 100 meters, if that, in between these guys. And this, this gap in between here is going to be fluctuating some. But right now, both of them are just wanting to settle in and cruise. You know, it's a nice pace here uh, for Robert Sorley, who's getting to kind of follow along behind. You know, Brigitte's kind of setting the pace up there. I'm gonna, man, this is gonna be a fun one to watch. These both are really strong teams. But what stands out to me is on the previous run, going over to Survol, it was only about 46 and a half miles, and Robert Sorley did that run about 27 minutes faster, and then the rest at the last checkpoint was the same. But look at that dog team. This thing is just cruising along. Uh, Robert's looking around, wondering what's, uh, what's with a helicopter following here. But that is a nice looking dog team right there. Everybody's stretching out, just gobbling up that yeah. trail. He, I mean, that's that's what you want to see at this point in the race. Um, heading into the Orkelbogen checkpoint, where they will likely take their mandatory six-hour rest. This is their second mandatory rest in this race. You see a little bit farther ahead there, we got Birgitta Ness. She's pedaling, um, helping these dogs move down the trail. She's got a slightly smaller team with 11 dogs, but she's also a smaller person. And you know, that that has an advantage to it. So I've been very thankful many times when I've been racing the Iditarod, when I have a competitor that is significantly larger than me, you know, I've I'm, I'm got a 50 pound lighter sled just because of my own body mass. But she's uh, obviously helping the dogs out here. Nice looking dog team. Even gates on the wheel dog. The next one up there is stretching out a little bit more. Man, all the way up the line, we're looking pretty good. One swing dog in there with a not quite as tight of a tug line, but there he just snapped it up tight. So both nice looking dog teams. This is shaping up to be an exciting race here. What do you guys think back there in the studio? What are you, you seeing know, here? The thing I was really impressed with and made note of, as you said earlier, that Robert made up 27 minutes on a run that isn't all that long, really, the, the distance they covered. And that's pretty significant. And right now, uh, besides running that at a faster pace and having that time to bank uh, in with the dogs at a checkpoint and rest, I see it that Robert's team looks a little stronger to me and also by drafting off of her, he's taking the mental pressure off of his leaders. It's, well, it, it looks like we're gonna have a pass here. Yeah, we soon. are, we're gonna watch but, it live. But just by having another dog team around you and using the energy of both teams, Robert's sitting at a really nice place. There he goes with the pass. Leaders just stretching on the team out there and getting by. Uh, I think Robert is just sitting in a really nice position, having a bigger team, even though, as you pointed out correctly, he's bigger. But that time, we saw this from the beginning. We both mentioned that, how he set up and used the speed to gain more rest on his dogs. He has the mandatory six, but he also can just keep the pedal down on the speed of the uh, going at any other point. He's not going to have to have many other stops. No, and I'm, let's not I'm downplay with you 100 what, what just on happened. that one here. When we get to the yeah. finish line and we look back on who the winner and who the loser was, or the second place team in this race, and if Robert goes on to win it, we just saw the winning move there on live television. And so let's. It's pretty let, amazing, isn't it? it? It's, it's <laughs> awesome. Like the moment that we go to it, I mean, within two, two and a half minutes, we may have just seen the winning move in this race by a, a great at that champion. Team move. Mm -hmm. And it's cruising. I mean, for this point in the race, for that team to, I mean, obviously he's got his foot off the off the brake here. He's putting a little bit of distance between him and Brigitte. He does not want her to draft here. And so having the ability to kick it up into fifth gear for a little bit, put some distance in between you, break that draft. But to have the team that can actually do that, not just sustain, you know, uh, an eight and a half or nine mile an hour pace, but go up to 11 and a half miles an hour, put that distance in between, that says a lot about a dog team right here. Now, I'm seeing Robert Sorley on the previous run. He's picking up 21 and a half seconds per kilometer. And so this is where you can start to do predictable math as to where they're going to end up relative to the comp competition. Of course, that changes. But um, I think that's a good starting point to look at what are we looking at over the next couple miles. You know, 
there's two ways to look at the mandatory six hour rest that they have coming up. One way to look at it is that's going to cement uh, Robert Sorley's speed. It's going to, I mean, he can't fluctuate. He can't lose his lead because of somebody taking less rest. Obviously, there's plenty of rest to hold that lead. Secondly, Sometimes you see a team like Birgitte Ness's team here where they may be having a harder time holding this pace that they can catch a second wind off of that six hour break. So those six hours are on some of the races like the Iditarod where it's an eight hour break. You can see a team that's been a little slower catch another gear after that break. But um, I would still obviously much rather be in Robert Sorley's position here. And this says it right here. Speed wins dog races. Now speed is a dangerous weapon. It's um, kind of a double edged sword. It's also the thing that can make your team a little less stable when you're looking at going too fast, causing injuries or soreness. But an expert musher like Robert Sorley, who knows how to manage speed, knows how to keep speed, you know, it's it's very, very, very hard to beat these guys. Well, I like you saying speed wins races, but what speed does is allow you to give your dogs more rest because of that speed. So it's kind of a double-edged sword there of benefits. You're faster and you can rest more to keep that. I mean, look at the distance he's pulled away. The thing I see, in this dog team too with these aerial shots is all of them each pair is firing and moving the same it's just like an engine that every cylinder's going he's not stressing four dogs in the back because the front is faster and setting the pace it, there's real uh, balance in that team as we look down on Roberts and this team looks good too but there's just a little faster pace a little more smoothness in Roberts team and maybe Dallas absolutely, and Bruce. Absolutely, Bruce. Absolutely. You, you guys can that's talk. That's a really good point. Go, go ahead, I was just we're going to touch on one thing here real quick that Bruce was talking about. You know, we were getting to compare Brigitte's team to Robert Sorley team. But if we were looking at Brigitte's team here, without Robert Sorley in lead. If we were looking at her team leading this race right now, we would be saying that is an amazing looking dog team, right? So the team we have in second place, Brigitte Dines, that is a solid team. It would be, I mean, I would be amazed to see that team doing, you know, in first place of this race right now. I'd be very impressed with it. And I think that speaks volumes for Robert Sorley team. This is beyond a good team. This is a truly exceptional team. Um, because what I'm seeing in Brigitte's team is still really, really nice to be, you know, only a couple hundred meters from the lead of the race, setting a very brisk pace here. She's got a solid lineup. So, man, I'm very impressed with Robert's team at this point. Um, and I, I don't want to, it's, it's just not always fair to your second place musher here when you're comparing them to such an excellent team as what we have right here, because she has a phenomenal team there also. Well, and that's true in any sport. Sport. I think you'll agree you've participated in different sports. We take something like downhill skiing, racing in the Olympics. The second place person is a tenth of a second behind the other. Yeah. They're both at maximum professional performance. So in an event like this, a major world race, you're absolutely right. They're both really nice teams. But when you're judging them or looking at them, a tenth of a second, a quarter kilometer an hour more on a dog team here makes a difference so you're really getting down to the the real fine details that separate them but again like going back to the olympics you get second place but you're only a tenth of a second behind that's still a really good run on a ski slope of that nature and maybe you two can talk about you know these two dog teams they're doing a great job here in the last 100 kilometers of this race, but really the key was that they ran a great race in the first 100 kilometers of this race that allowed this top end speed to still exist in their team at the end. They may, one team may have had more speed, but the way the musher managed it, yes, was established in the beginning. And I really like the analogy that, that Dallas used of breaking races into thirds. The setup, the transportation, part of maintenance to where you get to the final third and and then the execution of the win and what we're seeing is just letting them roll now to get to this last break to do that final run and yeah i i totally agree you may have had a faster team but it's how you handled that in the beginning that might make the difference between being first or and being sixth place or seventh place with the exact same team 
And Dallas, you're Especially always a master in a very competitive at, race like this here. Yeah, and, yeah. and keeping your team together and making sure that they still had that last push in them. Uh, because, you know, most, if not all of your wins at the Iditarod, I think all but one of them, uh, you were coming from behind to do it. Yeah, and, and this takes us back to the speed conversation, which is a really, really interesting one. There's, as I see it, three different types of speed that you can uh, see mushers have in a race. Uh, first of all is this team that's inherently fast, right? A faster type of dog, a dog that's been trained at a you know a higher top-end speed. And that's one form of speed. And again, that speed on the trail can tire a team out and can have some serious negative effects over the course of a long distance race. You know, here we're doing a 650 kilometer race. You know, the Iditarod's up to a thousand miles. So there's that type of speed. And that's why, again, it's dangerous because it allows, if the dogs are used to going fast, they can burn up too much fuel too early. The second type of speed that you see really good mushers be able to manage and create is speed late in a race, right? They can create a fast dog team that's two thirds of the way into a long distance race. So on the Iditarod, we're looking at Caltag, you know, at 600 and some miles into the into the race. Here we see this leaving the checkpoint of uh, Sir Bowl here. We have expert mushers with good speed. And the third type of speed that I see are the uh, kind of relating aspect to speed is mushers that they know how to have the speed built into their team that inherent speed they know how to create speed on a race and then most importantly do they know how to hold that speed i've seen so many good mushers get late in a race build good speed they use that speed a little too hard they don't respect the effort that the dogs are doing and compensate it with enough rest and then you know two or three runs after having the fastest team on the trail they're right back down to having you know kind of middle of the pack run times and so that's something where i think robert has that level of expertise particularly i believe bargita does as well to be able to sustain that speed, knowing the effort that the dogs are putting on the trail, knowing how much rest they need to compensate them with, you know, a little bit extra rest here and there to sustain that speed. And that's a level of um, expertise that honestly, there's not that many mushers that can sustain that top end speed at the end of the Iditarod or in these long distance races like we're watching here. So. There are multiple aspects. You know, when we talked about the beginning of the race, we were commenting on the teams that were calmed down, not the ones that were going too fast, right? So it is uh, numerous levels. I would also throw in a sidebar of another type of speed, Dallas, and that's the speed of efficiency. And I've watched this so much in Iditarod and other longer races like the Yukon Quest, where the musher's efficiency in a checkpoint to get the job done, get the food in at the right time, get away from the dogs and let them rest contributes to their natural speed, their traveling speed. And and I have always said a lot of races are won and lost, positions are won and lost in checkpoints, not out on the trail. And again, these are all top mushers doing that, but these this aspect of efficiency in a checkpoint to benefit the rest contributes to the actual traveling speed. Just a yeah, question. I just want to draw uh, our attention to, to the, uh, the speed kind of rankings here on the on the left hand side or the upper left hand corner of our screen. You know, right now we're seeing, you know, mid 11 K moving times um, between 11, four, 11, nine. And this is obviously a, a snapshot of right now. You know, right now moving down the trail and right now they're climbing up a hill. <laughs> so that's gonna skew that a little bit. When we look at Robert Sorley's average speed from the last stage of this race, he was doing about 14.8 kilometers per mile. Um, quick conversion here. That's gonna give us a moving average of 9.2 miles an hour uh, over some kind of varied terrain. So I think that says a lot about these team speed, that that's a, that's a good moving average, especially when we have soft snow, we gotta climb up hills. And what allows Robert to hold that pace is like we just saw here, after he passed Birgitta a few moments ago, he was able to put some distance between those two teams because that team is clearly very healthy and he can still put them into that fifth gear stage and had a bit of a sprint there for some distance to break that draft. Now Birgitta's leaders no longer have sight of Robert Sorley and their speed is gonna be begin to slow down a little bit, as is her confidence and her will to continue pushing and pedaling. Pretty soon, she might start looking over her shoulder and say, you know what, I've got an hour lead to the next person. I can settle down a little bit, and that makes it even easier for Robert to get away. 
Yeah, uh, Dallas and Bruce, I have a question because uh, what should be Birgitta's uh, strategy now? B b uh, should she uh, make sure that the gap from uh, Surly is not too big or how should she think now before the, the next checkpoint? Well, there is this you take aspect. That one first, of, there, Bruce. There, there is the aspect of protecting the position you're in, which Dallas was just talking about, and so you know you have an approximate idea of where the teams are behind you. So you don't want to blow up your team trying to chase somebody in front of you that's faster. But and then there's also the aspect of letting the dog settle back in, like as we saw from these helicopter shots, she was drafting for a while. And it, it sometimes kind of bums mentally the musher out when you realize I'm not as fast, he just left me. And actually, I always tried to pass a team at a point where I knew I could then get a little distance so they can't draft off of you. And But then you have to mentally, mentally come back into the game and settle down and go, this is my dog team. Uh, I just need to get them to this mandatory six in the best condition where they're not stressed and then hope that you get some rebound off of that rest and maybe step back up on speed. So you need to focus on your dog team. It might be a little bit of a feeling of you want to push, but the best thing you can do is stay focused on that dog team and then get them there for the rest and protect your position. Dallas, your thoughts? I'm with you on that, absolutely. Like you were just saying, when passing a team, I try to do that in a place that I know my team is uh, gonna have be rel stronger relative to the team that I just passed. For me, that was generally climbing hills. So, you know, if we were on a flat terrain, maybe traveling down a river, and I know there's a hilly section up ahead, I'm gonna want to make sure my dogs are snacked, all their booties are taken care of before I pass that other team, so I'm not gonna need to stop and take care of something after I pass them. And then I would want to pass them right before we hit a steep climb and get some good distance between us. That's, that's a key aspect. As far as what Brigitte needs to focus on right now, there's some decisions that have already been made, been made before the race started, been made over the last two days of this race. And some of those decisions may mean that it's just not realistic for her team to outpace Robert Sorley's team. And we've said it begin previously in this race and also covering the Bear Grease just last weekend, realistic expectations. That's the most important thing a musher can have for their team is realistic expectations. I would much rather see her set her sights on finishing with a strong team in second place, fending off the competitors behind her and watch her team succeed brilliantly at doing that rather than try to push and catch up with a team like Roberts that has maybe was maybe a little more prepared before the race, maybe better run race and going to be an unrealistic expectation. But that's exactly what's going through her mind is trying to figure that out. Is it possible for this team to beat Robert? Obviously, you don't want to give up too soon, but on the same time, She's looking at uh, Petra Carlson left the previous checkpoint an hour and 17 minutes behind her. On the previous run, Petra Carlson was averaging half a kilometer a mile, I'm sorry, half a kilometer an hour faster than her. That's not a big speed difference. I think she focuses on having a good clean run and making sure that her dogs are ready to have a good solid rest. And I think at this point, Robert's gonna have to make a mistake for her to be able to catch him. But for her to be able to win, if Robert makes this mistake, she still has to beat Petra Carlson and Barbara Inuin and everybody else behind her. So I think she runs a smart race and don't focus too much on catching Robert. Focus on having a good run, having a really effective and beneficial six hour rest at this next checkpoint that sets her up for a good run to the finish. You know, another aspect of your question there is if you have, let's just say, a 10th place team and you manage them well and you finish third, that's a win. If you have a second place team and you blow them up, so to speak, and finish 10th, you mishandled that team. That's not as good of a finish. So for someone who has a team that's maybe not ready to win, but it's a 10th, 11th place team and you manage them well, you're ecstatic that they perform that well and that you handle the strategy of the race that well. So there's a lot of races within the race. And, and that's one aspect of that. If, if uh, you can just manage those dogs to, and the trail to the highest potential that you and the dogs can, can uh, reach, that's a very successful race. Yeah, it's a teamwork. It's not an ego trip, right? Right, <laughs> shouldn't be an ego trip. But, but when Dallas and I are looking at these dogs, we're looking at very subtle things. Again, to use the analogy in the Olympics, 
in any event you pick, it's so close. They're all such top competitors. But as Greg pointed out, sitting here, he noticed that Ness's leaders were looking around more, where, where Roberts were just straight ahead, eyes right down that trail. I noticed that uh, in, this, in Ness's second place team at this point, the swing dog was back a little bit, and I don't see that in Roberts' team. Those are very subtle, picky things, but they make a speed difference. And they just show that his team is a little more focused, a little more energy to drive out front. And in the long run, and Greg's right, seeing that is subtle and it's one moment in a long race, but those are little things that you start picking up on. Now we are looking at uh, Robert Surley and uh, Birgitte Nass. But uh, yesterday we had Thomas Werner in the, in the lead. Do you think he became, why is he not here now? Is he, was it too fast, too early or? He, it could be how he ran the early part of the race. We haven't really heard an interview with him if there's any kind of uh, things health-wise going on with his dogs. But I, I, without knowing, talking to him directly, we actually, uh, I would yeah. just say he probably needed more rest. Yeah. And uh, now we see uh, Robert is kicking. He's really helping his dog teams, right? Probably going up a small hill there. And then you see him sit down. Maybe he's crested the hill and is on now more of a, a flat uh, piece of the trail. But I've been watching Robert uh, do that same sort of thing. He gets, he kicks, he sits down, he kicks, he sits down. And, and not being able to see the topography of the trail rider, it's very possible that it's just these rises and climbs that he's helping and then sitting down on the back end of it. But that team is uh, certainly a, a little more business-like yes. than Brigitte's team, right? Uh, and, and I think even from a layman's perspective that I view this as, you can just see from, you know, station to station throughout that dog team, those, those dogs are generally more focused on moving forward and there's less distraction going on, less looking around and less slack. Less slack in the, in the line, yeah, which means the power is going down that line to the sled. And I'm impressed yeah, I, with... I want to touch here yeah, on this ahead. real quick, guys. We have this... Uh, we see Robert standing and sitting and standing and sitting. And a lot of times when people see these sit-down sleds, you know, the sleds that have the seat compartment behind them, they're saying, oh, that's that's a lazy man sled there. Um, the truth of it is that seat allows us to do more work, right? You're not exhausting your legs just standing there. And being able to stand up and kick for a few seconds or maybe even a minute on with your right leg, then you sit down and take, you know, 10 deep breaths, kind of refresh your energy a little bit stand up and kick 10 10 or 15 minutes if you need to or 10 or 15 seconds whatever it is with your left leg it extends your ability especially in super long distance races to continue to help the team when they need help right so if there's a small rise you can work hard up that and then on the downhill take a little break or even on the flat ground being able to give your legs a short break makes a huge difference. Let's remember here, the human is definitely the weakest athletic link in this team. The dogs have phenomenal athletic ability. The mushers, eh, we're still human. <laughs> so, you know, being able to utilize that seat, I see that, I mean, I see the seat on my sled every bit as important as the ski pole in my hand, as far as being able to help get me, help me help the team get down the trail. So that's an important aspect, and we're seeing Robert Sorley use that tool very well, and we're seeing a big gap out here in the field as he's starting to pull away from Birgitta, you know, and I think that's part of it, is he knows how to manage his energy, and this, again, is part of experience, something you might not see a 25-year-old musher do quite as well when they try to work the whole time for the first half of the race. In the second half of the race, when the dogs really need their help, you know, climbing up those hills or that help would be more beneficial, they're spent. There's nothing more they can do. And this, again, from an onlooker looking in or from a layman's uh, point of view, it's got to be demoralizing for a musher to get passed by a faster team at this point in the race. I'm wondering, do the dogs know? Is it is it a, an emotional moment for them when a team passes them going faster? Do they understand that? I don't think it emotionally uh, bums them out or lets them drop off. Dogs are just in their own world. I mean, they are in the moment by that. And and it's just their team with their musher. Now, they'll get some excitement when another team's around, but they just go back into their world of travel. 
Yeah, uh, yesterday we had uh, Thomas Werner in the lead and now we're seeing Robert Sterling and Birgitte Nass. But uh, during the night, Thomas Werner actually took some uh, videos with his GoPro camera. And uh, we have these videos, so we'll get an update from him. Well, we are out of checkpoint uh, 2. We decided to rest a little extra. So, uh, dogs were not eating uh, the way I want them to eat. And it's still only halfway, so it's... Uh, so we get a little extra rest. Not much, but just a little. And it looks like that uh, was smart. Dogs are really... on now. So keeping a good, uh, it's good speed. We are really slowing them down for a while. And uh, Rolf is uh, just behind me, so we've been going together for the whole time. My shape is getting a little better. I feel like it's not good, but it's a lot uh, better now than I was in the first uh, stretch. So hopefully this is something that will pass fast. Dogs are eating, so we're hoping I just stop snacking the dogs. So, looking pretty good. I think it's one team behind us is catching up, but for me, it's important to go slow and steady in the beginning, especially when you're not going to rest much. Uh, that was uh, pictures from the musher himself. Yeah, really good <laughs> stuff there. Really good stuff. I, I love hearing the sounds. You hear him, you know, with his foot on the brake, trying to keep the, the dog team slowed down. But you hear the calmness in his voice, right? It seems like he's a musher very much at ease at, at the trail that they're going down and, and how the team was going. I couldn't quite understand. Did he say that they were eating well or that they weren't eating the way he wanted them to eat? Well, what I heard was they weren't eating the way that okay. he would like them to, so he added some extra rest, which is the correct thing to do to get that meal in them, get that energy and hydration into them. So it's probably the indicator of his position. Yeah, as why he's still in a checkpoint. That, yes. that may have given us a little signal there yeah. by hearing that. And why why he stayed there. You also got the view from the musher's point of view, yeah. which is kind of nice for people to see that have never had the privilege of running behind these dogs as well. So, yeah. And, uh, and uh, Thomas Werner was uh, leading all of yesterday, but now... Has, is he still? Uh, does he still have a chance? He's the last year's winner. Well, he's. You don't get anything from the previous year. Every year is different. Every race is different. You can be, a, you know, multiple champion, but each race is different. So, so he doesn't get any energy off of that. But. Uh, it's not over till the first team crosses the finish line. Things can happen. People can get lost. Any number of things. So we'll see. Yeah, we'll see. And then Nina is with us on the checkpoint of Örkelbo again. Over to you. Yes, I am uh, here at Örkelbogen with the head of the checkpoint, Arne Nimon. Uh, are you a musher, Arne? Are you a dog musher? Uh, no, I haven't tried mushroom mushing. I have a little black dog, but I don't think she's very <laughs> fit to run with a sled behind. You are the head uh, of this checkpoint, the man in charge of organizing this checkpoint, and everything's going on here. What are your assignments? What are you doing? I try to manage, uh, supervise, and guide all the fantastic volunteers we have on this checkpoint. Uh, on behalf, uh, it's uh, quickness sporting team that runs the, this whole checkpoint and uh, all the people are working here are, are volunteers that are more than willing to uh, help us to get this uh, fabulous uh, arrangement every year so I try to guide them and be the leader for them and uh, walk around and uh, make sure that uh, everyone are feeling good both the mushers, the dogs and the volunteers but how many years have your uh, sports club uh, been uh, uh, responsible for this checkpoint? For a long time? Uh, this is the sixth year we are uh, here in Orkelbogen. Uh, we started the first year when it was uh, very windy and a tough race. It, uh, was, uh, the race was uh, stopped because of uh, safety 
environment for the junior class, I think. Yeah, I remember that. I was racing the 600 that year and we were taken out of the race, all of us, at the, the city of Tinset because there were too much snow, too much bad weather. They were not able to have the race because of the different difficult difficult weather conditions. But uh, right now it's quite windy. And, uh, how do you think the mushers uh, will have it up in the mountain now coming into the checkpoint? Do you think it's bad? Weather? I think for especially for the last part of this track and especially now for the F4 550 that has been going on through the night because this distance from Sjøvolden and over here to Orkelbogen is quite long for them and at the end of the track they get uh, quite uh, a lot of uphill racing and when they come up they get this quite strong wind straight in the face so a lot of mushers has told them that it was very tough up on the mountains, especially in the morning, around five, six, seven o'clock. Now it's a little bit better, actually. So, um, but uh, there were tough times, and uh, I guess some of the mushers that have uh, broken the race on this distance is due to the weather conditions. Okay, so uh, some mushers have actually scratched from the race because of the bad weather. Uh, as far as you know, they don't want to go anymore because they don't like the weather. No, I think it's, uh, I guess it's, uh, too tough for a lot of them because yeah with the eight dog sleds it's uh, very hard when they get this very strong wind in the front but uh, I don't have all the details about why the mushers uh, choose to break the race there could be other conditions due to that but um, I guess it's uh, not a good point so for the 650 that comes here later this day I think they will be more lucky because the weather is supposed to be a little more gently with the wind so that would be better for them and they're more uh, they're more able to go this distance so I think they will have a better uh, experience for this part of the race Back to your job as the head of this checkpoint, how many people are actually working at this checkpoint? Uh, volunteer people, do you know how many? Yes, here on Orkelbogen we have uh, around 70 people this weekend. 70? 70. So, but uh, at one time we have about between 25 and 30 at every time here. And all that work here, they go uh, shifts for six hours, and then they change. Or, but we have also people that work here for uh, 18 hours straight. Then they maybe go home and rest for uh, some hours, and they come back for uh, maybe one more shift. What are the things the mushers can get here? What are you, the pr what are you selling here for the mushers? Inside, uh, we have a cafeteria where they sell, uh, sell uh, a beef stew. And uh, we have hamburgers, and uh, we have something we call the kyklafse. It's a Norwegian very good uh, meal. And we have waffles, coffee, and other hot drinks, and soda, and so on. Are the mushers able to go inside a house to sleep, or do they have to sleep inside a tent or with their dogs? Now we are very lucky here in uh, Orkelbogen because uh, this whole area that we arranged the checkpoint is built up by uh, Orkelbogen Friluft Center and Steiner Munkhaven that is one of the major owners in Femmenlöpe. So uh, he let us use this whole area and m many of these buildings are uh, built specially for Femmenlöpe. And for the mushers they have uh, their own uh, wood house, lavo, that they can go and sleep in. That are made of wood and uh, they can sleep there in two floors. So, uh, and that house, it's it's only for the mushers, so they can have uh, peace and quiet and and they can they can decide whether they want to go there and sleep. And I but I see some of them uh, go to the parking pl place and sleep in their uh, mobile vans. But most of them, I think, sleep in this lower because it's close and it's very good accommodation. So this is a lavo, which is a typical Norwegian, actually a tent. But here, uh, or like a Sami tent, uh, the native people of Norway, the Sami people. But here at Orkelbogen, this lavo is made of wood. Do you have heat or uh, like an oven in the building for the mushers? 
Yes, they sleep here. Uh, it's, it's like you said, like a like a teepee or a lavo, and it's made of wood. And they sleep in a circle, and in the middle we have a wood stove. So we hit that. Uh, we try not to hit too much because the mushers don't want it to be too hot. Are the mushers able to dry their clothes somewhere? Yes, we have uh, both wires and uh, hooks on the walls so they can cl- especially put up and dry their uh, clothes. And uh, yeah, because in, like in these conditions, the, I guess they have both cold and maybe wet clothes. So. So this checkpoint is belonging, or the area here is actually belonging to the hotel at Orkulbogen. And uh, that's a traditional Norwegian, really beautiful hotel with you have where you have these small buildings here about a half mile from the hotel. What kind of people come here, in uh, staying in this area during the year? I think they... They are they're not like an ordinary hotel. They are, can book in accommodation for everyone. But it's a, I think it's specially made for companies that want to go here for a, maybe a weekend or a week to stay here. And they can have good meals. And they have a lot of activities with both an outside and inside the shooting range. So I think the inside they have a shooting simulator for both shotguns and rifles. And outside they have a biathlon stadium and they have a shooting area for a longer distance. Oh, they have actually... And they can arrange other activities. So this spot on this side of the river is made for like outdoor adventures. Well, this sure is a very beautiful place. I did not know biathlon uh, was a possibility here. And for those who don't know, biathlon is a mix between shooting and cross-country skiing. Mm. But do they have the possibility, the guests at the hotel, do they have the possibility to go dog mushing here as well? Yes, I think, uh, I don't know how much they do it, but uh, if some wants to, we have, uh, like in this whole area around the family up, we have many people that uh, arrange dog mushing. So if some people want to come here and take a trip on dog mushing, I think it's not a problem for them to arrange that. Arna, one last question. How long is this checkpoint staying open? When are you closing down the checkpoint? Do you know that? I hope we will close sometimes between 12 and 6 in the afternoon tomorrow. So that will be uh, Monday, uh, Monday, midday to the afternoon, Norwegian time that is. Yes, normal time. Last year we finished here around uh, 1 o'clock after, after midnight. No, not after midnight, but uh, only in the afternoon. That was the last, uh, the last musher went from here to Tollgarden. So I guess it will be maybe a little bit later to this year because I think the trail is maybe a little bit tougher. And then most of the volunteers will go back to their ordinary jobs at Tuesday, maybe? Yes, I hope. Maybe someone will need it Tuesday to have a little bit more sleep. Uh, we try to to clean up this area and drive uh, and make everything look like it was before in the, in the night time. On Monday, so some will go working on Tuesday morning, and some uh, some will maybe stay in bed <laughs> for some hours. I think I will have to. Need, I will need some hours in the bed because I'm, s- 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 yeah, most staying awake for this weekend. It's sure tough being a volunteers in a race or the head of the checkpoint. So, what is your regular job? I'm a farmer, so I milk cows, drive tractor. And grow grass. So you sure are used to getting up early in the morning, then? Well, yeah, sometimes. But uh, now I have a robot that milks my cows, so I don't have to get up so early if I don't want to. Okay, so. okay. We'll, we'll hear more about that another time. Yes. Thank you very much, Arne Nyman, the head of the ch- uh, checkpoint at uh, Orkelbogen. Over to the studio. Thank you, Nina. Wow, it looks really nice at the uh, Orkelbogen there. Look, yeah, what, he said he had a robot at home. I want to know about the robot. <laughs> like, what's, what's going on in Norway? There's robots in people's homes. That's fantastic. Yeah, it does look nice, you know. And what I like it from the dog mushing standpoint is we saw all the water at the rest at the checkpoint yesterday, where it was warm. 
and uh, they were on the river or the outlet of the lake there. Uh, it's cool enough now that it's going to that it's drier and it's going to be easier for the dogs to rest there. It, it looks like pretty good conditions. Yeah. Yeah, and I've loved watching the helicopter coverage this morning because, you know, yesterday we had a trail that was really going through a residential area near a town here in Norway, and now we we see more of the you know the wilderness feel of this trail where it's out in open spaces and all the timber and and I know uh, knowing mushers the way I do, this has got to be their favorite part of this trail because mushers love to be out in these spaces with their dog teams. In the wilderness. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. And we actually got some uh, questions from our viewers that I hope that you can help me with. Uh, one question is, how often do they stop to snack their dogs in between checkpoints, Bruce? Well, it depends on the format of the race. The shorter the race, the less you're going to stop because you want that those stops to be in checkpoints where the time counts. Uh, the longer the race, like you get in these long races, then ab about every two hours, the mushers will give the dogs a little chance to stop and kind of shake off, give them a little snack what it, based on the temperature and what the dogs are used to, a uh, little piece of salmon steak or uh, some poultry fat, something like that to keep the energy up. In this kind of race right now, and at this point in this race, you're probably not going to be giving away any minutes. You're going to go right to the check point and then have them arrive there hungry and ready to eat. And again, that gets back to efficiency. You don't want them to say, I need a, a nap before I eat. You've got six hours. You want them to come in there, get those booties off, get them bedded down, give them that quick drink if that's what your dogs do, and then get a real meal in them and have a chance to digest it. So mm. I would say right now I wouldn't be stopping at all. No. No. Okay. So uh, no snacking in between in this race. At this point in yeah. this race. Okay. But yeah. every musher trains and handles their dogs differently. So mm. that's how I would strategically look at this. We have another question. Um, how do you think that the, the big, will be the biggest uh, improvement or development in the coming years of mushing? Will it be training routines? Will it be uh, the way they race or equipment? I think that, it'll, it'll be all of it. It'll be all of it, but yeah. that is the million-dollar question. And if we had the answer to that, everybody would probably be winning who has that answer. But this sport, one of the things that is most intriguing about it, besides the chance to be out in nature and your interaction and relationships with these dogs, it is constantly evolving. We are at a sport that's at the cutting edge of its development, like materials that booties are made out of now stay dry better it used to be they were made out of a pile like a jacket a fleece material and every time they got in water they would just swell up and weigh five pounds each and you had to stop and change them each time now you don't they are strong materials uh, you used to bolt your sled plastic on and leave it the entire race and it was time consuming to change it now it's this quick change plastic that slides on and off on a dovetail based on the temperature of the snow at any given point. Sleds designs, the sit down sleds to give the musher uh, more energy during the race and balance out the load along the whole runner instead of the musher standing at the back. Every Harnesses that fit the anatomy of the dog better. It's all changed and that's why we've seen races get faster and faster. And the biggest change I think that has affected not only sled dogs but benefited dogs all over the world is the knowledge that has been gained by dog food companies on nutrition and every major dog food company has done their research at some point on the sled dogs as athletes because what works for these dogs will work for your couch potato <laughs> dog and yeah. and so that's what's driven the speed in these races up the over the years now what's going to come next who knows i mean somebody will try something strategies in racing uh equipment will refine but i don't think we're going to see these big blocks like in iditarod where you cut it from a 10 a 12 to a 10 day race or 10 to a 9 and then do an 8 we're going to see little refinements now in my opinion that that help the musher and help the dogs if there is something big, the biggest thing that would help these dogs is for the mushers to stay home because we actually hold them back. They're hauling us. Dallas said earlier, 
the musher is the weak link. We don't even know what these sled dogs can do because they're hauling us around. The mushers are more tired and exhausted than the dogs are just trying to keep up with them. And I say that as a joke if the mushers would stay home, but these dogs could complete these race courses even faster if the mushers weren't there. Yeah, thank you so much for answering. And I know that uh, Dallas CV actually, uh, prior to uh, coming here, uh, sat down and speculated in what he sees the sport of mushing will help with in the future. What I would like to see mushing be or do in the future is bring the highest level of animal husbandry, you know, dog care, whether that's your pet or your recreational sled dog or your hunting dog or whatever it is. I would like to see that whole quality of care be raised because of the sport of mushing. Uh, on a level of nutrition, awareness about exercising and having an active dog. Um, if you're going to be an owner or uh, you know, a companion to an active dog, an active breed dog, knowing how to fulfill that dog's needs as, as an athlete. So I think that's something that mushing can do. And I think that in the future of mushing, we're going to be doing that at a much higher and better level. So I would like to see in 20 years that um, we just see a generally higher level of animal husbandry because of what mushing is doing, or at least mushing can contribute to that higher level. And uh, now we'll get an update from Dallas on the race that's going on right now. All right, so we're going to take a look at the GPS trackers here and kind of see where everybody's at now that we're uh, getting a ways into this run here. So up uh, right now we're looking at the number four, um, Barbara Inuin uh, moving out of the checkpoint. We saw her get down the trail a little bit ago or traveling on the trail a bit ago. Nice looking gang of dogs here. She's not too far behind Carlson. Um, Carlson has had you know, a good, good run times. He's been traveling a little bit faster than Barbara most of this way. So I, I think it's unlikely to see anyone catch up too much, but anything can happen and Carlson's speed may, uh, may fade here as we go. We never know. So this will be interesting and it will kind of play out during this run. As we move up towards the front of the race here, um, out there in the front, we saw a little bit ago, Robert Sorley take the lead from Brigitte Ness. These guys are some distance ahead of Carlson and Inuin, so I think uh, that'd be a lot to uh, hope for for them to catch up. We see a large gap on this trail as these two lead teams kind of break away from the rest of the pack. They're still very close together, but we've seen Sorley make up a little bit of time overtake Brigitte Ness and now starting to put a little bit of a gap in between them. Right now, their traveling speeds are very comparable. However, you know, uh, maybe a couple tenths of a kilometer an hour starts to add up as miles go by and that distance gets greater. Also, what we tend to see is when a team overtakes another team like Robert Sorley has, the second team is gonna keep up for some amount of time. Like here, we're gonna see him very close together. Uh, we're gonna see Robert Sorley pass Brigitte Ness. Then I would predict that Brigitte is going to stay similar pace for some amount of time. And then as we see the end of this run get a little bit closer, we're going to see uh, Robert Sorley stay at a very steady pace. And Brigitte, may, her speed may begin to taper as they uh, get towards the end of this run. So here we see a nice pass. Robert Sorley's dogs very professionally working their way around. You see Robert positioning his sled out in the softer snow to get around him there. And then once the pass is complete, Brigitte lets off the brake and allows her dogs to start following here. These dogs are gonna now, these dogs in the second team and Brigitte's team are probably gonna try to keep up with Robert Sorley, which may artificially um, improve their speed for some amount of time. And that's why I'm guessing that as we get towards the end of the run, their speed is gonna start to wane a little bit. This is Petter Carlson, a little bit farther back on the trail right now. He's um, a fair distance behind these guys up in front of him. I'm seeing about a 17 kilometer gap in between them. That's constantly changing though. Um, but he's a nice looking team. He's got 10 dogs on the line here. They're holding a good speed on the previous run. He had a, a very respectable run time at three hours and 18 minutes. The only musher that was faster than him on the previous run was Robert Sorley. So I think we're gonna see him continuing to move quickly down the trail. I believe we've got uh, Barbara Inuin here. Have to get a better look on this one here. Oh, no, this is uh, still Petter Carlson's lineup here, yep. 
No, they're, I mean, it's a nice looking team. These guys are shuffling along very well. I think this is a, a team that's, you know, like I said, they're, they're the second fastest team on the trail. They're significantly faster than the teams around them at about uh, between 12 and 20 minutes faster than the other teams in this area, with the exception of Robert Sorley, who was 15 minutes faster than him on the previous run. That was about a 75 kilometer run. This run is a little bit longer at 112 kilometers. So we'll see if uh, Carlson can maintain that speed, but he's gonna be a serious competitor. I think he's a very likely pick for third place right now. I think it's gonna be a big challenge for him though to catch all the way up with Birgitta. But again, we're, we're getting excited about the end of the race. We're starting to focus on that, but we still have about 200 kilometers to go, more for some of these teams. So a lot can happen in that time. In Dallas, and here uh, we go back up to Robert Sorley, and I think you can see you can see a little bit of the uh, speed difference from these shots we got earlier today. We were just looking at Petter Carlson, nice looking team, good speed. Here we see Robert Sorley, amazing looking team and great speed. Um, you know, and this is this is a really impressive looking dog team here. You know, all these teams are doing a fantastic job, and I think if Robert wasn't here, we'd be singing their praises about how wonderful these teams look because they do look wonderful. Robert seems to be just on another level though as we close in on the final couple hundred kilometers of this race. Um, this last 200 kilometers, it's a long ways. However, it's gonna go by fast as these mushers start to start to focus on the finish line they're closing in on the finish line they've spent this whole race setting up for this last 200 kilometers to have strong teams that can accelerate to the finish line dallas on that leaderboard i noticed that uh, you were looking at there and addressing that ralph, uh, ralph johannesson has moved up quite a bit in the standings from his positions yesterday and have you had a chance to calculate his traveling speed and what we're attributing that to that is a great, great question on uh, on Ralph. He's he's steady. You know, he's a good musher in here. Um, he's taken, you know, he's taken a, a normal amount of rest. I think his dogs function very well on on a little bit shorter rest times. His run times are solid. Um, again, he's not breaking any land speed records out there, but he's steady. You know, and that says a lot. He's going to keep chugging along. I think uh, Ralph is running a team that uh, is a very nice thousand mile ra dog team. I don't think they're going to have the upper end speed to be competitive in this type of race, at least not this year. I mean, each team that a musher has from one year to the next can vary. So this year I'm seeing a solid thousand mile team or, you know, Finnmark team and, uh, you know, the 1200 kilometers there. But in this race, I think his speed's a little bit too too uh, slow to compete with the top, but steadiness is very important. I don't think we're gonna see Ralph's speed change a whole lot, and I think the reason we've seen him move up the ranks is because the teams around him were maybe running a little bit faster than is sustainable for them, and they're starting to fade. I think that would be a more accurate way of looking at that that breakdown there. And that that's something we often see in races is uh, a team managed well will finish a race at the same speed that they started at and therefore they reel in slowly those other teams but with Ralph's team we did we both commented yesterday coming off his mandatory six how nice that team looked based on the fact they immediately went into that traveling gate that traveling speed they just looked really nice and it was nice to see that he has moved, taken that team up into the standings with yep. that that natural, just, I, I think I would attribute that to training and breeding, that, got, that those dogs know their business out there. I would agree with you on that, Bruce. And uh, again, I think we mentioned it yesterday. I think both of us, our view is a little bit skewed by watching you know, these longer races. Of course, my whole life has been focused on thousand mile races. So I think we're a little bit skewed when we see, man, that's a beautiful team. And it is a beautiful team. But as we're watching these little bit shorter races, they've got to have that higher speed. So in this particular contest, it's, he has a well-run team. I think he will continue to climb a little bit there, or at least uh, I don't think we're going to see him getting overtaken by many teams, that's for sure because he's steady and steadiness pays in a, in a long distance race the other one that's been kind of interesting is Peter Jonasson uh, we saw him or Pete Jonasson uh, we saw him earlier on 
You know, he's using this as a training run. You know, and we're going back to the very beginning of this race. He was the only one that didn't stop in those first checkpoints of two things Dolan and Drivsha. Uh, we saw him go to Trissel, the third checkpoint, without having stopped in the checkpoints. And we had talked a little bit before about how we might break that up into three even runs, camping on the trail. And we see him kind of move up a little bit in the, in the rankings and the, over the night. He kind of drifted back and then came a little farther forward. And I think uh, he's got a good schedule and a good strategy going there as well. Just a little bit different than the rest, that's for sure. That, you know, and we talked a little bit about the mental aspects of, of sled dog racing. And I, I actually would rather be out just, just dealing with one musher like is happening at the front than in that big pack that you pointed out before. Competition gets really heated when you're in those packs of, say, from fourth to tenth place. If one person stands up and puts their boots on, everybody feels like they've got to get up and go. And there gets to be real intense pressure when positions are so closely locked together like like we see this morning yeah so one of the things you guys touched on a little bit ago is what happens mentally with a, a team like we're looking at Brigitte's team from earlier today, shortly after they had been passed by Robert Sorley's team. Um, what happens mentally to that dog team? You know, that was one of the questions we were discussing there. Um, I don't think the dogs really view it as a race like we do. And again, it's, we keep going back to this theme. You've got to look at it from the dog's point of view. Um, so part of it is what's going to skew their their point of view is how the musher is feeling here if the musher thinks that it's a big deal or a terrible thing that might affect the dogs a little bit what it will do immediately is this back team is going to have a what i call kind of an artificial kind of influence on their traveling speed as they try to catch up with the team ahead of them but honestly i don't think the dogs know that it's a big race or important i don't think that um, positioning means that much to a dog team these are human kind of emotions or feelings and we got to be careful not to kind of project those on to the on to the dogs as far as the dogs concerned they're happily running down the trail and they got really excited because they saw another dog team so they're going to speed up a little bit for the next section of trail and as a musher we have to decide if them speeding up is a good idea or if we want to let that other musher get away from us so that they'll settle back into the speed that that, that our team should be traveling at but as you hinted at there, a lot of people don't realize the sensitivity of sled dogs. It is the reflection of the emotion of the musher. These dogs are so, if you're pushing them to try and keep up, you let your competitive edge and they feel like they're being driven or pushed, they can really quickly get bummed out. Sled dogs are so sensitive to the mood of the musher. You, you almost don't have to say anything. It's like they can read it in you. And it's part of the mental part for a musher is to keep positive, focus on what's going right. Don't focus on what's going or is difficult on the, ra the race or that somebody passed you because the dogs pick up on that so quickly. I want to just touch it real quick. Here on the screen, we have um, this shot here. This is going to be our first glimpse of the lead mushers as they come into Tinset. It's about five kilometers out of Tinset, which is about, um, we're getting about 60 kilometers from the checkpoint uh, of Orgl <laughs> Orglerbogen that they'll be getting to a little bit later. So 60 kilometers to Orglerbogen. This is going to be our first view of the mushers. So we're That's hoping close. to see a musher come around the corner here real soon. That's about 37 miles for uh, our non-metric system users here. Um, so there's a, getting into this run pretty significantly. This run of the race is about 112 kilometers total. And so from this point where we're going to see the mushers here shortly is another 60 kilometers to Orkelbogen, putting about 52 kilometers behind the mushers at this point. So they're kind of nearing the midpoint of this run. Um, Thank you so much, uh, Dallas. Wow, yeah, it's getting um, it's getting very exciting. 60 kilometers to Orkelbogen, and it's a really long leg. It, it's one of the longest legs in the race, actually, yeah. yeah. And I'm excited to see uh, in the top five, we have two strong women in, uh, in uh, the top five here. And the sport of dog mushing, has it ever had any 
differences between men and female? There was a time in sprint racing uh, in a race called the North American, which is a three-day sprint race, kind of considered the biggest sprint race, at least in North America, if not the world, that they did have a, wo a woman, women's and men's class. But mushing has never done that. And as I'd mentioned earlier, that's one of the things we kind of prided ourselves on. It's just, are you a good dog musher or aren't you? It, it's not even something I would bring bring up. I didn't even think of that this morning. There's a man and a woman for first and second. It's just not in our minds. It's There's an equality to your skills, and that's what you're judged on. And on the flip side of that, though, there was a time in the Iditarod before Susan Butcher was winning it, and when she was rising, she was met with a lot of stereotyping, and she was met by the good old boys club where they didn't really want a woman winning the race, right? And so when she was able to break through, it was Libby Riddles who first won the Iditarod in 1985 as a woman. Susan then won it in 86, uh, and then a few times uh, again in the 80s. And so that kind of broke down all the barriers. And then I think we got to the era where Bruce is talking about now, where women were more accepted into the club and they became very competitive mushers but you're right there was a time i believe at least in in north america and in, in the iditarod where women weren't quite accepted as as being as good at this as as the men were but that's changed yeah yeah and uh, luckily yeah. uh now we'll uh, uh, go over to nina who's at orko bogan Yeah, I'm uh, right here at the checkpoint of Orkelbogen. And you guys talking about males and females running in their long distance races. That's pretty interesting because right now I have got hold of Inge Maria Holam, two times winner of the Finnmark race, second place finisher in the feminine race. Inge Maria was the first woman ever to be, win the long Finnmark race. Inge Maria, how does it feel to be the first woman, woman to beat all the men in the Finnmark race? I must say, I don't think about that very much. <laughs> it's some years ago now. Actually, it's uh, 10 years ago, uh, 2009, when I won the first time. And uh, the second time was in 2012. And uh, now I've been out of competition for some years, actually three years. And uh, um, now I'm really looking forward to do the, the long Finnmark race again, starting out in five weeks' time from now, I guess. Yeah, five weeks. So you're actually signed up for this year's Finnmark race, but here at this feminine race, you're handling your handler actually at the camel, yep. and she's doing the 450. Yes. How does it feel like being a handler for one time, for one, for a chance? <laughs> I must say, I would have preferred to just be on the sled myself, but you know, we we need some helpers when doing this sport, and uh, she has done a very good job during the whole season. And uh, then I think it's nice to to do things like this, give them the possibility to try it out. Did she have a tough race coming in here in the 450 class concerning the weather? Tell me. Yeah, tell me. It has been pretty rough up there and uh, she was kind of, I think uh, she was not actually fully prepared for this, but uh, you just have to deal with it. At, and she did and the, the dogs, they did well. So, uh, but she was kind of, she was exhausted when she came in. I, I, she, actually, she was a bit shocked because it was sort of rough up there. I, I took to some of my uh, extra dogs you know in this class they only do eight dogs and I, I have more dogs than that in training so I did the the, the trail from Sovol to, to here where we are now uh, in front of the teams like six hours in front of them but the, the weather has started to be really bad when I, I crossed the mountains here and uh, I spent a lot longer time than I had uh, planned to because it was heavy heavy winds and uh, when I went over there there were no no scooter trails so I had to follow the markers and it was windy and uh, blowing like hell up there uh, rough times really so I guess they had the, the, the same conditions maybe even worse when they came some hours after me so I guess uh, <laughs> they had uh, <laughs> exciting moments up there <laughs> So you actually had a training around yourself six hours before the measures coming in here last night, yeah. uh, going all the way from Seoul with your mm. dogs uh, not in the, in the race. Sorry for me for coughing. <coughs> 
Uh, you got some sleep after your long training run? Yeah, one, two hours, something like that. <laughs> so I'm, I'm fine now. <laughs> yeah. Are you prepared for this year's Finnmark race? I hope so. Now, some of the dogs uh, which are in uh, Christina's team, my handler's team, uh, they will do the Finnmark race, and the dogs I was doing myself um, this night, uh, they, they will do the Finnmark. So I have, uh, like, we, we started out with, like, 20 dogs training. Uh, in the autumn time, and um, uh, now I think I have 16, and we do 14 dogs in the Finnmark race. And uh, the distance uh, you may have told already is 1,200 kilometers. So I think in five weeks' time we will be ready for the Finnmark. You won the Finnmark race 2009 as the first woman ever, and you also won. And then you were also a rookie when you won, actually. So you won on your first try. And you won again in 2012. 2012. What are your ambitions for this year's race after not racing for three years? Uh, now I have many new dogs. None of them has. Uh, they, none of them had done, done the Finnmark race before, and uh, it's uh, definitely uh, an advantage to have dogs who have run through the trail before. This year, I haven't that. So um, I must say, I will do a good work with the dogs and uh, do every leg in the best way I, c I can, and uh, then it's uh, be. Then it will be. Maybe it will be good. I don't know. <laughs> I hope it will be good. What is your favorite part of mushing? What's the thing you like the most? Definitely being out with the dogs, particularly in the mountains. I love the mountains. I've been living up in Hardangervida, one of the uh, highest up mountain plateaus in, in Norway, uh, for several years. And having, I've been out with the dogs in those mountains uh, every day for 10, 10, uh, 10 years. So I love being out with them in the, in the, in the, in the mountains. Some years ago, while you were still competing every year and really, really having high ambitions, you actually said, told me that some uh, there was one year you wanted to go to the Editrod and do the Editrod. What happened? You still want to go? Yeah, I would like to go to the to Editrod and do that race, but I need some sponsors to do it because it's extremely expensive to go over there for for Norwegians. So so now I have to do the racing again and uh, show that I'm good enough. And uh, maybe I will get some sponsors and then I can do the Editrod. So you are depending on uh, sponsors to get all your Norwegian uh, your dogs crossing the Atlantic, going all the way to Alaska. Because would it be an option for you? To borrow dogs from a kennel in Alaska to race the Addis Road? No, definitely not. No, I have to bring my own dogs. How many dogs do you have at the moment? Oh, I have uh, like 30 dogs, plus plus, yeah. And probably some puppies. Many puppies. Inge Maria, really nice to see you again, and I really hope you'll have success in your Finnmark race after winning two times and not been competing for some years. It's good to see you back. Thank you, Inge. Thanks a lot. Over to the studio. Thanks, Ina. Now, as uh, Ingrid Maria was talking about, uh, it's incredibly expensive to do dog mushing, and especially if you're going to travel. Now, prior to the race, we chatted with Thomas Werner about sponsoring and costs. Let's look at this. I can compare dog mushing is like a big black hole, and you can just take a big, big shovel, and you can just start throwing all the money into it, and it will never stop. I always had really good uh, sponsors that have been helping me for many, many years. And without sponsors, it's not possible to do this sport. You have to have sponsors because you cannot pay having a team like this with a salary. That's not possible. You know, the salary goes more the normal things, electricity and insurance and food to yourself. But it's very important to have sponsors. For me, being a part of the team is actually that we are moving the sport forward. And it's important that the mushers has a certain level of economy. Also because, you know, you have to have the vaccines, you have to have the, you know, the deworming, all the things you need for the dog health and also the dog food. So I think one of the things of the, what the team is doing is actually helping the sport to move forward and also make other teams, not only our team, but actually show others that it's possible to make team 
and maybe make have companies coming in and, and to build up the sport. I think if you start with dog mushing, you are not into the. It's not the money that is driving you, but uh, dog mushing is it's a rich life with the dogs. That's not. It's not a rich life with money. Yes, so Bruce, you've been a musher and you probably dealt with this uh, issue of uh, money or... Well, it does. It just costs money to feed that many dogs that you have to have to be competitive. The price of dog food, the price of meat, the transportation to get to these races. But I'll say in all fairness, any sport at the top of its level depends on sponsorship. If if you're a skier in Norway wanting to go to the Olympics, you're probably going to fly down to Argentina or Chile in, in the summertime to be training down there. I mean, I know some people that are in those events and they're constantly chasing the snow to keep training. So just the time off from work to compete, like, like we're seeing right now, and all those things combined, you have to have sponsors. That's why stadiums are named after sponsors as well. And so the event needs sponsorships to have them happen so the public can see these these exhibits of whatever event it is, skiing, dog mushing, soccer, and also the teams individually need sponsorships to make it financially feasible. And the, the whole key to sponsorships and mushers finding sponsorships is eyeballs on the event, right? There's a, there's a saying in America that marketing is all about spots and dots. It's all about, the, you know, the number of people who are going to see your musher representing your company. And so I think what we're doing right now may help mushers grow those sponsorships. I know if I owned an outdoor clothing company, the first person that I would have on the design team is a musher because they spend more time outdoors than anybody. And when you consider they're going eight to 10 miles an hour down a trail, they have so much downtime, so much time to be thinking. Now, is this the best way to put a zipper on a parka? Is this where it should be? Should it go up? Should it go down? Should it be inside? Should it be outside? If I owned a clothing company, I'd have a musher in my design team. Because no doubt. They would know they all know. about it. <laughs> they absolutely know. Yes, and I know that uh, Dallas have brought a lot of dogs overseas to uh, uh, compete in, um, in European uh, sled dog races. Yeah, the last couple of years uh, I've traveled from Alaska over to Norway to compete in the races here. And, uh, you know, of course, that's the exact same process as a musher has to face to go from Norway to compete in the Iditarod in Alaska. And it is a really expensive process to get that done. You know, I've been fortunate to have good support and a lot of people that are, you know, involved with our kennel and love to watch the sled dogs and have gotten to know, them that know the dogs individually just through social media and following these races. The first time I came over here, I had a, a very good um, larger sponsor, and that was, you know, easy for me working with one one company. Last year was really amazing though, without that larger corporate sponsor, you know, we were a part of the Quill Pet team and they were very much uh, supporting us to do that trip. But we had tons of just fans that have followed us and you know, I consider them friends now, donating small sums of money to help fly just an individual dog to Norway, sponsoring one of those dogs, getting them over to Norway so that we could compete in the race. It was a really fun atmosphere with those fans, with, with that direct connection in with our team. We were trying to document the whole trip to be able to you know, keep getting information out to those folks that had helped support us to do it and that is absolutely a crucial element whether it's a financial kind of supporter that might live a thousand miles away and loves to wa watch the races through social media and have that connection or if it's somebody local who is you know the person who helps me make my sled bags and when I have something broken I take it to Lori and she gets it sewn up and fixed for me and gets it to the airport before I have to fly out you know we have so many people supporting us on so many different levels that when I see each of these teams in this race here I understand that that one musher and that team of dogs represents so many people's efforts whether that's their effort at their normal job so that they can you know donate some amount of money to to help them this team get to the starting line or if it's a local person that's donating their time or their expertise or their skills to help sew something or fix something or help build a sled for that musher or simply the person who drives the truck to the airport so that you can get out with the dogs and fly and they take your truck back home there's all these different levels of support and i think it really is cool to see how the community involvement affects that dog team and we see this in the iditarod mushers that do well they have good community support i'm thinking of some of our mushers that live off the road system in Alaska. They have some great community support out there. And, and that is a big part of being a musher is 
you know, being a person that um, you can get that community support and you can, you know, recognize and appreciate what those folks are doing for you and be able to give back to that. I can't imagine even like dog food, how much food <laughs> it goes with. Like, how much would you spend on dog food for um, for a day? You know, that's that's uh, a question that I'm always afraid to figure out on a per day basis. <laughs> but there's many times that I'm carrying two five gallon buckets uh, in my hands going out to feed my dogs. I'm thinking each of these buckets is $50 worth of food <laughs> you know, by the time you have all those supplementation in there and everything else. You know, on average in my kennel, and this goes from a little tiny puppy up to a 15-year-old dog that requires very little food because he's just laying on the couch all day, and of course all the racing dogs in the middle, but the average is about $1,200 per year per dog for each dog in my kennel, and that's just for the calories. The dry food, you know, the kibble that comes in a dog food bag, the meat, which is fish and chicken and beef, the fat, which is, again, a lot of uh, chicken fat, uh, beef fat, some pork fat mixed in there, some fish oil, of course, krill oil, you know, things like that. That's just the calories. That $1,200 a year per, uh, yeah, per dog per year doesn't count the man hours that it takes to actually feed that dog. So for probably each 12 to 15 dogs that you have in a kennel, you're going to need to have one person in that kennel. You know, and, and this varies a little bit depending on the age of the dogs and the level of training that they're at. Uh, so that's a huge expense as well. And then all the mineral supplementation, the nutritional supplementation that we do you know, for vitamins and whatnot, these are top athletes. They're just like human athletes. that They can't eat cheeseburgers and have no other vitamin supplementation and expect them to perform at a high level. It is a very, very expensive hobby. Um, it's a very expensive sport. And like Greg and Bruce were just talking about there, with any sport, you, <laughs> the higher you go in that sport, the more expensive each incremental improvement costs, right? So when we talk about what does it cost to race the Iditarod, well, just simply to do the race isn't that outrageous, assuming you already own the dogs and the sled and the cars and you live in a place that's Arctic and you have all your dog houses already set up. The decision to be a musher with owning all this and just to decide to run the race, you might be able to do it on 20000 25000 if you're really operating on a budget and you assume you were going to feed those dogs anyway, so that's not really part of the race expense. But if you want to race this, the Iditarod at the top levels, which means if you don't have great snow conditions here today, everybody's going to load in the truck. You're going to spend several hundred dollars in fuel getting to where there is good snow conditions. Now you're renting a cabin or staying in a hotel room, um, you know, these traveling expenses to get that training on the dogs. Your sled, you're going to be shaving ounces. Anybody involved in cycling knows the difference between, you know, an $8,000 bike and a $2,000 bike. They're both really good, but one's a little bit better. You've got the carbon fiber cup holder that, shaves, you know, shaved off 50 grams or something. So it's those little things that start to cost a lot a lot of money so to really be racing at the top is a very expensive hobby um, and I call it a hobby because you're not going to get that back from racing you know we just watched the Bear Grease you know Ryan Reddington won that race it was the first race in the Krill Pet Arctic World Series and I was thinking the cost of feeding those 12 dogs for the year just the, they're just the food cost is more than that team won for first place in that race. <laughs> so it's nice to get a paycheck from a race. That's very nice to you know offset the expense. But these mushers are not doing this because they're going to make money doing it. They're putting all of their time and effort into making money so that they can then put all of their extra time and effort into developing these dog teams and being able to go out here and, and have the experience. That's really what it's about. And I think that most mushers in the feminine race probably uh, work next to yeah. being a musher. Yeah, and you're talking to Dallas Seavey, right? A guy who's won four Iditarods. And yeah. so he's very much in the corporate side of things and is able to uh, go to corporations and ask for money based on what he has accomplished in his career. But when you look at the average mushers, especially those that run the Iditarod who haven't won, maybe don't even have a top 20 finish in it, and they're going out each year and having to find a way to feed dogs throughout a 12-month calendar year, it's very difficult. And many of those people live at a poverty level where oftentimes for that week they may be deciding, do I feed myself, do I feed a dog? Uh, we've heard these stories throughout the years covering our race. And so this is not a sport that anybody is ever going to get wealthy doing. There's just some who are able to put together a living and make it work. Now, uh, Nina, I can see that you're ready at Urkelbogen. 
Yes, Maria, I'm at still at Oracle Bogen and I'm gonna be here for a long time because we don't have this 650 mushers arriving anytime. Well, right now, they are still expected in some hours. I'm trying to find out this, well, the right time they will probably be here, but it's gonna be some hours before the front runners, uh, the leader of the 650 will be here actually. The teams you see here behind me, those are the teams of the 450 class. Uh, the front runners of the 450 <coughs> class left five hours ago, four or five hours ago, almost six hours ago actually. So these are the mid teams in this 450 class. And there are still a lot of 450 cl uh, class mushers uh, arriving here to the checkpoint. That is because the 650 started Friday at noon while they have been down to Trisil, which is 200 kilometers more than the 450 class. So when they meet up at this checkpoint and the checkpoint of Serval, the last checkpoint, that's when you will see the 450 teams and the 650 teams coming actually uh, in the race together. So. You just have to watch the bib numbers and read the, the registration to find out who's having which bib number to understand who is in the 650 and who is in the 450. You know, because the measures are dropping dogs, leaving the dogs to their handler teams. That means that you might see some 650 measures um, mushing six, uh, eight dogs, and you see the eight dog class, the 450 class. Uh, they do start with six, uh, eight dogs, and they d might have eight dogs, and they have got to finish with five dogs, while the 650 class start with 12 dogs, and they got to finish with um, uh, six oh. dogs. So what I'm saying that it will be a bit complicated if you have like helicopter photos to see if it's a 650 team or a 450 team. You yeah, might have Nina, some questions I'm, for I'm me in the that... studio. We have Robert Sorley and uh, Birgitte Ness out in front of this race. I'm going to think that they should be ri arriving in Urkelbogen between four to four and a half hours from now, depending on the trail and their speeds, if they sustain where they're at right now. You know, do we start to see some of the, the handlers getting there now? And w are they doing anything, you know, preparing for the mushers to arrive? Is there any anticipation amongst the handlers there? You know, Dallas, all the handlers are here at the checkpoint right now, they're pr uh, only for the 450 class, because a half mile from here, we have a very nice hotel, the Orkelbogen Hotel, and I know some of the handlers in the 650 class are actually waiting down at the hotel, probably trying to catch up some sleep, because it's some hours before their mushroom will be here. That's why they will probably use the time now to ha get some very much needed sleep. So all the handlers right here now are actually from the 450 50 class but I do expect some of the 650 handlers to arrive so I'm sure I'll try to get you an interview with a handler of one of the front runners No, it'd be great to hear whatever we can you might uh, have questions. out in the field. And it's been fun seeing uh, what you're collecting there, talking to some of these people, milling around, you know. And I, I would assume that a lot of the uh, 450 handlers, you know, they're also excited to see the, the 650 race in here as well, and also the mushers. It's always fun to be watching a dog race, even if your team's not competing in that class of the race. So uh, has there been much discussion about the 650 race? Or is right now it's really just a focus on the 450 race? Um, what's kind of, what are people talking about in there? Well, most of the people here are talking about the 450 class, and uh, that's the class we are, unfortunately, we're not following. We're just following the 650, because the 450 is not a part of the Krill Pet Arctic World Series. So the 450 is not in that series. So we. But the handlers, I mean, some of the handlers in the 450 class are actually very, uh, very um, uh, experienced uh, sick, uh, mushers. And we just had a talk a little bit earlier with Inge Maria Holam, the two-time winner of the Finnmark race, also second place finisher in the long famine race. She's handling her handler at the kennel at, in the 450 class. And I mean, there are some pretty, pretty uh, experienced handlers here in the 450, but we do want talk to the handlers of the front runners in the 650 and um, but right now I think most of the handlers in the race the both classes are getting really tired they don't get much sleep one hour in the car there maybe one hour inside a cafe laying down on the ground on the, in the inside a cafe just catching up all the much needed sleep since leaving the, uh, Red Ops, the center of Redos at the, uh, Friday just go ahead if you have questions I'll try to answer 
Yeah, what? I wonder, Nina, uh, you said that they will start to mix at Tolga, the last checkpoint. Then we will see both of the 650. No, before that, uh, as, lo as leaving the last checkpoint of Servoland, there will be, from Servoland to Orkelbugen to Tolga, there will be uh, 450 radar measures and the 650 class going together all the way to the finish line. But the last 450 measures are probably around the Servoland area at the moment or on their way to Orkelbugen. And those teams will be mixing up with most of the front runners of the 650 so you just got to concentrate and try to figure out their bib numbers uh, if you have like helicopter shots of uh, uh, helicopter filming you, you might be having a bit of problem uh, differing or uh, f uh, understanding which team belongs to which class you just have to count uh, the number of dogs and try to get a, a, a nice view of the uh, bib number and of course, us back here with so a little actually, more technology, actually, we're also sorry. able to see on the GPSs a little bit to kind of guesstimate which musher it might be there. So that helps gives us a little more insight when we do have the you know footage of a team. And just for reference for our viewers that were looking at the, the screen a few minutes ago, the dog team we saw in there was one of the 450 mushers there. So now we have a, a view of our, check, or our uh, race map here with the GPSs. So when we see a musher in a certain area, we can kind of figure out where this is and you know click on the musher or get that information, and we can see if that's a 450 musher or a you know 650 musher in there. And right now we do see uh, out front we have. Um, Robert Sorley and Brigitte Dines still right close together towards the front of this race. We're hoping to get some live footage of them here soon as they make their way over to Orkelbogen checkpoint. They're still about a little more than 60 kilometers from that checkpoint. Um, they're very close together. You know, we're not seeing a huge gap starting to cre be created just yet. I think that is going to grow over the course of this race, though, as they get closer to the next checkpoint. Uh, yeah, <laughs> 199 meters, pretty close there. We can see Petter Carlson is still staying right about that 17 kilometers back um, in third place. Here we go. He's a ways back down the trail. And those mushers up in front, they've just kind of reached the top of a hill. We should see their speeds pick up as they start to drop down the other side of that mountain. So back here, we have Petter Carlson, about 17 kilometers behind our lead mushers, Robert Surley and Borgit Dines. We're going to drift a little bit farther back to position number four, where we have Barbara Inuin back here. Um, her daughter having just won the junior class. She's got to be very proud about that. Um, this kennel's already got one victory in the bag here and looking like they're going to have another good finish in the 650 class. A little bit farther back, we have Rolf Johannesson uh, in fifth place. Daniel Hagenson behind him in uh, sixth place, both of which are looking nice right with Hagenson. We have Pete Janssen as well, or Janssen as well. They're traveling very close together. This could shape up to be another exciting race back here with a, a fairly significant age difference between these two mushers. So uh, it's going to be interesting to see Hagenson, a very good human athlete. Janssen, a very experienced musher. Going back to eighth place, we see Thomas Werner, who was uh, leading this race yesterday as we left off with our live coverage and has had to kind of take a little bit more rest to try to address the, the speed in his team you know many of these mushers we got to remember they have bigger races later on so I think Werner realizes that you know this race he's not going to win let's use it as a good training run and be prepared for the Iditarod in just a few short weeks behind them in number nine we have Volen and then we have uh, the actual checkpoint of Solville, that's uh, where these mushers are getting done with their rest, and Ronnie Friendland is out on the trail right now in 10th position, and a few more mushers getting ready to leave or have just left that Solvin checkpoint, and so uh, we'll see that as this race starts to develop, you know, they're starting to spread out a little bit. We remember the first days of this race when the mushers were all right together. Now they're starting to form these separate packs. And uh, we're waiting for the helicopter who just refueled and it will so soon take off to provide us with some more beautiful live pictures from the trail, from Robert, from Birgitte Ness. And, uh, but while we're waiting, in the meantime, our stunt reporter Dax Carrington got the hold of uh, Thomas Werner. Hi, this is Dex Carrington, and a lot of people think that mushing is basically gliding along in a sunset or gliding along in sunrise and everything being awesome with a flare and the northern lights above you. But in fact, there's a dark side. I'm here with Thomas Werner, who's going to tell me a story about one time where it went a little bit, as, you know, as, askew. Well, I, although early in Alaska, 
It was a big mountain and I was running up because I wanted to catch a guy in front of me to get rookie of the year. And I got really wet and it was really cold. And I get down on the on the ocean ice and it was minus 30 and blowing. And I was freezing so much. But the dogs were so crazy and it was just glare ice. So I couldn't stop. You know, I love to have happy, healthy dogs that are just screaming to go. But I said, hey guys, what is this? Can I just stop for two minutes? I can put some more clothes on. And I was freezing really, really bad, you know, really shaking. And my head was starting to shut down. So that was some hours with uh, pain. Well, there you have it. In mushing, just like in life, you need to deal with your head shutting down. Well, thank you, Dex. And uh, for those who don't know Celsius, uh, I think it's about, it's, it's the same. Minus 40 Celsius is minus 40 Fahrenheit. 40 and 40 is the same. Yeah. 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 Wow, it's pretty cold. And we know where he's talking. I know exactly, yeah, know where, exactly he's where he's talking, talking about. about. It's always, trip. always cold and the wind's always blowing there. It's big, it's yeah. a big, big, continuous rolling mountains. You get way up high and then you come right down to the ocean on the sea ice and the wind blows. It's always glare ice. So many mushers have been through what he describes. You're all sweaty from going up. Then they come downhill, just screaming fast. And you come out onto this flat plain with the wind blowing off the Bering Sea and you freeze to death to the next checkpoint, which is about 20 miles away. It's part of the fun of racing. <laughs> but what about the dogs? They don't care. Oh, they, yeah, the piece of cake. Yeah. But it's more about the head shutting down that we should be talking about because you got to remember, he's six, seven, whatever, hundreds of miles into the race. His head's already half shut down anyways by that point. So to have hypothermia start to, to soak in right there, that's a, we, we laugh about it now, and, and he's Thomas is laughing about it in that, but it's actually a dangerous situation if you've gotten wet in those conditions it's it's in an area that's not always easy to find the trail either because it's wide open tundra once you come off those hills there is not a tree there is not a bush it's just flat arctic tundra and uh, to people that haven't lived in that environment it can be really disorienting like how fast am i traveling why don't i see anything up ahead of me it's just this moonscape it's not if you know that environment you look at the land different but the first time you go there, it's it shakes a lot of people up. You feel like you're in the middle of nowhere. Yeah, and that you're not going. No, you are. No, you, you are. are. No, you <laughs> are. At least you, you can are. see nowhere from there. <laughs> <laughs> and he's sleep deprived, right? And so your brain is already not functioning well. So then you put yourself in, in an even more difficult situation. And it truly is dangerous. Those are the parts of the trail on the Iditarod that are truly dangerous. In other places, you can break a bone. It's places like that where you, you know, life could be threatened. Uh -huh. Yeah. So yeah. he laughs, but I guarantee you he wasn't laughing when he was in the middle of that. No. And um, uh, Dallas, um, uh, no, uh, I know that Nina is at Orkelvogen. Hi, over to you. Well, I'm right here at the checkpoint of Orkelbogen with one of the foreign veterinarians. I can sit all day. Right with me table. here, I have Jose Podrero from uh, Malaga in Spain. And he's a very experienced sled dog veterinarian. Thank you. How come you travel to the Scandinavian races year after year after year from the sunny beaches of uh, Malaga in <laughs> Spain or by the Mediterranean Sea? Maybe run away from the heat. <laughs> Why not? Good music, good company, good environment, good dogs. This is that everything that I want. <laughs> when did you come to the Norwegian races for the first time? My first time in Norway was uh, 2011 to Femen, in Femen, yeah. You've been to Femen before, you've been very experienced from the Finnmark race. I know you've been checking my dogs a lot of times while racing these races. Have you ever been a, a race wet in the Yukon Quest or the Iditarod? I never went there. I never went there. It's a, a dream for me. Maybe in the future we can go there to Yukon and Iditarod also. Yeah. Jose, you're also you're a veterinarian, but you're mm -hmm. also a chiropractic, aren't you? Yes, yes. I like this too much. That's changed my life. Yeah. Tell me, how does the team wait? Well, well, let me say it in another way. What is the main check you do here on the uh, on the teams? What are you looking for here at Orkelbogen? The most important things are the dogs are uh, happy, are uh, well hydrated has a good uh, water balance in the body, 
has a, still has a good energy, so good uh, good uh, body condition score, and there is no problems that threaten the life. This is the most important. The dog is still happy and still can run in a properly way, you know. But right now we are a veterinarian at this checkpoint checking the dogs of the 450 class. Yes. Are you going to be here when the 650 measures arrive as well? Yes, of course, yes. So we, are, we are in charge to open the checkpoint and to close the checkpoint. So we are here for both races. Mm -hmm. So you are only going to stay here and then you'll go back to the Dodos and yes. attend the banquet yes. as well? Yes, of course, yes. Mm -hmm. But what do you expect to see when the front runners in the 650 class come? What do you expect to see? Because those dogs, the mushers, have been out on trail a longer time than the 450 runners. So what are you expecting? They are a big fight in front. There is amazing how the dogs can run like this in these mountains with these trails. Is let me think. I can't imagine. I can't believe it. It's it's amazing. It's amazing. Amazing. We we have a very close race at the moment uh, with Robert Surly and yes. Brigitte Ness. Uh, you know these measures from before. Yes, I know. I know all of them, and for me, are yeah the best musher in the in the world. Yeah, they are fantastic. But when a musher come here and you check their dogs, most of these front runners will probably take their six hour rest here mm -hmm. and then they'll have a mandatory check. Yeah, they, they can choose to have a mandatory check here or in Tolga. So, but the most of them maybe they can do here. So Tolga is the last checkpoint and the musher, they, the mushers need to take their last six hour mandatory rest either here at Orkelbogen or at the last checkpoint Tolga. But as they are in the competi competitive part of the race, they are the front runners, they probably do it here yes. and yes. go all the way to the finish line. Yes. Yes. Uh, but when they come here, how do you expect the dog teams to be? Uh, there is a long stretch from Sobolen. Uh, they have to climb a lot of times. Um, the condition of the trail, they are not so good. So there is a tough trail and tough uh, length from the from Sobolen. So we have to, to look for the dogs is, is arrive in a good condition, uh, good hydration and and still happy and everything um, that means it's, it's in a good way, it's running in a good way because there is a big struggle in front and it's too hard and too tough. If for the, them, for the, the first two days of the first two days of the race, you actually and uh, it was very warm. It's getting colder now. Yes, that's yes, a bad. That's yeah. better for the dogs. Yes, of course. Yeah, you know, it's very important. This uh, te temperature dropping a little bit down. Yeah. Thank you very much, You're Jose. Welcome. I really uh, enjoy seeing you every year. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> really, really well. Congratulations. All right, we've got some live images from the trail. We got our helicopter back up in the air and getting coverage. This is Birgitta Ness in second place, uh, cruising along, looking very nicely. Um, only a short distance behind Rover Sorley, but earlier when we saw these guys, they were right together. And now we see there's been a little bit of space created between the two teams. And again, they're about halfway through this long run of the race. Um, still have about 60 kilometers left to go to Orkelbogen before uh, they're going to have their mandatory six, either there or at the next checkpoint. But how they've set up this race, I think we can very confidently say that both Robert Sorley and Brigitte, who we are watching right now, again, this is Brigitte Ness, um, will be taking their six-hour rest at this next checkpoint, 60 kilometers from here. This is a beautiful trail that they're traveling down right here. You have the tree coverage. They've kind of crested over a mountain, and uh, right now they're kind of contouring alongside of it, so not a lot of elevation change just yet. But here in a, a few more kilometers, they're going to start heading down again, and we're going to see these guys uh, kind of get a chance to see what they look like, um, really stretching out with a little bit faster speed. Of course, the mushers will be kind of monitoring that speed and keeping it slowed down a little bit but I'm really liking what I'm seeing right here as this uh, dog team kind of navigates through the forest and just a beautiful shot live from the trail about halfway between Servor and Orkelbogen um, as they kind of get this is probably the second to last run of the race they're going to take a, a long rest when they get to the next checkpoint and then run all the way to the finish would be my guess yeah I think that's 
right? When you look at strategy-wise and a, a six-hour rest uh, that we'll be taking where they're heading and such a small amount of trail left to the finish line, I, I think you have to assume that's what will happen unless something happens. But will they stop at all even to snack, Bruce, or it's just a charge to the finish line at that point? Well, there is one last checkpoint after that six-hour, and I would Tolga. expect Tolga, where there they might give a little snack or change booties but uh, on dogs, but you pretty much are going to run that as this run and then one more. And to the musher's mind, what that means as a sidebar is I only have to bend over and boot the whole team one more time, which right. is pretty good on your back. <laughs> and in longer races like the Iditarod, when you have rests that are taking outside of checkpoints, there's some strategy in that because a musher then who might be in second place can choose to cut a little rest. But with a six hour mandatory rest here and really no other rest between that and the finish line, it comes down to the speed of the dog team. That's the only way you're gonna overtake Robert Sorley at this point, unless his team slows down tremendously. Well, that's true, but yet each musher has to judge the speed of their dogs because we had that example yesterday of people having to load a dog. You put an extra 50 pounds in that sled and, and it could be between the two front runners or that pack farther back. If you misjudge the speed you should be going and you load a dog, then you slow down. So it looks like we've got uh, Robert, Robert coming up our here, first I'm, view. I'm a, yeah, we got Robert Sorley coming up on our live camera here. Um, so he's just a, a short distance ahead of Brigitte, who we were just watching. But this is Robert Sorley, the leader of our race, come by our camp for live. Smoking. He seems to be in good spirits and a nice looking team right there, kind of as they start to head down this mountainside and uh, going to be picking up speed. Yeah, and we're starting to see him use that speed. I mean, I realize now, at least by looking at the scale of the maps we have of the changes in elevation, they're on more of a downhill run and the dogs are healthy. And and even before in the helicopter view, a little bit more of a lope now. He's letting them roll. Like you said yesterday, Dallas, building that monster and then when to turn it loose. When can you use that saved up energy? And they're going a little bit more out of a trot and edging up into a lope which is a little faster and 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 both teams seem to be doing that here but they're also in a little bit of a downhill run but you don't want to get too exuberant and overrun a dog and then have to load it and lose that edge absolutely bruce that's that's a really important factor and when we talk about building the monster you know they're like we we're saying before about the different types of speed or the different aspects of speed building the monster is one of those aspects creating good speed on the race but then how you use that speed so that you can continue to have that speed and that's what i've seen as a as a mistake sometimes is people use all that speed on one run and then at the next run they're right in the same place and i think we're going to see robert sorely very expertly you know maintain that speed and use it in the right places and use it in such a way that he continues to have speed all the way to the finish line and you guys were just talking about the uh, Tulga checkpoint that's halfway between Orkelbogen and uh, Roros where the finish is when I think of that checkpoint what I see is an opportunity to leave a dog behind if they're not doing well so that's a that's a very important aspect when you're a musher leaving a mandatory six hour break you know that they have uh, coming up here they're gonna have the information from this run how each dog is doing what they're not gonna know is how is that six hour rest going to affect the dog Maybe Maybe there's a dog that's a little bit fatigued in this run and doing well, but they don't know how much of a, of a boost that dog's going to get from a long six hour rest. So they might be a little bit more confident taking that dog out on the trail, recognizing that they won't necessarily have to take that dog the entire uh, 136 kilometers to the finish because there's a checkpoint after just 71 kilometers where they could leave that dog behind. If it seems to be, you know, yes, it got a boost from that six hour rest, but not enough to go that full distance to the finish at the pace that they're holding. Now, earlier today, I heard that Nina was uh, interviewing Didrik, who said that he had to scratch the feminine race uh, some years ago because he hadn't trained for the right kilometers. Uh, what does he mean by that? Well, that can mean a number of things, but what I heard him say in that is he had a lot of training, a lot of uh, of, of miles or kilometers on the dogs, but it was the wrong kind of training. And if if you use muscles and train at one thing, let's say you're a skier and you're in really good shape, but then you get on a bike, you're gonna be sore the next day. So maybe he trained on real hard pack trails and they could move, but then it was a soft trail and it's a whole different set of muscles. So you have to train your dogs in a variety or any, 
uh, well, and we'll just stay with that. You have to train your dogs in a variety of trail conditions so that they equally develop all their muscle groups. And I interpreted that as you can put 2,000 kilometers on a dog in training, but if it's the wrong kind of miles, the wrong kind of trail, and then they get in those conditions like the images we saw blowing snow and soft soft trail, they're gonna be sore after they rest. So you, you have to get them out and show them everything that they might encounter during a race. That's how I, I took that. Uh, did you hear that a little bit of that interview with Dallas and his referral to that? I did briefly, yes. Um, you know, and I think you're hitting the right points here. You know, there's a. Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna cut in here because we've got a. I just saw a musher hat, <laughs> so I think we got a dog team. This should be Brigitte Ness approaching our, our live camera on the trail, and not too long behind Robert Sorley. I'm hoping to get an accurate uh, time difference here, but nice looking team. We got four minutes and 24 seconds that Robert has put between her and second place, or I'm sorry, him and second place, Brigitte Dines here. Again, she's got a smile on her face as she well should. I mean, once again, we're seeing nice looking teams. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, she does slim down on dog numbers at this next checkpoint here, maybe leaving one or two behind. But nice looking team all in all traveling by. You know, it's, it's kind of interesting to see how much does the musher think that it's necessary to slow them down going down the hills. Because uh, if a dog's a little bit fatigued, they can, you know, travel nicely at the at a steady pace on flat ground. But is the musher willing to let them open up going down the hills here? And I think we saw Robert holding a bit faster pace as he went down this little decline and going by the camera there. Of course, we're just getting a glimpse into these mushers' runs as they're going to be out there for many hours, you know, managing each you know, downhill, each flat land, and then each climb. But another nice looking team, and again, that was Brigitte Ness. Here up ahead uh, from our live helicopter, we have Robert Sorley. He stopped uh, probably giving his dogs just a quick snack break and has to um, take care of business. <laughs> but uh, yeah, getting this team lined out. This is one thing as a musher, it's, it's a little bit challenging when you always have a helicopter overhead. <laughs> Trying to find proper tree cover to take care of your other needs out there. And he's back on the trail, or yep, back on the trail, cruising along here. Um, so yeah, they're still going to take a few short stops. You know, like I said before, we're going to stop every hour or so and do what I call a good dog stop, where you're just going to check on the lines, let the dog have a bathroom break, maybe give them a snack, maybe not, depending on where you're at and what you want to have them, uh, you know, how you want their appetite when you reach the checkpoint, if you're going to focus more on those bigger meals in the checkpoint. But this is a smooth looking dog team right here. I'm seeing a really brisk trot from almost all the dogs. Uh, man, that's a, just a, a nice looking dog team. Still running the full lineup of 12 dogs. I'm seeing a very powerful team right here that is running well within their means. You know, and that's what's really impressive about it is that he's running an incredibly competitive race. And it's not something that just the best five or six or eight dogs in his team can do. This is a pace that all 12 dogs can do. And that shows me a kennel with depth and a real uniformity from dog one through dog 12 as well. So this, this is an impressive looking dog team right here. And uh, again, as, as of when they went by the camera, there's about a four minute and 20 second gap that he's been able to put between him and Brigitte, you know, over the last couple uh, last couple kilometers that these guys have been traveling. So he's mostly out of sight. They're getting down onto the river here where he is going to have a longer view. And for me, when I, you know, come out of the trees and hit a long flat lake or somewhere with a long view, I'm going to look at my watch when I hit that lake, as soon as I come out of the trees, and then I'll be looking over my shoulder to get a timestamp of when my competitor comes out and see, okay, when I cross this lake, they're three minutes behind, maybe five or six miles later, I hit another lake, and they're now you know eight or nine minutes behind me. So I'm sure that uh, Robert's doing that, but I think he's pretty confident you know, obviously having outrun Brigitte in the past runs, having caught up with her on this run, having passed her on this run, and now putting some distance between them. But that is a beautiful looking dog team right there. We see him stretching out nicely. Yeah, obviously uh, Robert's not afraid to, you know, let him catch that fifth gear as they're cruising across some flat land. All the dogs are strong and healthy enough to easily go up a couple degrees faster if they need to. Here, having to do a little bit of uh, steering. We got the volunteer out there helping to direct them. Robert communicating with those lead dogs via voice commands. So the thing on to this that, track. 
The thing that I see in the difference in these two teams, both nice teams, obviously both of them leading the race with quite a distance between the others. But just the thing that I see in Robert's team is every dog is so equal. Their legs are moving at the same pace. They're all just such a, there's such uniformity and speed and lack of effort to travel. And when I look at Ness's team, there's more individual dogs, more little differences in gates and that is and whether that's at a lope at a fast race or in a more a longer distance race that means that one dog isn't being overstressed keeping up with the others and I see that much more in Robert's team than I do in her team here we got a pass going on yeah. but see Robert's dogs they don't even hesitate they just line out smooth quick transition and right back into it and that is a that is the edge i see with this team heading to the finish line Our i don't team. know i don't know who he just passed but what a great moment it is in that musher's life when you pass a trail and you get a high five from the great robert sorley going by that's a great moment to catch there on camera but bruce even from uh, again from a non-educated standpoint i think you can look at the two teams and see the difference this team is working in such unison and, and you're right you can see the fact that each dog is paired with a partner that are just working and and you used to use the analogy of pistons in an engine and that's kind of what i see with those feet hammering on the ground right now they're all just almost hitting at the same time yeah because anybody that's into vehicles you knows you know racing is the that if those pistons aren't, if you got one piston that's firing out of sequence, the engine doesn't reach its maximum potential at yeah. your speed. The engine runs rough. And this, this in my mind, is just a beautiful, beautiful picture right? of what a long distance sled dog should look like which makes yeah, it Bruce, no Bruce, you're touching wonder. on some really good points in there. You know, and, and I think one of the one of the aspects is we've talked about musher age in this race, you know, and it's a great thing in, in dog sled racing that you can have such a wide gap in musher ages and experience levels being competitive. But one of the things we overlook is that, yes, Robert has 31 years of experience on this race trail, but he has so many years of developing a kennel and having consistently run that kennel for 30, 40 years. That tells me that his genetics and, his, and those sled dogs have had time to mature and develop, and, and he's really honed in on the type of dog that he likes to work with. You know, you know how many dogs that he's had the privilege to work with and train over the years, and how many dogs he's been able to select which ones he wants to breed, which traits he wants to perpetuate. And that's where we're seeing the result of those many years of kennel ownership and kennel management done well here on the trail. And that's a major obstacle that as a younger musher and not just by age but having a younger kennel presents when you compete in these top races as many of the Iditarods that I've raced in I've been aware enough to realize I only have eight dogs that can compete at this level meanwhile mushers that are literally old enough to be my dad as some of them are my dad um, have had years and years to develop that kennel and they have a full 16 dog team of that quality but as a musher you have to learn how to race that team so I've become very comfortable running smaller teams, knowing that those were the dogs that were at that same level. And so you might not have that full 12 dog team, or depending on the race that you're running, right, and the dog limits that have all that uniformity. And so when we see this here, part of it is the mastery on the trail of how he's run the race. Part of it is the years of just developing this team and developing a kennel that produces those consistent top quality dogs. And that's probably why we're seeing so little variation from the ability levels from one dog to the next. He's running a team, you know, a 12 dog team, and they're all tens. There's no fives and sixes, you know, rated scale in there mixed in with this pack. And so that is a really beautiful sight. And a lot of that is stuff, you know, the, his hard work prior to the race. Now, question from a dummy who doesn't know that much. Uh, what types of dogs are these? Is it Alaskan or Siberian Huskies? These are I, definitely... I wonder if the nomenclature is correct to say Alaskan Huskies when they're from Norway. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I would say these are, you know, these are Norwegian Alaskan Huskies. And we use the term Alaskan Husky in a really broad range, right? And especially when I'm looking at a team like Rober Sorley's that's been kind of... Um, developed and bred in a little bit of a microcosm here in a different culture on a different side of the planet 
you know, comparing them to, let's say, Jeff King's dogs, who he's had dogs for many, many years as well, competed in the, in the Iditarod, you know, he's got to be getting close to 30 times now, or Martin Boozer, who's competed over 30 times. They're all Alaskan Huskies, but each musher has their unique strain of dogs, and they do, the, the musher breeds the dogs that are the personality that they enjoy working with, the tempo that they feel comfortable working with. Some mushers, personality-wise, gravitate towards speed dogs. Other mushers gravitate towards maybe a slower, steady, or more durable dog. So while we call them all Alaskan Huskies, there is a real art to breeding and developing dogs and even crossing these different established lines of Alaskan Huskies. So these are Robert Sorley, you know, Norwegian Alaskan Huskies <laughs> would be what I would call them there. And that's one of the things you asked earlier about <clears throat> what are what's going to be the revolution in the future that's going to make races speed up or go faster. One of the big things is the development of this genetic pool that mushers have shared breeding the very best animals. Uh, Dogs have gone back and forth from Alaska, Canada, Norway, uh, the lower 48, where people are concentrating on these dogs, and the genetics has been so refined. Now, we don't care what they look like. They can be any color, as you see examples of in these teams. They can have pointed ears, flopped ears, blue eyes, brown eyes. We, we're looking at confirmation and athletic capability. And because the mushers have concentrated on that, they have become this supreme traveling animal. They had, we inherited centuries of development of these dogs that supported people's lives in the north, in the Arctic forever. But now it's been taken to another level with sports medicine and real concentration on breeding for specific types of skills. And therefore you get a team that looks like this team that we're looking at right now. And one of the things that you see is now so many mushers have really great teams. Look at that pack back behind these guys. They aren't all spread out with different levels of capabilities in their dogs. You've got a big pack there of people that are close. Those are really great teams as well. And it's this refinement focusing not on appearance. It's appearance in a one way, in my eyes, because it's, it's confirmation, but not concentrating on just fluff and hair length, but really the athletic capability of the dog. Those are great images right there. Robert really working hard on the sled in that. And you saw him kicking and you actually see the the slack that is gained in the gang line as he is kicking. And, and that just means the dogs really aren't pulling anything while he's cook, kicking like that. Mm -hmm. They're running freely down the trail. And my question to both of these guys, we've got, you know, former champions. Bruce won the Yukon Quest. You've got uh, Dallas, the, the winner of the Iditarod. When you watch a team running the way this one is right now, is it a bigger deal to a musher to have a team performing like this this late in a race? Or is it a bigger deal to win the race? Because I would, Im I would imagine that this is what you guys all strive to create, is a team that can look this way, this deep into these races. Well, I would say it's more to get that ride, that magic carpet ride right there and see that. I mean, the goal is always to win the race, but if you don't win it gracefully, it doesn't mean anything. Put it in any, any event. Uh, you want you want to get there and you want to win it fairly and what is fairly in these races is with a nice looking dog team this is going to be pretty fast pass here at the speeds both those teams are going and uh, well-trained dogs going right by but yeah Greg to me it's more important to ride behind that type of team than to win now if you combine those two yeah they, then that's what we call the magic carpet ride where everything happens gracefully and you just take control and you get to the finish line and and you have one but the reward is in the performance of the dogs and we're watching an, an accumulation of tremendous successes both in your genetic pool and the type of dog that you've been able to create over the years but also uh you know the way you handled your strategy the way you manage the team early in the race in the middle portion of the race and so there's great success and that's why oftentimes mushers reach their peak you know dallas is one of the oddballs in this thing where he was able to reach the pinnacle uh, before his 30th birthday but when you look especially in the the iditarod those are really rare years for anybody it takes i mean robert his 
31st attempt at this race. Obviously, he's won it before, but it takes sometimes uh, people decades to be able to create, create yeah. a team that looks this way, this late in the race. Well, to have those genetics Absolutely. and have the time to do that. But you know, in another aspect, you say the 30-some years of Robert, I'm going to go back to the male female thing in this race and they all they constantly you know that constantly is brought up because it's unique in sports but it and again it's something we pride ourselves on your ability to work with animals not whether you're a male or female but another thing that's often overlooked is that spectrum of tw give me another sport where a 60 year old man right. is compete our woman is competing with a 20 year old the focus here is how good are you with those dogs what are your outdoor skills how do you train and yes there's these other aspects like having finances and times but if you're good enough come out here and play with us i'm five foot Yo, seven Grant, you, you have a i don't get to get these, out on the basketball court here. with guys that are seven feet tall you know i mean it's it's this sport is open to anybody that will put in the time and effort to go out and see what you can do so greg i, I want to Go back to that question. You have a knack for pulling out these great questions in here, and I just want to touch on this. You asked, is the reward getting to drive this team this late in the race, or is it getting to win the win the race? You know, which is a likely scenario for Robert Sorley, who we're watching live now. I would say that those two things are so closely married together that you cannot separate them. And what I mean by that is, when I start a long distance race, this is the goal: to have a beautiful looking dog team this late in the race, to have that as it's been called the magic carpet ride to have that beautiful looking team that is joy and it's also the best odds you can give yourself of actually winning the race so when we look at winning a race that is a result that is not a cause we focus on for me personally i focus on the cause and that is to say what causes you to win a race and what causes you to win a long distance race is to manage a beautiful team and have a nice looking team late in the race next question what causes you to have a nice looking team at the end of the race that is you know having smart and realist or smart runs realistic expectations setting that team up for success every run setting them up to have a very successful rest which is important that means calories in benefiting from that resting time making sure you're stopping the right amount of time to maximize each minute of resting time so when I break it down how I run a perfect race is to look at this take it down to the smallest possible steps of actions that I can do now an action I cannot do is affect my other competitors so the goal is to have the best possible race for my team regardless of the competition if you do that and if you have a beautiful looking team the odds are pretty good you're gonna have a really successful race in the standings so I think those two aspects are so closely tied that um, it's hard to break them apart for me though the reward is having this beautiful looking dog team and the placement in the race is confirmation that you are doing this about as well as humanly possible when you have a beautiful race and you think you did a great job and somebody finishes six, eight hours ahead of you, it tells you that you still have room to improve. There are better genetics that you can add to your kennel. There's more you can do in the nutrition. There's more you can do in training. There's better ways to run this race. You need to continue to be a student of the sport. And even when you win, you will always find things to do better there. So I think the, the placement is confirmation. The reward is this beautiful dog team this late in the race. And what a treat it is to be able to have a helicopter where we're not just watching a dog team run by for 10 seconds. We're watching it for several minutes. And so and then they have, you know, two guys that can really break down what they're seeing uh, from a, a, a real knowledge base, I think, is a real treat for all of our viewers. I mean, we've watched Robert running now for uh, miles. And, and to see a team working at this level, I think, is really unique and, and an awesome opportunity for those that are watching. But I've been impressed with the amount of work Robert has done in this stretch. He's been kicking hard. You see him get off the sled and help push up there. But you saw those kicks, Bruce. They were really helping that team down that river. Yeah, and that can go both ways. I mean, <clears throat> sometimes it, people shouldn't judge a musher at all times saying, well, they're sled setting down, they're being lazy, they're not helping the dogs. There's certain trail conditions where a light kick or ski pole propels the sled forward and takes the pressure off the dogs like Robert was doing. But there's also times you can kick or ski pole and you cause such a change in the pulling. Uh, Imagine you the being in some type of shoulder right, harness right, and I'm right. constantly yanking back a little bit and you would be like, just leave me alone. Let yeah. me 
let me just do this. So you don't want to disrupt the pull up the gang line. So you have to be assessing, where do I kick? Where do I rest? Like Dallas. You can see the said. slack in his game, right in front mm -hmm. of the sled as he kicks, right? It, it mm -hmm. drops a little bit. Here we have, interesting. have uh, Brigitte Ness. We get in a nice aerial view of Brigitte. So we've dropped back to uh, our second place musher, Brigitte Ness, tr just on the river and cruising along here. And these guys, you were just talking about pedaling and ski pulling and assisting the dogs. You we see Brigitte here taking a little bit of a break, sitting down, catching her breath, letting the dogs cruise along. And that's very astute. You really got to be careful when you are helping the dogs by pedaling or ski pulling. More than how much pressure you get in each kick, the most important thing is having steady pressure. Make sure you're not turning that sled sideways. And again, I'm watching the same thing that you guys were. There's the slack in, that, in the line each time that Robert was pedaling. Whereas here, we see that very even tension on the line. And this is why I like using both a ski pull and my foot in unison because you're getting a push, a long, even push with your leg, and then as soon as your foot comes off the ground, the ski pole takes up that same pressure and gets a long, even push on the ski pole, and then your leg's back on the ground again. So yeah, having it even for the dogs is really nice because you don't want them kind of falling forward on each step. Now that changes a little bit when you get to an incline where the you know the weight is a little bit more. But Brigitte's got a really nice looking team here as well. You know, we're, we're seeing in Robert's praises and obviously he deserves that very much with a nice looking team. Brigitte's got an 11 dog lineup looking really strong there as well. And maybe not quite at that same level as uh, as Robert's as we're seeing just from you know the results here, the times and whatnot. But Brigitte's got a beautiful lineup. And if we look at you know kind of her spacing, over third place you know she's got a big lead over third place here as well about 17k and so this is um both of these mushers are running a beautiful dominant race and i mean it's it's great that they're both in this together because now we get a great competition between the two of them you know, one of the things I see on her team on the river, on the flats, is they've, they're they working a lot more in unison now. They're a lot smoother than they were on those hills. So, you know, maybe she's at a little bit of a disadvantage and Robert's got more power because of his dogs on those hills. But this team of Nessus looks a whole lot smoother right now at, on just a flat surface. And maybe she'll have a little bit of speed depending on the terrain that they're running on. They've just smoothed out a little bit and talk about that the ebbs and flows of a race for for a team but also the ebbs and flows of each individual run right we saw a team that's certainly in a lot better rhythm than it was 10 kilometers ago or whenever it was when we we saw it and so things can evolve and things can change and oftentimes what do you think that changes those ebbs and flows is it uh, a command is it a feeling like what is it like what get into the mentality of the of, of the dog itself yeah well like, one simple thing it can be is the point they are in their digestion if they've had a big if they've had a big meal and you know you eat a big meal and want to go for a run you know and so uh they kind of lean out that that energy on a cellular level is becomes available they hit this peak in a run they start a little slow they build up and then all at once they're there their stomachs are empty but they've got all this energy available to them on a cellular level and then boom they they can go and then they kind of drop down a little bit and that's why we get these run rest cycles uh trail conditions can affect I want to break in there real quick, Bruce, if I can. You know, we just saw Brigitte go by here, and we were just talking about how there's the ebbs and flows here. You know, from the last time that they've passed the stationary camera, where Robert was about four minutes and 23 seconds ahead, from that time to this time, Brigitte has earned back 20 seconds there. Interesting. And there are ebbs and flows to these to these runs, right? She's only about four minutes behind right now, made up a little bit of time. I think you're absolutely right. Nutrition and uh, their digestion process has a big play to that also you know sometimes we see musters have a really strong run and then the next run their team's a little bit um, still recovering from that previous run so we do see those ebbs and flows if i've said it a few times before here but your best run follows your worst run and your worst run follows your best run and this is where we also have this six hour break coming up here and that can change things just dramatically if one team has more inherent speed than another your slower team will do well when you have less 
lesser amounts of rest. But then you give them a big rest, a six hour in this race, or I'm thinking specifically of the eight hour rest at the end of the Iditarod in a similar location relative to the finish line is what we have the mandatory six here. Anyway, a, a team with more inherent speed, you give them that big kind of blob of rest there and they get closer to their, you know, 100% battery level and they can go back to that inherent speed. So that's another big factor here. So this race is not over, right? This six hour rest coming up could definitely give Brigitte a big push or a big uh, burst of speed and perhaps more than it gives Sorley if his team is, you know, maybe a little better rested at this point. However, I think if we look back through this race and past races from these two mushers, I think Sorley might even benefit more than Brigitte from that long rest. So that's another kind of aspect to those ebbs and flows. One of the things I see in her team, and again, we're getting down to being picky, but as a dog musher, uh, the third set of dogs back, she has a dog on the right that's just running out of sync with the others. And to me, that dog looks slightly stiff. Uh, on a fast downhill run, that might affect that dog. And I also noticed when, on the camera, as it went by the bridge area, it's in a complete shoulder blanket, it looks like. Mm -hmm. And it's not cold there, so the dog doesn't need to be protected from cold. She's probably trying to keep those muscles warm uh, to keep it from getting stiff. And one dog like that, again, your analogy, you can only go as fast as the slowest dog. That one dog could be affecting the speed which she now has to maintain to keep that dog in there. It looks a little out of sync, a little rougher. And I've been watching that dog in all these aerials that we've been privileged to see. And it's just You're not in there like the others. It stands out to me. Right on there, Bruce. And that's that's a really good observation, especially as we say in these mushers come down the hills. You know, if you've got one dog that's out of sync that doesn't allow you to really let off the brake as you're going down the hills, that can really affect your speed or could, relative to a musher that can just let off the brake and let them roll like we've seen Robert be able to do. Now, you leave that dog behind at a checkpoint, and we might see Brigitte kind of gain some of that speed back or that ability to reclaim, you know, that, that gravity rotational speed as they're going down a hill. Obviously, they had to work to get up the mountain. So that is an aspect. Leaving one dog behind allows you to pick up those seconds going down the hills. If it's a dog that's just not comfortable moving at you know 10 miles an hour, it makes the musher have to go nine miles an hour for that dog or load the dog in the sled. But of course, in hilly terrain, it's not really worth uh, being able to pick up a few seconds going down to have to carry that dog up the hill. So you know that's another thing that could change here is leaving one dog behind can completely change how you drive that team. I think both of you can talk about the fact that these two teams are headed to a six hour mandatory stop. So how does that change things? You see Robert really working hard. So he knows the quicker he gets to that checkpoint, the clock starts or starts for a six hour rest. So they they should be pushing a little bit right to get to this stop. Well, this is a strategic point in the race to use a little energy. So, yes, that's what they're heading to. Yeah. We're uh, actually about to go live now with Nina from Orkelbogen. I think she... No, we'll wait a little bit with that. Let's see, Nina. And um, uh, looking at the trail here, we'll be back in studio. Yeah. Uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, they, uh, actually, they're mushing and the dog teams are running at the, the river. How are the surface at a river? Well, it looks, like, it looks yeah. like a really good trail. I don't see them sinking in a lot or struggling with that. That looks like some of the best trail they've had to me. Mm -hmm. And Greg has up the uh, topography here, and they're dropping into the valley and then one more climb before the checkpoint. Yeah, and uh, thank you. We'll talk more about that later. later. Now we go over to Nina at Urkelbogen. I'm not... I'm not sure if yeah, she said Nina, so I was a little bit confused, but welcome to the Rose. <laughs> I'm good. I hear at the finish area, the Rose, we're getting set up for the finish. Uh, and with me here today, I have Arn Filstermevall. He is an official, the no local troll here in the Rose. Arn Phil, thank you, to, uh, thank you for coming here to the studio. How are you doing? What do you say? How are you doing? Oh, fine, fine, <laughs> fine. It starts good. Yeah. Is it's, it's a bit cold now. Yeah. yeah you are the of, you're the, you're the troll of Röros. They say so, and I, I've been a, a troll in Röros since uh, 1992, 93, I think. Yeah. Uh, but every summer. 
for you know, for 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 foreign viewers, you know, are there trolls in Norway? Yeah, and I'm the last living one. You're the last living one. The last living one, yeah. <laughs> and I know also that you're the troll, as you were crowned as the only living troll in France as well. So you're internationally right, known, yeah. actually. Yeah, that's right, yeah. 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 I had a, a visit from a, a photogra photographer from France, yeah. And he said, ah, you look like a troll. And, and he gave me the idea, though, to, to start with this. So every summer, I rest up, yeah. But you're not only a troll. You're a musician, and you're an author, and Every year, there's a great outdoor theater piece played here in Rödos, and you wrote that together uh, with somebody. Together with a friend, we wrote it in 1980, and today it's the, one of the biggest play outdoor play in Norway. Uh, we have around 12,000 visitors every summer to, to watch this. And it takes place here in Rödos. Yeah, in, in the middle of Rödos. Yeah. Uh, and what's it about? It's a it's a story from uh, the great Nordic uh, Nordic War in 1718. 19, uh, 3,500 around uh, young soldiers and farmers from Sweden were frozen to death up in the mountains here when they returned to Sweden. It's a tough story. After the king of Sweden, the king of the 12th, have been shot in the south of Norway. Yeah. But, and that's, you're busy with that. And now we, it's feminine race here in Rödos. And uh, what's your relationship to the, to the feminine race? Yeah, uh, the last uh, the few years now I, I've been um, doing something else. But uh, in the early days, in the, on, in the 90s, I, I remember I was uh, working a bit with the famines, uh, famine Löpe, yeah, to give uh, away presents and things like that, food and... Uh, so to, you yeah. were working as a speaker during the prize giving uh, ceremony? Yeah, Is that, yeah. that... Uh, that's right. Yeah. yeah. In a couple of times I, I was a stand-in. Stand-in. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, yeah. and, and, and but you—it's an important part for it's important for the local communities here, the feminine race for everybody. Yeah, 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 yeah. Everybody's following it. Yeah. And uh, you can tell you saw on, on the start in in uh, in the, the street of the Rose. It's a fantastic view for it must have been to the people from other places to see a city like this. It's a beautiful place and to to see all the dogs and happy people and uh, it's a great. Yeah. But you have, you're a musician. You have you brought your guitar, and uh, he's, you're actually going to sing for us. We're very happy about that. So, what are you going to sing for us today? Yeah. I'm going to sing a song from uh, this uh, play that we have in the Rose. And uh, this is a sad story. And, uh, we are up in the mountains, and um, this is uh, one who are soon living the, his life. Yeah. S uh, soon frozen, frozen to death. And you can see the light, yeah. And uh, that's uh, the name of the, the play, it's uh, Elden, the fire, and uh, it's uh, something inside you, and you can see the light though, and uh, in, in the distance it will come closer and closer. And this is in Norwegian, so I reckon uh, not too many people will understand what I'm singing about. But, but music, music is international. It is, yeah. So, so um, go ahead and, and uh, play that song for us. I should try my best. Uh, I don't know the tune, uh, the guitar, no, though, but uh, I don't use this too much either. <laughs> and uh, this is cold for their lips. Kännas varmt och gott och Låt mig få ligga ner nu Och vila en liten stund Det brinner en eld Kan jag 
också långt där ute i fjärran. Kan du ej se det och känna hur det värmer? Det brinner en eld kan jag se. Långt ut i fjärran ett ställe Nu kommer den närmare Kom nu och se Det var du, min goda vän, ditt sista skrik i nöden. Vi råkas i döden, det brinner en eld kan jag se. Det brinner en eld kan jag se. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Uh, you could fall asleep when you listen to this. <laughs> Thank you Thank so you. much for coming to the studio. Talk, talk. And uh, we're going to stay on here in Rudos and try to get some more guests. So, but back to you, uh, Maria, in the studio in Oslo. Thank you, Carrie Ann. Now, we have a lot of uh, culture uh, around these uh, sled dog races, and this was a part of the Röros traditional uh, culture. It was a troll. I love it. Yeah, <laughs> it's the first troll I've ever seen, I think, in real life, you know? So that was fantastic, and didn't understand a word he sang, but it was great music. <laughs> I had a little beat going on over here, felt like I should have had my lighter out. <laughs> There's uh, right. Peter Carlson. I want to draw our attention here real quick to Petra Carlson. <laughs> he's in you, third Del. position here, moving down the trail nicely. Um, so he's a little ways behind our leaders, Robert Sorley and Brigitte Ness. He's about uh, 19 and a half kilometers behind at this point. You know, see, That's we close. see a, a steady team, but managing a quite a bit slower pace here. It does look like they're climbing up. Got a little bit of drifting going on in the trail there as well. But uh, these guys are doing well, but clearly we see a different pace than what's being set up towards the front of the race there. Now here he's off actually helping, uh, you know, walking along. I do this quite a lot where you'll step off the sled and either walk or jog for, you know, 10 or 15 steps, and then hop back on and pedal a little bit. And there again, knowing where your energy is best used is really important here. If you see a hill and there's a steep pitch, I want to be ready to get up and run on during that, you know, steep pitch on the hill. But even looking team, just managing and maintaining a, a little bit slower pace. Here they've crested over the hill and kind of starting to slide down the other side and everybody kicked it up a gear pretty nicely there. He looks pretty good and he has quite a little space between him and the following team. So all of these guys are stretching out their leads here. And uh, as was mentioned earlier, at some point you don't want to push too hard to try and get to the front. You want to protect the position you're in comfortably. And uh, he looks pretty solidly locked into that position right now at this point. But certainly still yeah, in I'm position, right, to grab second K if distance. something happens. Yeah, go ahead, Dallas. Yeah, I was just going to say, I'm seeing about seven kilometers be between him and Barbara Inuin behind him. And that's been staying fairly steady. I think he's actually expanded that just a little bit. So he's uh, you know, pretty comfortably in third. But when you get a shorter distance between you know third yourself and the musher behind you in fourth versus going ahead, I think he's going to be focusing on holding on to that, uh, that third position here, trying to stay on the podium more than focusing on catching up with these other guys. And again, if one of the 
you know, teams ahead of him, you know, Robert Sorley or uh, Brigitte Dines, if one of them does have an issue, if one of them does slow down significantly, he can't also slow down significantly, right? So the best way for him to even catch these other teams is to keep a steady pace with his team and be prepared to take over, you know, take up a position if something happens. But if he pushes too hard to catch up, what could happen is, let's just say, hypothetically, uh, Brigitte slows down dramatically for whatever reason. If he also slows down dramatically, then he's in the same situation as her, and both of them would slide back several positions. So the smart move here, stay at a steady pace, focus on the teams behind you, and be aware of the teams ahead of you, but I don't think they should affect his, uh, his pacing at this time. And what I liked in those shots we just saw, <clears throat> from my point of view, was being able to see the topography that they're traveling in a little bit, to see the size of these hills and how the landscape kind of rolls. Uh, you know, it's not big, rugged mountains, but but there is uh, a lot of elevational changes. And, and as a result of that, we see him kicking going uphill here and just helping get that propel that sled up the hill, take a little pressure off the dogs. But those were really nice shots of just seeing the whole countryside, the expanse, and you could just see how these hills roll on and on like that. What do you mm -hmm. think about the amount of snow? Uh, does it look uh, good for a mushing uh, perspective? This looks like great snow and great trail conditions. I don't see any drifting at all. It looks like the kind of country that if it was a really windy day would be super difficult with those open areas there. But the snow and the trail conditions look almost perfect to me. Not too much, not too little. And beautiful landscape. You got all that fog that that recently has stuck to all those trees and beautiful. The thing that I noticed there too, Petter had his uh, wind cover uh, of his parka halfway on, halfway off. With him working like that, he's probably working up a sweat on a warm day like this. Doesn't want to take it all the way off because eventually, maybe on the downhill, he wants to put it back on to keep himself warm. But uh, a lot of interesting things going on in that image. And that's obviously a team that's um, maybe he's not thinking about winning it right now, but certainly wants to stay in a position where he can remain in contention should something happen up in front of him. Yeah, but uh, humans, they sweat and they have to take their park cars on and off, but dogs don't operate that way. All right, now we're we're getting some images from Barbara Inuin here in fourth place, uh, just about 7K behind uh, Petra Carlson, who we were just watching there, and she's moving along at a nice-looking pace here as well. You know, it's a nice-looking team. Again, slower, you know, average pace, if you will, steady pace, but a nice-looking team. All the dogs, you know, from this height look comfortable in this, and you see they're kind of even uh, in alignment. There's maybe a one or I'm seeing maybe one dog a little bit farther back there in position, but all in all, a nice-looking team here. And you know, she's got a work cut out with uh, with Petter up in front of her. Petter Carlson, he's a worker. You know, he's a good athlete himself. He's not afraid to get off the sled. He's gonna be running up every. You know, so we'll, it'll be interesting to see. Obviously, in Barbara's position there in number four, she is looking at Petra Carlson, seeing if she can catch up with that team ahead of her. And she's got uh, Rolf Johannesson right behind her as well, not too far back. So she's kind of in a little bit tougher position where she's looking up over at each hill in front of her, hoping to catch sight of that team. She's also looking over her shoulder, hoping not to catch sight of that team. <laughs> That's kind of that's actually kind of a hard position to be in. You have to really control yourself mentally and not start pushing too much. Or you, there's a lot of judgment going on when you're protecting yourself, and you can really easily get caught up in the race and maybe over push or you know, put a little more pressure on your dogs. You've got a great dog musher right behind you, and these are teams I think that you'll really see the difference when they come off of their six. Do you get that extra burst of energy and get kind of slings? shotted forward but it's also critical that you not misjudge and you load a dog and those three positions change totally yeah and again we got to take the long view on this race these mushes that we would just watch still have approximately 200 kilometers to go to the finish line so there's the, there's the short term fluctuation maybe a team behind her puts on a burst of speed and and passes her and now she's thinking i've got to keep up with that team 
not necessarily that burst of speed may cost that musher a little later on and you may see those positions change back again so as a musher you should always have in your mind how far is it to the finish and is this pace for my dogs a speed that they can sustain all the way to the finish line there's no point in kicking up the speed and getting in a foot race with somebody when you're still 200 kilometers from the finish the time for the foot race is at the finish so right now as they're working as they're helping the dogs out I would be helping the dogs sustain the speed that they should be going for the entire distance, not a speed to pass another musher or stay in front of another musher. You know, that, you got to keep your eye on the prize, and that is the finish line. That's the only place that it matters what position you're in. You can lead the race for more time, but if you're not in first at the finish line, it doesn't really matter a whole lot. So the only place that positioning counts is at the finish line, and that's a very important thing to remember when we're watching these long-distance races and these little micro races between one or two or three mushers within that is that it doesn't really matter so much who's leading or who's the first one into this next checkpoint. The question is, are they managing their team in a way that they can hold that speed all the way to the finish, and what position will they be 200 kilometers from now? And uh, while our mushers and dog teams are on their way to the Orkelbogen checkpoint, uh, we will take a, a look at today's highlights. It was an exciting night last night as the teams left Tristel checkpoint and took off. We watched a little bit of this yesterday evening as we wrapped up our live coverage. We had Thomas Warner take off in front, uh, Barbara Inuin, uh, Petra Carlson, Brigitte Ness, Robert Sorley. Vicenin um, kind of taken off in our lead pack there. And these guys had a nice run over there. And this is a really fun time for me to start watching the run speeds and seeing how the mushers progress. Now, if we watch number five, Robert Sorley, we see that he had a very good run time and made up quite a lot of ground on the mushers ahead of him there. Um, towards the back of the kind of the end of the top 10 here, uh, we have Johansson, Fred Inland, Janssen, Hoffman, and uh, I think we had um, Hagenson in there in number 10, Rogne. So these guys all were making their way down the trail. As we move down a little bit farther, we see Werner held on to his lead as he was heading over to the uh, Drevsha checkpoint for the second time. And uh, however, he did lose a little bit of ground in this top five pack here. We see the numbers kind of shifting. We see uh, number three at this point, Birgitta Ness, making a good run, making up a little bit of time. Petter Carlson's speed was a little bit less so strong. Sorley was able to make up quite a lot of time there and actually uh, progressed a few positions. So this is a very telling run. I think this is where the race starts to shake out a little bit as they made their way over to Drivshu checkpoint uh, for the second time. Again, they went out, stopped at the Trestle checkpoint, and then came back down the same trail to this checkpoint here. Piling in here, the mushers uh, start to decide how long to rest because this is not a mandatory stop. So as they pull in here, it's a big question of how long is each musher going to stop at this stopping point. Um, there's quite a lot of race left. They're going to have a good distance to go before they reach the next mandatory stop. So some mushers might take a longer break here, some a little bit of a shorter one, and then take a longer one at the next stop. So uh, what we saw here was a few of the mushers um, Kind of predict predictably, Thomas Werner stayed a little bit longer at 323 and will not leave as the lead musher. Um, behind him or coming into the checkpoint was Robert Sorley and Brigitte Ness. Robert Sorley had a very good run time coming over here, um, as did uh, Brigitte. And they t both stayed about uh, two hours and 46 minutes, um, approximately, taken off. So here we have in the lead, Birgitta Ness taking off in first now, Robert Sorley in second, Thomas Werner in third after taking a little bit longer rest, but he also had a bit slower run time, so he's probably trying to get some of that speed back. Behind him, we have Carlson in fourth, and uh, Barbara Inuin in fifth now, and they're kind of our top five pack, and you see they're starting to build a little bit of a lead over the rest of the mushers that'll be coming along behind them here. This run is also really interesting to watch as now the mushers are not having the long mandatory stop and we're going to see which teams can sustain the pace they've been doing on the amount of rest that they can kind of uh, take on this competition while staying near the lead. Behind them we have kind of our second pack here, uh, the next group of mushers and this is a thick one. We're going to see a lot of positions chaining, changing but in that group uh, we have towards the front Johansson, uh, I'm sorry, Rolf. Yeah, Johannesson, Hagenson, Rogne, Friedland, Janssen, Wallen, Hoffman. Uh, these guys are all super competitive mushers. 
this is such a competitive race that we're seeing a, a tight second group. And this is going to be a real battle for getting that sixth place. And some of them may even be able to catch up with the lead. Coming into the checkpoint of Servo, we had uh, kind of that same top five group pile in there. It was very interesting to look at the run times in that section as well. Uh, we saw Robert Sorley speed come out again as uh, his real strength, his real weapon here. He did that run in about five hours and three minutes. So he made up about 27 minutes on Brigitte Ness, who left ahead of him there. Um, very good run for Robert, and I think that's going to put him in a solid position as he leaves this checkpoint. Behind him, had, we had Petter Carlson in there with uh, another good run time. Uh, Brigitte Ness a little bit slower. Thomas Werner at 5.32. Uh, he's running a nice-looking 10-dog team. He's running in third place at the moment. Um, he left the last checkpoint. Uh, a little bit behind these other guys. He's about an hour and 17 minutes behind Sorley, who's uh, leaving that one. Uh, and so, you know, he's, he's a little bit farther back, but he's had some fairly good run times. He took about a three hour and 14 minute rest at this last checkpoint. Prior to that, he took about a three hours and 10 minutes. This is on average about 25 minutes more than Sorley and Brigitte True. Ness, who are in front of him right now. So um, I think that extra rest may help him. On this last run, he had a good run time of about five hours and 18 minutes compared to Robert, so uh, compared to, uh, I think it was Robert Sorley at five hours and three minutes and Birgitta at five hours and 30 minutes. So he's right in the right range. Um, he's doing very well. He's got a little bit uh, long distance back to try to make up here. But I think he's uh, in a good position to at least hold on to the position that he's in right now. So I think he's um, sitting well for at least third and hopefully for him to be able to move up a position or two. Yeah, sitting about 17 kilometers behind these guys. And he's a good distance into the run uh, now, but not, not so far. So there's still quite a long ways to Orkelbogen for him, where there's a mandatory six hour rest, either there or at the following checkpoint, Tolga. But I don't, I think that most of these guys are gonna take their mandatory six at Orkelbogen. I, I mean, I'd like to hear Bruce's take on that. But um, that's kind of what seems to be the, the smart play here. They're going into about a 112 kilometer run. That's 69 and a half miles for the non-metric system people out there. But this is a long haul, and if he can get to the end of this run with a nice speed, get that six-hour break, I think he's looking good for the for the top three here. Taking off from the Silver Bowl checkpoint, um, you know, I think she's getting a good position here. The previous run, she had one of the slower times from the mushers, or at least compared to the mushers ahead of her, but correctly so in my mind, she took the longest rest of any of the mushers on the trail thus far. She stayed at the Soville checkpoint for about three hours and 24 minutes. She left there about an hour and 47 minutes behind Brigitte Ness, the leader of the race. So I think it's unlikely she's gonna catch up with the front of the race there, but she's only six, six kilometers behind Petter Carlson at this point. Um, however, Petter also stayed at three hours and 14 minutes. So uh, he's gonna have a similar rest time there. I don't think we're gonna see a huge difference in his traveling speed over the last run. And on this last run, he did cover the trail about, about 18 minutes faster than uh, Barbara. Barbara's daughter, uh, Amelie, uh, just won the junior race. So I guess they, they've got one victory in the bag here anyway. So here's Petter Carlson, just a little bit farther up on the trail. You know, he's making good time out there. We saw some video of him earlier looking really strong on the trail, but there's a large gap between him and the lead pack, which the lead pack right now consists of Robert Sorley and Brigitte Ness. And I think these two are gonna be duking it out all the way to the finish line. So Carlson's about 18 kilometers behind these guys. Sorley and Ness have been running very close together for the last bit of this trail. At the last checkpoint, Sorley uh, stayed for about two hours and 40 minutes, uh, 48 minutes. Birgitta stayed 2.43. And here we get to see Robert Sorley and Birgitta Ness leading this race. Awesome. I mean, right next to each other, only maybe 100 meters, if that, in between these guys. And this, this gap in between here is gonna be fluctuating some. But right now, both of them are just wanting to settle in and cruise. You know, it's a nice pace here uh, for Robert Sorley, who's getting to kind of follow along behind. You know, Brigitte is kind of setting the pace up there. I'm gonna, man, this is gonna be a fun one to watch. These both are really strong teams. 
But what stands out to me is on the previous run, going over to Survol, it was only about 46 and a half miles, and Robert Sorley did that run about 27 minutes faster, and then the rest at the last checkpoint was the same. But look at that dog team. This thing is just cruising along. Uh, Robert's looking around, wondering what's, uh, what's with a helicopter following him here. But that is a nice looking dog team right there. Everybody's stretching out, just gobbling up that yeah. trail. He, I mean, that's that's what you want to see at this point in the race. Um, heading into the Orkelbogen checkpoint, where they will likely take their mandatory six-hour rest. This is their second mandatory rest in this race. You see a little bit farther ahead there, we got Birgitta Ness. She's pedaling, um, helping these dogs move down the trail. She's got a slightly smaller team with 11 dogs, but she's also a smaller person. And you know, that that has an advantage to it. So I've been very thankful many times when I've been racing the Iditarod, when I have a competitor that is significantly larger than me, you know, I've I'm, I'm got a 50 pound lighter sled just because of my own body mass. But she's uh, obviously helping the dogs out here. Nice looking dog team. Even Gates on the wheel dog. The next one up there is stretching out a little bit more. Man, all the way up the line, we're looking pretty good. One swing dog in there with a not quite as tight of a tug line, but there he just snapped it up tight. So both nice looking dog teams. This is shaping up to be an exciting race here. What do you guys think back there in the studio? What are you, you know, seeing here? The thing I was really impressed with and made note of, as you said earlier, that Robert made up 27 minutes on a run that isn't all that long, really, that the distance they covered. And that's pretty significant. And right now, uh, besides running that at a faster pace and having that time to bank uh, in with the dogs at a checkpoint and rest, I see it that Robert's team looks a little stronger to me. And also by drafting off of her, he's taking the mental pressure off of his leaders. It's well, it, it looks like we're going to have a pass here. Yeah, we soon. are. We're going to watch but, it live. But just by having another dog team around you and using the energy of both teams, Robert's sitting at a really nice place. There he goes with the pass. Leaders just stretching on the team out there and getting by. Uh, I think Robert is just sitting in a really nice position, having a bigger team, even though, as you pointed out correctly, he's bigger. But that time, we saw this from the beginning. We both mentioned that, how he set up and used the speed to gain more rest on his dogs. He has the mandatory six, but he also can just keep the pedal down on the speed of the uh, going at any other point. He's not going to have to have many other stops. And, no, and I'm, let's not I'm downplay with you 100 what, what just on happened. that one here. When we get to the yeah. finish line and we look back on who the winner and who the loser was, or the second place team in this race, and if Robert goes on to win it, we just saw the winning move there on live television. And so let's. It's pretty let, amazing, isn't it? it? It's, it's <laughs> awesome. Like the moment that we go to it, I mean, within two, two and a half minutes, we may have just seen the winning move in this race by a, a look great at that champion. Team move. Mm -hmm. And it's cruising. I mean, for this point in the race, for that team to, I mean, obviously he's got his foot off the off the brake here. He's putting a little bit of distance between him and Brigitte. He does not want her to draft here. And so having the ability to kick it up into fifth gear for a little bit, put some distance in between you, break that draft. But to have the team that can actually do that, not just sustain, you know, uh, an eight and a half or nine mile an hour pace, but go up to 11 and a half miles an hour, put that distance in between, that says a lot about a dog team right here. You know, I'm seeing Robert Sorley on the previous run. He's picking up 21 and a half seconds per kilometer. And so this is where you can start to do predictable math as to where they're going to end up relative to the comp competition. Of course, that changes. But um, I think that's a good starting point to look at what are we looking at over the next couple miles. You know, there's two ways to look at the mandatory six hour rest that they have coming up. One way to look at it is that's going to cement uh, Robert Sorley's speed. It's going to, I mean, he can't fluctuate. He can't lose his lead because of somebody taking less rest. Obviously, there's plenty of rest to hold that lead. Secondly, sometimes you see a team like Birgitta Ness's team here where they may be having a harder time holding this pace that they can catch a second wind off of that six hour break. So those six hours are on some of the races like the Iditarod where it's an eight hour break. You can see a team that's been a little slower catch another gear after that break. But um, I would still obviously much rather be in Robert Sorley's position here. And this says it right here, speed wins dog races. Now speed is a dangerous weapon. It's um, kind of a double edged sword. It's also the thing that can make your team a little less stable 
when you're looking at going too fast, causing injuries or soreness. But an expert musher like Robert Sorley, who knows how to manage speed, knows how to keep speed, you know, it's, it's very, very, very hard to beat these guys. Well, I like you saying speed wins races, but what speed does is allow you to give your dogs more rest because of that speed. So it's kind of a double-edged sword there of benefits. You're faster and you can rest more to keep that. I mean, look at the distance he's pulled away. The thing I see in this dog team too with these aerial shots is all of them, each pair is firing and moving the same. It's just like an engine that every cylinder's going. He's not stressing four dogs in the back because the front is faster and setting the pace. It, there's real uh, balance in that team as we look down on Roberts. And this team looks good too, but there's just a little faster pace, a little more smoothness in Roberts' team. And maybe Dallas absolutely, and Bruce. Absolutely, Bruce. He, he, absolutely. You, you that's, guys can that's talk. That's a really good point. Go, go I was ahead, just going to touch on one thing here real quick that Bruce was talking about. You know, we were getting to compare Brigitte's team to Robert Sorley team. But if we were looking at Brigitte's team here, without Robert Sorley in lead, if we were looking at her team leading this race right now, we would be saying that is an amazing looking dog team, right? So the team we have in second place, Brigitte Ness, that is a solid team. It would be, I mean, I would be amazed to see that team doing, you know, in first place of this race right now. I'd be very impressed with it. And I think that speaks volumes for Robert Sorley team. This is beyond a good team. This is a truly exceptional team. Um, because what I'm seeing in Brigitte's team is still really, really nice to be, you know, only a couple hundred meters from the lead of the race, setting a very brisk pace here. She's got a solid lineup. So, man, I'm very impressed with Robert's team at this point. Um, and I, I don't want to, it's, it's just not always fair to your second place musher here when you're comparing them to such an excellent team as what we have right here because she has a phenomenal team there also. Well, and that's true in any sport. I think you'll agree you've participated in different sports. We take something like downhill sports skiing racing in the olympics the second place person is a tenth of a second behind the other yeah. they're both at maximum professional performance so in an event like this a major world race you're absolutely right they're both really nice teams but when you're judging them or looking at them a tenth of a second a quarter kilometer an hour or more on a dog trip team here makes a difference so you're really getting down to the the real fine details that separate them but again like going back to the olympics you get second place but you're only a tenth of a second behind that's still a really good run on a ski slope of that nature and maybe you two can talk about you know these two dog teams they're doing a great job here in the last 100 kilometers of this race, but really the key was that they ran a great race in the first 100 kilometers of this race that allowed this top end speed to still exist in their team at the end. They may, one team may have had more speed, but the way the musher managed it, yes, was established in the beginning. And I really like the analogy that, that Dallas used of breaking races into thirds. The setup, the transportation, part of maintenance to where you get to the final third and and then the execution of the win and what we're seeing is just letting them roll now to get to this last break to do that final run and yeah i i totally agree you may have had a faster team but it's how you handle that in the beginning that might make the difference between being first or and being sixth place or seventh place with the exact same team and Dallas, you're Especially always a master. In a very competitive at, race like this here. Yeah, and, yeah. and keeping your team together and making sure that they still had that last push in them, uh, because you know most, if not all, of your wins at the Iditarod, I think all but one of them, uh, you were coming from behind to do it. Yeah, and and this takes us back to the speed conversation, which is a really really interesting one. There's, as I see it, three different types of speed that you can uh, see mushers have in a race. Uh, first of all, is this team that's inherently fast, right? A faster type of dog, a dog that's been trained at a you know a higher top end speed, and that's one form of speed. And again, that speed on the trail 
can tire a team out and can have some serious negative effects over the course of a long distance race. You know, here we're doing a 650 kilometer race. You know, the Iditarod's up to a thousand miles. So there's that type of speed. And that's why, again, it's dangerous because it allows, if the dogs are used to going fast, they can burn up too much fuel too early. The second type of speed that you see really good mushers be able to manage and create is speed late in a race, right? They can create a fast dog team that's two thirds of the way into a long distance race. So on the Iditarod, we're looking at Caltag, you know, at 600 and some miles into the into the race. Here we see this leaving the checkpoint of uh, Cerbol here. We have expert mushers with good speed. And the third type of speed that I see are the uh, the kind of relating aspect to speed is mushers that they know how to have the speed built into their team, that inherent speed. They know how to create speed on a race. And then most importantly, do they know how to hold that speed? I've seen so many good mushers get late in a race, build good speed. They use that speed a little too hard. They don't respect the effort that the dogs are doing and compensate it with enough rest. And then, you know, two or three runs after having the fastest team on the trail, they're right back down to having, you know, kind of middle of the pack run times. And so that's something where I think Robert has that level of expertise, particularly, I believe Bargita does as well to be able to sustain that speed, knowing the effort that the dogs are putting on the trail, knowing how much rest they need to compensate them with, you know, a little bit extra rest here and there to sustain that speed. And that's a level of um, expertise that honestly, there's not that many mushers that can sustain that top end speed at the end of the Iditarod or in these long distance races like we're watching here. So. There are multiple aspects. You know, when we talked about the beginning of the race, we were commenting on the teams that were calmed down, not the ones that were going too fast, right? So it is uh, numerous levels. I would also throw in a sidebar of another type of speed, Dallas, and that's the speed of efficiency. And I've watched this so much in Iditarod and other longer races like the Yukon Quest, where the musher's efficiency in a checkpoint to get the job done, get the food in at the right time, get away from the dogs and let them rest contributes to their natural speed, their traveling speed. And and I have always said a lot of races are won and lost, positions are won and lost in checkpoints, not out on the trail. And again, these are all top mushers doing that, but these, this aspect of efficiency in a checkpoint to benefit the rest contributes to the actual traveling speed. Just a yeah, question. I just want to draw uh, our attention to, to the, uh, the speed kind of rankings here on the on the left hand side or the upper left hand corner of our screen. You know, right now we're seeing, you know, mid 11K moving times um, between 11.4 and 11.9. And this is obviously a, a snapshot of right now, you know, right now moving down the trail and right now they're climbing up a hill. So that's going to skew that a little bit. When we look at Robert Sorley's average speed from the last stage of this race, he was doing about 14.8 kilometers per mile. Um, quick conversion here. That's going to give us a moving average of 9.2 miles an hour um, over some kind of varied terrain. So I think that says a lot about these team speed, that that's a, that's a good moving average, especially when we have soft snow, we got to climb up hills. And what allows Robert to hold that pace is like we just saw here after he passed Birgitta a few moments ago, he was able to put some distance between those two teams because that team is clearly very healthy and he can still put them into that fifth gear stage and had a bit of a sprint there for some distance to break that draft. Now Birgitta's leaders no longer have sight of Robert Sorley and their speed is going to begin to slow down a little bit, as is her confidence and her will to continue pushing and pedaling. Pretty soon, she might start looking over her shoulder and say, you know what, I've got an hour lead to the next person. I can settle down a little bit, and that makes it even easier for Robert to get away. Yeah, uh, Dallas and Bruce, I have a question, because uh, what should be Birgitta's uh, strategy now? B b should she uh, make sure that the gap from uh, Surly is not too big? Or how should she think now before the, the next checkpoint? Well, there is this you take that aspect. One first there, Bruce. There, there is the aspect of protecting the position you're in, which Dallas was just talking about, and so you know you have an approximate idea of where the teams are behind you. So you don't want to blow up your team trying to chase somebody in front of you that's faster. But and then there's also the aspect of letting the dog settle back in. Like as we saw from these helicopter shots, she was drafting for a while 
And it, it sometimes kind of bums mentally the musher out when you realize I'm not as fast. He just left me. And actually, I always tried to pass a team at a point where I knew I could then get a little distance so they can't draft off of you. And but then you have to mentally mentally come back into the game and settle down and go, this is my dog team. Uh, I just need to get them to this mandatory six in the best condition where they're not stressed and then hope that you get some rebound off of that rest and maybe step back up on speed. So you need to focus on your dog team. It might be a little bit of a feeling of you want to push, but the best thing you can do is stay focused on that dog team and then get them there for the rest and protect your position. Dallas, your thoughts? I'm with you on that, absolutely. Like you were just saying, when passing a team, I try to do that in a place that I know my team is uh, gonna have be rel stronger relative to the team that I just passed. For me, that was generally climbing hills. So, you know, if we were on a flat terrain, maybe traveling down a river, and I know there's a hilly section up ahead, I'm gonna wanna make sure my dogs are snacked, all their booties are taken care of before I pass that other team, so I'm not gonna need to stop and take care of something after I pass them. And then I would wanna pass them right before we hit a steep climb and get some good distance between us. That's, that's a key aspect. As far as what Brigitte needs to focus on right now, there's some decisions that have already been made, been made before the race started, been made over the last two days of this race. And some of those decisions may mean that it's just not realistic for her team to outpace Robert Sorley's team. And we've said it begin previously in this race and also covering the Bear Grease just last weekend, realistic expectations. That's the most important thing a musher can have for their team is realistic expectations. I would much rather see her set her sights on finishing with a strong team in second place, fending off the competitors behind her and watch her team succeed brilliantly at doing that rather than try to push and catch up with a team like Roberts that has maybe was maybe a little more prepared before the race, maybe better run race and going to be an unrealistic expectation. But that's exactly what's going through her mind is trying to figure that out. Is it possible for this team to beat Robert? Obviously, you don't want to give up too soon, but on the same time, She's looking at uh, Petra Carlson left the previous checkpoint an hour and 17 minutes behind her. On the previous run, Petra Carlson was averaging half a kilometer a mile, I'm sorry, half a kilometer an hour faster than her. That's not a big speed difference. I think she focuses on having a good clean run and making sure that her dogs are ready to have a good solid rest. And I think at this point, Robert's gonna have to make a mistake for her to be able to catch him. But for her to be able to win, if Robert makes this mistake, she still has to beat Petra Carlson and Barbara Inuin and everybody else behind her. So I think she runs a smart race and don't focus too much on catching Robert. Focus on having a good run, having a really effective and beneficial six hour rest at this next checkpoint that sets her up for a good run to the finish. You know, another aspect of your question there is if you have, let's just say, a 10th place team and you manage them well and you finish third, that's a win. If you have a second place team and you blow them up, so to speak, and finish 10th, you mishandled that team. That's not as good of a finish. So for someone who has a team that's maybe not ready to win, but it's a 10th, 11th place team and you manage them well, you're ecstatic that they perform that well and that you handle the strategy of the race that well. So there's a lot of races within the race. And, and that's one aspect of that. If, if uh, you can just manage those dogs to, and the trail to the highest potential that you and the dogs can, can uh, reach, that's a very successful race. Yeah, it's a teamwork. It's not an ego trip, right? Right, <laughs> shouldn't be an ego trip. But, but when Dallas and I are looking at these dogs, we're looking at very subtle things. Again, to use the analogy in the Olympics, in any event you pick, it's so close. They're all such top competitors. But as Greg pointed out, sitting here, he noticed that Ness's leaders were looking around more, where, where Roberts were just straight ahead, eyes right down that trail. I noticed that uh, in, this, in Ness's second place team at this point, the swing dog was back a little bit, and I don't see that in Robert's team. Those are very subtle, picky things, but they make a speed difference, and they just show that his team is a little more focused, a little more energy to drive out front, and in the long run, and Greg's right, seeing that is subtle, and it's one moment in a long race, but those are little things that you start picking up on.
Now we are looking at uh, Robert Surley and uh, Birgitte Nass. But uh, yesterday we had Thomas Werner in the in the lead. Do you think he became? Why is he not here now? Is he, was it too fast, too early, or? He, it could be how he ran the early part of the race. We haven't really heard an interview with him. If there's any kind of uh, things health-wise going on with his dogs, but I, I, without knowing, talking to him directly, we actually, yeah. uh, I would yeah. just say he probably needed more rest. Yeah, and uh, now we see uh, Robert is kicking. He's really helping his dog teams, right? Probably going up a small hill there, and then you see him sit down. Maybe he's crested the hill and is on now more of a, a flat uh, piece of the trail. But I've been watching Robert uh, do that same sort of thing. He gets, he kicks, he sits down, he kicks, he sits down, and and not being able to see the topography of the trail rider, right it's very possible that it's just these rises and climbs that he's helping and then sitting down on the back end of it. But that team is uh, certainly a, a little more business-like. Yes. than Brigitte's team, right? Uh, and, and I think even from a layman's perspective that I view this as, you can just see from, you know, station to station throughout that dog team, those, those dogs are generally more focused on moving forward and there's less distraction going on, less looking around and less slack. Less slack in the, in the line, yeah, which means the power is going down that line to the sled. And I'm impressed you know, I, with... I want to touch here yeah, on this ahead. real quick, guys. We have this... Uh, we see Robert standing and sitting and standing and sitting. And a lot of times when people see these sit-down sleds, you know, the sleds that have the seat compartment behind them, they're saying, oh, that's that's a lazy man sled there. Um, the truth of it is that seat allows us to do more work, right? You're not exhausting your legs just standing there. And being able to stand up and kick for a few seconds or maybe even a minute on with your right leg, then you sit down and take, you know, 10 deep breaths, kind of refresh your energy a little bit stand up and kick 10 10 or 15 minutes if you need to or 10 or 15 seconds whatever it is with your left like it extends your ability especially in these super long distance races to continue to help the team when they need help right so if there's a small rise you can work hard up that and then on the downhill take a little break or even on the flat ground being able to give your legs a short break makes a huge difference let's remember here the human is definitely the weakest athletic link in this team the dogs have phenomenal phenomenal athletic ability the mushers Eh, we're still human. <laughs> so, you know, being able to utilize that seat, I see that, I mean, I see the seat on my sled every bit as important as the ski pole in my hand, as far as being able to help get me, help me help the team get down the trail. So that's an important aspect, and we're seeing Robert Sorley use that tool very well, and we're seeing a big gap out here in the field as he's starting to pull away from Birgitta, you know, and I think that's part of it, is he knows how to manage his energy, and this, again, is part of experience. Something you might not see a 25-year-old musher do quite as well when they try to work the whole time for the first half of the race, and the second half of the race, when the dogs really need their help, you know, climbing up those hills, or that help would be more beneficial, they're spent. There's nothing more they can do. And this, again, from an onlooker looking in or from a layman's uh, point of view, it's got to be demoralizing for a musher to get passed by a faster team at this point in the race. I'm wondering, do the dogs know? Is it is it a, an emotional moment for them when a team passes them going faster? Do they understand that? I don't think it emotionally uh, bums them out or lets them drop off. Dogs are just in their own world. I mean, they are in the moment by that. And and it's just their team with their musher. Now, they'll get some excitement when another team's around, but they just go back into their world of travel. All right, we've got some live images from the trail. we got our helicopter back up in the air and getting coverage. This is Birgitta Ness in second place, uh, cruising along, looking very nicely. Um, only a short distance behind Rover Surly, but earlier when we saw these guys, they were right together. And now we see there's been a little bit of space created between the two teams. And again, they're about halfway through this long run of the race. Um, still have about 60 kilometers left to go to Orkleborgen before uh, they're going to have their mandatory six, either there or at the next checkpoint. But how they've set up this race, I think we can very confidently say that both Robert Sorley and Brigitte, who we are watching right now, again, this is Brigitte Ness, um, 
will be taking their six hour rest at this next checkpoint, 60 kilometers from here. This is a beautiful trail that they're traveling down right here. You have the tree coverage. They've kind of crested over a mountain and uh, right now they're kind of contouring alongside of it. So not a lot of elevation change just yet. But here in a, a few more kilometers, they're gonna start heading down again. And we're gonna see these guys uh, kind of get a chance to see what they look like. Um, really stretching out with a little bit faster speed. Of course, the mushrooms will be kind of monitoring that speed and keeping it slowed down a little bit but I'm really liking what I'm seeing right here as this uh, dog team kind of navigates through the forest and just a beautiful shot live from the trail about halfway between Serval and Orkelbogen um, as they kind of get this is probably the second to last run of the race they're going to take a, a long rest when they get to the next checkpoint and then run all the way to the finish would be my guess yeah I think that's Right, when you look at strategy-wise and a, a six-hour rest uh, that will be taking where they're heading and such a small amount of trail left to the finish line, I, I think you have to assume that's what will happen unless something happens. But will they stop at all even to snack, Bruce, or it's just a charge to the finish line at that point? Well, there is one last checkpoint after that six-hour, and I would Tolga. expect Tolga, where there they might give a little snack or change booties but uh, on dogs, but you pretty much are going to run that as this run and then one more and to the musher's mind what that means as a sidebar is I only have to bend over and boot the whole team one more time which right. is pretty good on your back <laughs> and in longer races like the Iditarod when you have rests that are taking outside of checkpoints there's some strategy in that because a musher then who might be in second place can choose to cut a little rest but with a six hour mandatory rest here and really no other rest between that and the finish line, it comes down to the speed of the dog team. That's the only way you're gonna overtake Robert Sorley at this point, unless his team slows down tremendously. Well, that's true, but yet each musher has to judge the speed of their dogs because we had that example yesterday of people having to load a dog. You put an extra 50 pounds in that sled and, and it could be between the two front runners are that pack farther back. If you misjudge the speed you should be going and you load a dog, then you slow down. So it looks like we've got uh, Robert, Robert coming up our here, first I'm, view. I'm a, yeah, we got Robert Sorley coming up on our live camera here. Um, so he's just a, a short distance ahead of Brigitte, who we were just watching. But this is Robert Sorley, the leader of our race, coming by our camper live. Smoking. He seems to be in good spirits and a nice looking team right there, kind of as they start to head down this mountainside and uh, going to be picking up speed. Yeah, and we're starting to see him use that speed. I mean, I realize now, at least by looking at the scale of the maps we have of the changes in elevation, they're on more of a downhill run and the dogs are healthy. And and even before in the helicopter view, a little bit more of a lope now. He's letting them roll. Like you said yesterday, Dallas, building that monster and then when to turn it loose. When can you use that saved up energy? And they're going a little bit more out of a trot and edging up into a lope which is a little faster and 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 both teams seem to be doing that here but they're also in a little bit of a downhill run but you don't want to get too exuberant and overrun a dog and then have to load it and lose that edge absolutely bruce that's that's a really important factor and when we talk about building the monster you know they're like we we're saying before about the different types of speed or the different aspects of speed building the monster is one of those aspects creating good speed on the race but then how you use that speed so that you can continue to have that speed and that's what i've seen as a as a mistake sometimes is people use all that speed on one run and then at the next run they're right in the same place and i think we're going to see robert sorely very expertly you know maintain that speed and use it in the right places and use it in such a way that he continues to have speed all the way to the finish line and you guys were just talking about the uh, Tulga checkpoint that's halfway between Orkelbogen and uh, Roros where the finish is when I think of that checkpoint what I see is an opportunity to leave a dog behind if they're not doing well so that's a that's a very important aspect when you're a musher leaving a mandatory six hour break you know that they have uh, coming up here they're gonna have the information from this run how each dog is doing what they're not gonna know is how is that six hour rest going to affect the dog 
maybe there's a dog that's a little bit fatigued in this run and doing well, but they don't know how much of a, of a boost that dog's gonna get from a long six hour rest. So they might be a little bit more confident taking that dog out on the trail, recognizing that they won't necessarily have to take that dog the entire uh, 136 kilometers to the finish because there's a checkpoint after just 71 kilometers where they could leave that dog behind. If it seems to be, you know, yes, it got a boost from that six hour rest, but not enough to go that full distance to the finish at the pace that they're holding. Now, earlier today, I heard that Nina was uh, interviewing Didrik, who said that he had to scratch the feminine race uh, some years ago because he hadn't trained for the right kilometers. Uh, what does he mean by that? Well, that can mean a number of things, but what I heard him say in that is he had a lot of training, a lot of uh, of, of miles or kilometers on the dogs, but it was the wrong kind of training. And if if you use muscles and train at one thing, let's say you're a skier and you're in really good shape, but then you get on a bike, you're gonna be sore the next day. So maybe he trained on real hard pack trails and they could move, but then it was a soft trail and it's a whole different set of muscles. So you have to train your dogs in a variety or any uh, well, and we'll just stay with that. You have to train your dogs in a variety of trail conditions so that they equally develop all their muscle groups. And I interpreted that as you can put 2,000 kilometers on a dog in training, but if it's the wrong kind of miles, the wrong kind of trail, and then they get in those conditions like the images we saw blowing snow and soft soft trail they're going to be sore after they rest so you you have to get them out and show them everything that they might encounter during a race that's how i i took that uh did you hear that a little bit of that interview with dallas and his referral to that i did briefly yes um you know and i think you're hitting the right points here you know there's a well, i'm gonna i'm gonna cut in here because we've got a I just saw a musher hat <laughs> so I think we got a dog team this should be Brigitte Ness approaching our, our live camera on the trail and not too long behind Robert Sorley I'm hoping to get an accurate uh, time difference here but nice looking team we got four minutes and 24 seconds that Robert has put between her and second or I'm sorry him and second place Brigitte Ness here Again, she's got a smile on her face as she well should. I mean, once again, we're seeing nice looking teams. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, she does slim down on dog numbers at this next checkpoint here, maybe leaving one or two behind. But nice looking team all in all traveling by. You know, it's, it's kind of interesting to see how much does the musher think that it's necessary to slow them down going down the hills. Because uh, if a dog's a little bit fatigued, they can, you know, travel nicely at the at a steady pace on flat ground. But is the musher willing to let them open up going down the hills here? And I think we saw Robert holding a bit faster pace as he went down this little decline and going by the camera there. Of course, we're just getting a glimpse into these mushers' runs as they're going to be out there for many hours, you know, managing each you know, downhill, each flat land, and then each climb. But another nice looking... Now, that was the highlights. And uh, we've been we're in our third day of the feminine race now. Uh, I know that our reporter, uh, Karian, is in uh, Rörus. Karian, how is it there? Here in Rörus, it's really nice. There's a little slightly snow shower coming in, but it's not a lot of people here at the moment, but I have two persons with me here and I have two mayors. Welcome to Isaac Busk from, you're the mayor of uh, Røros, and Runa Finborud from yes. Ås, mayor of Ås. Yes. How are you guys feeling and how, what's, what's important of this famine race for the municipality of, of Røros? Oh, it's... Uh it's of big importance because it's, it's uh, it gathers so many people, so it's good for the travel business, but also all the volunteers from Röros, they, they all look forward to this, uh, this race days. And it's a lot of activity 24-7, so I think it's important to bring people together and also important for us to, to show off our great re region. You're working closer with the organizing committee. In what way are you working with them? Well, I'm trying to step up wherever they need me, and I was also invited to perform the, the opening in the church. And uh, my wife's family, they are all involved in the famine race, because they, they also have a lot of dogs themselves. And my wife's father was driving <coughs> last year, and so it's a it's a fam family thing as well. It's it's not only Rødås, you're the mayor of the Oos uh, municipality, yes. and that is also the place where the first Tufsingdalen checkpoint is. 
in what extent do you work together as uh, as uh, mayors on getting this race do going? Uh, uh, we are working uh, a lot together during the the year, uh, and of course at the at the famine race. And uh, the famine race is also very important for us and the whole region, as Isak said. Yes, because a, lo a lot of muni municipalities taking part in this yeah. organization. Yeah, and you know, um, uh, the famine race is very important, uh, of course, during the race for the local businesses. But also, famine race is, uh, is uh, interesting for the international market. And uh, and now you can look at the pictures, look at us, uh, see the nature, see the mountains, the winter, the volunteers. Uh, we are a nice people here. Nice yes. people in Norway. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you have a cultural heritage here, the Rodos, and, 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 and can you build on that f with the feminine race? Yes, I think so because the feminine race it, uh, it's it's a um, sport that is you know very clean and it's real and you s it's impossible not to be impressed by the teamwork between the dogs and the musher and all of that works very well with the philosophy of those I think. Yes. And and the tourism is based on the world heritage here and uh, and you know um, farming is very important here a local food uh, yes, uh, and that uh, and that you can see during the race. During the race, and like you say, uh, build on uh, the the people here at the Rundos, They are really passionate about mushing. Yes, yeah. a lot of people having dog kennels here. Yes, a lot of people have dog kennels. Uh, my nearest neighbor has a lot of dogs. That's my my. Make a lot of noise. <laughs> oh no, they're surprisingly quiet. Yeah, and uh, and I think that during the last maybe 20 years, it's really exploded. So everyone in Rödos knows someone who is uh, doing dog racing, and most of us knows uh, someone who is participating this year as well. So that's fantastic. Uh, and we have new uh, inhabitants who are much. So yeah. they come here they because of the training trails and yes. so on. Okay, yes. yeah. We will. We're at the finish, and uh, things are getting ready for the finish. They will come here maybe early tomorrow morning, uh, local time. Mm -hmm. um, who are your favorite? Who, we will find out who will be in the finish first tomorrow. Who is, who's your favorite? Oh, that's difficult. <laughs> but uh, one of my good friends, Ove Grytbak, one of my childhood friends, he's mm -hmm. racing, but I don't I don't think he will. Uh, be first in his class, but he will do good. I think he was uh, in fifth place uh, earlier, and I, I like to follow him, so oh. I cheer for him. What about you? Uh, uh, Robert Surly, <laughs> he's leading. He's looking good he right is. now, yes. so well, we'll see. Maybe she she wins the bet. Oh yeah, I think that <laughs> Robert Surly is a good. Bet. Yeah, he's always strong. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much for coming to talk to us here at studio, and uh, back to you, Maria, in Oslo. Thank you, Carrie Ann. Well, uh, it's an it's important event for the local community, right? Yeah, for all of these local communities, you know, it's always important. And it's obviously, to me, listening to that interview, that Robert Sorley's kind of like a rock star <laughs> yes. in Norway. Uh, really easy guy to root for. But I think we also saw in the Bear Grease, and we'll see it when we go to Russia, and we'll see it when we go to Alaska, too. The communities that these races go through are very much a big part of these races because they do open up their little towns, their homes in many cases, to allow a race like this to go through uh, their backyard so very very important and we should all appreciate them very much for allowing these races to yeah happen. and they're standing there they're cheering yeah yeah it's a it's a show for all of the people it really is yeah and um but robert surly he is not just familiar to norway and the norwegian uh, uh, fans he is pretty uh, familiar to you guys. Well, all the world of mushing, no matter where, he is well known. And Greg, just while we were sitting here a little earlier, was pointing out some things that Robert has accomplished besides just winning the Iditarod, and that's how he did it. In yeah, the I mean, he, he really changed the Iditarod. Uh, when he came in 2003 and won his first Iditarod, you know, uh, it was all about a run-rest schedule and kind of keeping it close, you know, four hours on, four hours off, or maybe it was four and six by that time. And he really started the March era of the Iditarod, changed the entire race. And one as a rookie. And one as a rookie. And we'll take a closer look at uh, Robert Surley and the rest of the mushers now over to Dallas. 
All right, we wanted to take a look at some of the teams out on the trail right now and see how they're doing out there along the way. Um, here we have uh, Rolf Johansson, I believe, cruising along down the trail. He's running in position number five at the moment. Um, kind of been moving up the ranks. We've seen his team before. Really steady team, really nice looking team as they make their way down the trail. And I, man, it doesn't look like much has changed. A couple hundred kilometers over the past couple days. And they're still looking really, really good. Just very steady, very even. You know, not the fastest team on the trail, but a team that we'd like to see uh, go on a longer race as well. Next, we have uh, Barbara Inuin here, um, working alongside the sled there, running a tin dog team. Again, a really even looking team right now, looking nice. She's running in third place at, the, I'm sorry, fourth place at the moment. A uh, few kilometers, only about four kilometers ahead of Rolf, who we just saw there, um, staying at about the same speed as Rolf. So there hasn't been much change between those two on the trail and great aerial footage of this team moving along. I'm liking seeing all the dogs kind of even in line there. Everybody's pulling, everybody's working. Probably not gonna win the race here, but having a fantastic race all the same. Having a great run over the trail with a really nice looking dog team here. And she's of course helping the team get down the trail. We see that this has been drifted in a little bit, a little bit of wind blowing, making a little bit of a slower course where the dogs do have to dig in and work. Um, I personally love this type of a trail. It lets each dog kind of settle in, it's a little bit slower pace, pulling hard. And that's what she's got here is a nice team of kind of even units. Everybody's firing on all cylinders there. That's a that's a nice team and she is running in fourth place presently on this race really successful race from my point of view then here we have uh petter carlson in third place and he's about eight and a half kilometers ahead of barbara who we just saw he's about 18 18 and a half kilometers behind the leaders i think from our last report they were cruising along he's about an hour and 20 minutes hour and 19 minutes ahead of those leaders in the race so I would say he's comfortably in third with about an eight and a half kilometer lead on the fourth place musher here. And again, we see a slower pace all in all, um, but everybody's working nicely. The dogs are picking up some snow. It is kind of a warm day out there with these guys. So they're settling into a pace. You know, Petter, pretty much every time we've seen him, he's been pedaling, he's been helping the dogs. He's been working along with them there. You know, he's a good athlete in his own right. So being able to assist the dogs is really helpful on these short climbs that they have here. And then, you know, if they have the speed to pick up going downhill that's always great here we have petter again from our live camera on the trail um, coming around the bend really nice looking team right here um, they're settled in nice trots just trying to take a look at each dog as they go by yeah i mean that's a that's a steady looking team they're looking good uh, i believe he'll be racing in the the finmark a little bit later on and i think that's a team that he can you know go into that race uh, with high hopes because it's a nice looking team it's fun to see him kind of drop down this ledge uh, this little drop seeing how much they'll let the dog speed up it seems like he's keeping their speed pretty steady not wanting to kick it up a gear into that higher notch which is uh, t it tells me that that's what the musher feels about that team so i like watching the musher and how they think they need to drive the, even these short downhills because they're seeing these dogs the whole way and what I'm thinking I, I see here is that he likes them at this speed he doesn't want to let them go up a little bit faster I'm thinking that he's got dogs that are comfortable going this pace but probably not as comfortable at the higher speeds like we've seen in the front two mushers out there but nice looking team everybody's just clipping along at a nice pace not too fast but that's a steady pace to cover their miles here we see our map um, out in the lead at the top left corner of the, the trail map here. We have Robert Sorley in first place with Birgitta Ness right behind him. Uh, last time we got a good look, we had about a four minute gap between these two mushers. Sorley did leave the previous checkpoint behind Birgitta Ness. We were lucky enough to see uh, Sorley pass Birgitta on the trail from our helicopter cameras earlier, but he is past her and pulling away. As we work back down the trail, we see a fairly long gap before we see Petter Carlson coming along about 18 and a half kilometers behind the leaders there holding a nice pace we just saw his team on the trail he's helping those dogs out running alongside the sled assisting them up the hills as the trail has had a little bit of drifting going on there's a decent gap between him and Barbara Inuin in fourth place. She's only about uh, eight and a half kilometers behind uh, Petter. Now close behind her is Rolf Johansson. He's about four kilometers behind another very nice even looking dog team. 
As we go down the trail of ways here, we're going to see Pete Janssen um, in sixth place, Daniel Hagen in seventh, or Hagenson in seventh place. Behind them, they're they're fairly close together. They were actually very close together a while back, and we're starting to see a little bit of a gap form there. So we'll keep a close eye on them over the course of this next run here. A little ways farther back in eighth place, we have Thomas Werner. He was leading the race much of the way and has kind of uh, added a little rest into his schedule as his pace has been a little bit slower than earlier in the race but still running a very nice race with his focus on the Iditarod, another race in the Cripple Pet Arctic World Series a little later this year. In ninth place, we have Volen. Um, having a nice run out there also. That's Nina Vollen in ninth, and then Ronnie Frindenlund in 10th place, rounding out our top 10. Also on the trail, we have Nicholas Rogan, Rogne behind her. We have Trina Lyric. And then behind, yeah, so we're gonna drift down the trail. We're gonna see Trina Lyric here, who took over the team right before the start of the race as her daughter was feeling a little sick. So still wanted to get the dogs the training they needed prior to the Finmark a little later. And then Johan Vessinen is on the trail right next to, next to Lars Hoffman, I believe we have there. Uh, and then here on the trail, we have some live footage. I believe this is Robert Sorley giving a quick snack to his dogs. See the dogs are all standing there patiently, kind of checking on some feet. Or I guess uh, we removing booties. Is that what we're doing here? Replacing a couple booties? No, giving snacks. <laughs> um, kind of working down the team. See they're kind of getting that out to each of them. Well, while you're doing this process of snacking the dogs, you're kind of watching the dog. Are they interested in eating? Yeah, it's good if they eat a snack, but they don't have to have the snack every time. Um, some of them might feel like they were a little more hungry. Some of them you might wait, wait till the next stop. Also in this stop, you're going to be checking the lines, checking the booties, being aware of everything going on. Um, make sure there's no snow built up in those booties. Make sure the lines are all untangled. You see the lead dog kind of taking a little bit of a break there. A lot of times they'll kind of lick some of the snow off their feet. That lead dog's well aware of what Robert's doing, sees him standing on the sled getting ready to go, and he's on his feet, and they're all back on the trail here. And really the reason, nice even pace with these dogs. And, and the reason for these little breaks, it's not a real rest taking a break, but uh, even though he's within in miles about 22 miles from the checkpoint is just to keep that energy level up in the dogs don't let them crash just a little snack a little bit of energy keep keep their whole digestive system working you want them to come in hungry so they will consume that big meal on a longer race but you don't want them to crash either you don't want them to run out of energy and just that little stop like that helps maintain that throughout the entire run Nice pass. Now uh, Nina is at the checkpoint Orkerbogen and uh, there are some rushing coming right at you really soon. Well, Maria, right now, Robert Sterling is in the lead, as you already said, followed by Birgit and Ness. And uh, we're waiting for the first two teams of the 650 here at the checkpoint Orkerbogen. I got hold of one of Robert Surly's handlers. This is Magnus Surly, his son. You're a handler for your father. How does that feel, Magnus? Oh, I don't know. It just feels like everything else. It's I've always been his son, so it's no difference if he's, if I'm his handler or not. I don't know. What is it like uh, handling Robert? Does he get irritated? Never. Almost never. And uh, I think he's probably the easiest to be handling. So what will you do when Robert comes here uh, uh, in some hours? What will you help him with? Absolutely nothing. <laughs> He'll do anything, uh, everything himself. Uh, but you have brought something for the depot? Yeah, the yeah, of course. But uh, we're not allowed to enter. And uh, he has uh, this routine that uh, he has have, uh, had forever. So... What, who am I to tell what he is supposed to do? <laughs> <laughs> Never change a winning team, huh? Yeah, probably. But you're allowed to bring food for the dogs up to the depot where he has to go and get the food for his dogs, the snacks. But you're allowed to help him with something. So what do you can do when he gets out of the dog area? You, he can go into cafe and... The main thing is just to get him food and... Uh, um, 
get him to watch his time because he, he stops and talks to everybody so time flies away and he never gets to bed <laughs> so that's probably the most important is to remember off the clock and get him to bed why do you think he, he keeps talking to everybody in such a uh, last part of the race i mean why don't you go to bed why does he go to bed <laughs> Ah, he probably wants to go to bed, but he also wants to keep everyone satisfied and tell people what they want and meet people. Rob Sherry is a very popular and social guy, very, very well-known and a popular musher here in Norway. But uh, Magnus, who is also in your the handler team? You are two persons. Who's the other one? Uh, it's my brother, my older brother, and I really hope he gets into it too. <laughs> Where is he now? He's uh, sleeping in the car. So this is a tradition in the feminine race that uh, uh, Håkon, your brother, and yourself uh, are his handlers, huh? Yes, uh, we are here uh, every year. I'm uh, only at this this race, and my brother is a couple uh, at a couple of others. But uh, for me, this is enough. One week, and uh, that's enough for a year for me. Magnus, I know you brought the whole family. I know you have a child and a yeah. wife or a girlfriend. Um, they are, uh, where are they now? They are uh, back in uh, Røros, just waiting. So the family race is actually a family tradition for the whole family of uh, Sir Robert Sterling, right? Yeah, now it's a complete family trip. <laughs> but, I mean, how uh, do you have dogs yourself? No, oh, only one, but it's uh, nothing like a husky. What kind of breed do you have? Uh, English uh, Staffordshire Bull Tidy. Well, uh, so, uh, so we, although we have been growing up with a world-famous dog musher as your father, you are not interested in dog mushing yourself. No, it's way too much work. <laughs> but when your father races, uh, different kind of races, and you're not handling, are you home watching the result and GPS tracking system when you're home? Uh, I watch Finnmark Slöpe. But uh, for me, who is not that interested, Femin and Finnmark is more than enough for me. But uh, seriously, Magnus, your father is at this moment in the lead of the race. Are you still calm or what do you feel about that? I'm calm all the way. I'm not the one who's racing. <laughs> but uh, are you calm that uh, the whole last part of the race will be go as planned? Yeah, basically. Well, I think you're very much like your father, <laughs> always very calm and always very nice and talk to talk to. I get stressed too, but uh, I just don't get stressed now. But do you get stressed when it's mushing or in other situations? No, when it's um, much closer to the finish and, there, uh, and you really don't know who's uh, about to win, then I get stressed, but this is too early. You gotta make sure you don't oversleep. Yeah, that's no problem. <laughs> but I was thinking, you know, you, your father has been winning the Adidas Tour twice in 2003 and 2005. He has done several Adidas and he got two wins. Yeah. And you were a much younger guy that time. Do you remember how you felt in the 2003 when he won the first time? Yeah, I remember it uh, actually very good because I was at school at the time. So all the school uh, watched. So, yeah. how, how old were you at that time? Do you remember? Oh, I don't know. Uh, 13 or 14. I so, think. in junior high school, you were yeah. in. So, uh, did you feel very proud at that time when the whole school yeah. were watching? Yeah, I did. <laughs> but have you been to Alaska to see your father in the Aditrod race? No, I, I've only been there in the summer. It's quite the opposite of uh, mushing. <laughs> Do you believe that your father will race the Aditrud again? I don't know. He says no, but he has also said no before, and he has also said he was going to quit mushing before, so who knows? Thank you very much, Magnus. We look forward to seeing your father. Back to Dallas CV in the studio at Reros. All right, we're taking a look at uh, Robert Sorley here, cruising along with a nice-looking dog team. We're getting these amazing uh, live aerial views of these teams on the trail right now. And so this is Robert, Robert Sorley leading the Femmond, um, closing in on the, the last checkpoint that they're likely to be stopping and camping in. Now, a little ways back down the trail, this is Petter Carlson. 
He's a few miles or a few kilometers behind uh, the leaders, about 17.3 kilometers behind, looking nice. Um, and man, it's a nice looking team. They're moving along steadily, but they just simply don't have that upper end speed that Robert's showing here uh, out in front of this race. But nice Still looking gang of dogs. Everybody's scooting along really nicely there. Still a really nice looking traveling team to be proud of. They're, not everybody can be at the front, but that doesn't mean everyone doesn't, other people don't have a nice dog team. And that, uh, that's a nice, smooth, put together team right there we're seeing. Absolutely, and as you know, it's kind of interesting to see here. We've got uh, not so far left to the to the finish line. It's still a good distance, though. We could still see orders change at this point. We're starting to get the basic landscape of what this race is going to look like. But man, there's still a lot of miles to go before they reach the finish line. You see that Petra is still using kind of his left heel there on the track, putting a little bit of pressure on that, slowing things down, keeping it at an even speed. When this race is all wrapped up, they'll have covered 650 kilometers of you know kind of varied snowy terrain out here but you look at a team like this and they're training for a 1200 kilometer race oftentimes or a thousand mile race so it's got to be something where you're keeping an eye on what do i want this team to to do in four or five weeks you know for in petter's case he's gonna be racing a 1200 kilometer finmark slope a little bit later on and i would be like i said before if i were him i'd have uh, high hopes for that race coming up this is a really even moving team and another thing for fans to keep in mind this isn't just a dog team that just started an event and they look good most people have been to bed and slept twice and these dogs have been going around <laughs> the clock so we're seeing you got to put in perspective i mean i think a good way for fans to look at it is wherever you live think about this distance of this race away from your house and these dogs have been traveling and looking still like this fresh and in good shape happy going down the trail incredible incredible athletic capability over a lot of hours a lot of days why don't you two talk about you know when you have 12 dogs on a line and you've got a musher and a sled how much weight is each one of those dogs pulling well, How dispersed is the weight through a, a string of dogs? Oh, along the whole team? Yeah. like Well, the wheel dogs back at the back, the back positions typically take a little more of the weight, but that's one of the beauties of a team like this one we're viewing here of Ness's or Roberts. If you've got that consistent consistency in the tug line, it should be distributed fairly equally throughout the team. Now, there's always going to be a little bit less weight pulling on the leaders in most situations of a flat trail than there is towards the rear of the sled but they all have a different job to do in the team now on an uphill you may have a more equal distribution but i mean if it's 200 pounds including the musher is it evenly dispersed with the dogs so if you have 10 dogs roughly it's 20 pounds per dog pulling it down a trail a proc is it that simple it, it it is except those wheel dogs always have a little bit they have to be they're the muscle dogs they're the ones that take on the pull of the sled first but again it's kind of how the musher is managing that team and then an, another thing that will happen greg is you might not leave those dogs in the same positions right you'll you'll let them rest those muscles i might take those wheel dogs and move them up to the third position forward and then bring somebody back so that they have time to relax a little bit. I don't know how you manage yours, Dallas, but you, ca yeah. you you rotated dogs in and out to relieve that stress, carrying them oh, for yeah. a while. So, we're I'm always moving dogs throughout the team. Um, you know, a lot of times when you've watched me load dogs in the sled to give them a rest and then put them back in the team, I'm putting them back in the team in a different position than they were before. Now, honestly, I think in my team, there's a fairly equal weight distribution um, when it comes to the, the weight that they're actually pulling here. I think it's going to be fairly equal up that line most of the time, not always. The lead dogs do tend to maybe have a little less weight that they're pulling, but let's not undermine that task because those dogs are also the ones that are setting the pace. And there are times that my lead dogs are some of the hardest working dogs in the team especially in a, a changing terrain where they come down one slope and those lead dogs have to charge up the next slope at the same speed that the, the wheel dogs are going downhill behind them if it's a short choppy uh, change from going down to up. So that's, that's pretty important. And another thing to remember is these sleds slide pretty easy. We've seen a little bit of runner care out there with mushers, you know, using a reeling tool. A lot of the plastic that they put on the bottom of the runners have been waxed before they put them on those sleds. Um, they have some choices in the checkpoint you know 
know, trying to pick out the right wax or the right runner co or plastic composition for the next section of trail. And we did see Robert Sorley pedaling on his sled on flat land. And each time that he pedals with that, you know, with that foot, when he pushes with that leg, it's actually putting slack in the toe line. And if you look at this line right here, just in front of the sled, we see a bungee section. And there's a section of the toe line between the dogs and the sled that actually has a, an elastic bungee in there that has a kind of a shock absorber. And it weighs a little more than the rest of the line. And we see that actually moving. It's not completely tight, right? There's a little bit of play because that sled just doesn't take much force to move it down the trail until you hit an incline. And that's why we're seeing mushers kind of conserving their energy on the flats or on the downhills, of course. And then when they get to those hills, they're hopping off and they're running along side or they're pushing. Oftentimes, it only takes uh, maybe seven, eight pounds of pressure to keep that sled sliding down a nice smooth trail. And, and another thing in the management of these dogs, it's a good point, Greg, about who's who is pulling the most and it is fairly equal is the goal but this management of moving dogs around and also <clears throat> when I was racing dogs I would move them from side to side now there are dogs that are definitely left or right handed so to speak they prefer to be on one side and you have to know that about that individual dog and leave them there but if you have dogs that don't mind i like to move them from side to side because it takes a little pressure off their shoulders and how they're on the line and also because there's always the potential of stepping into the soft edge of the trail and if a dog's going a thousand miles and doing that on say the right side over and over you're more likely to injure that leg also if i saw a dog that was a little stiff on a right shoulder, I would move it to the other side of the sled so that that leg is more protected in the center of the trail and they're less likely to step off into soft snow and pull that muscle. So you're constantly dealing with those little details if you want to be a real competitive musher. And we were talking earlier about evolution and what is the next great evolution. And I've always said, as long as we continue to send people into outer space and to the moon, there's always going to be desire to send people there with lighter substances. So science is always going to come up with lighter, more uh, strong elements, right? And so when you look at how the sled has evolved, where it wasn't that long ago, they were all made of wood today. And then there was plastic uh, introduced into it. And now you've got titanium and all of these really lighter substances. How much right, lighter is a sled today than it was 30 years ago? We'll get Dallas here quick, I want to draw our we'll eye to this, to this photo here real quick, and we'll come back to that. But here we have another team cruising along. This is Nina Volen coming along with a nice looking team, a little bit farther back on the trail. Um, the scoot along nice. We see her doing a little sled handling. You see how that sled's kind of fishtailing back and forth, and I think that plays into this. There's just not a lot of friction on the bottom of those sleds. Here we should have, I think this is uh, Ronnie Frendenlund, if I'm not mistaken. We'll see here as they go by. These guys are in a little, little more mellow trot, looking nice, though. Everybody's just casually moving down the trail, seeming real comfortable, and that's always what I like to see as a team that looks comfortable on the trail. Then now I think we're back up to Robert Sorley um, leading this race with his 12 dog team there and they're and they've just been consistent in every one of these shots mm -hmm. we've never caught them where the leaders aren't looking right down the trail he's either stopped giving a little snack or adjusting something for minutes not a br real break or he is moving and all these shots from the helicopter they're just so consistent and that matters yeah. over time and distance and another pass. So passing one of the, the eight dog teams now running six in that team. Another smooth pass. This is a really professional team. You know, I'm watching each dog's head as they pass the team. And it'll turn maybe 10 degrees to the left to look at the other team. But they're not swinging over to say hi. They're staying in their lane. And they're very professional on, on every single pass we've seen Robert Sorley execute here. Along with all the other mushers, we've seen some really good, uh, you know, interaction between dog teams there. And it is interesting. You've, you mentioned uh, Robert Sorley's kind of short short little stops here. That's really, really important, of course, to get the snacks into the dog, just to have steady uh, fuel coming into the system there. But also, one of the things that's happening is even in the course of a minute or a minute and a half stop, you're actually letting a little bit of that lactic acid drain out of the muscle system. Letting those muscles stop moving for just a few seconds or a minute makes a really big difference, especially when we look at this in terms of a you know 400-mile race or 650-kilometer race. It's taking those little 
little breaks along the way that keeps the dogs you know energetic happy and feeling comfortable and you know prepared to, to look like this team right here moving briskly down the trail and greg i know this is something that excites you is that these are live images and it, i'm just sitting here thinking you're looking at a championship team but to see this team moving on the trail this long, I don't know that that's ever happened anywhere no, in anywhere, the world no, in any race yeah. to get this consistent of a look of the dog team traveling. Yeah, no, if you're a fan of sled dogs and, and these events, like these are historical moments that we've watched here over the last 48 hours. To be able to watch dog teams running live uh, in their natural environment for this long, we've never seen before. And for you guys to be able to, you know, tune in every two or three minutes and, and kind of assess each dog, I think that the educational opportunity that is happening right now before our eyes, we've never had the opportunity to do this. All of the education in the past has come in a, a post-production, right, where we shoot video and then when it's all said and done, and then we're able to go back and, and teach that way. But when you guys are able to do this live, I think it's just fantastic. And it's, uh, it's going to help take this event to the next level when you can teach so that people understand the dynamic and the expertise that is involved in in a, a team that Robert is is driving right now today there is somebody that we're watching right now at the very top of his profession uh, this is like you know watching Michael Jordan in his prime or Magic Johnson if you're a basketball player uh, this is like watching one of the great football players if you're watching in America uh, Robert Sorley and this team right now is on that level that we're watching but to see the dogs move this consistently not just coming in and out of a checkpoint but out on the trail I think it, it is a real educational opportunity yeah. and if you're a musher to say wow my dogs don't look like that <laughs> yeah. I better buy a breeding from this guy's yeah. dog right. Right, right. improve my that's kennel. the goal they see okay well that's, that's the, the goal. goal right there yeah no, I, I think you guys are right on on that one. I mean, we're, we think of this from a fan perspective, having this this kind of new, completely unfiltered look into the sport and what it is that mushers enjoy and love mm -hmm. about this sport. You know, this is something that I've gotten to experience firsthand my entire life. And now we're able to bring this to a much broader audience. But that doesn't just include fans of the sport. I think this is going to be hugely educational for mushers getting into the sport that want to advance in the sport, that want to be competing and in this position that Robert Sorley is in, you know, 20 years from now. They want to be this person, right? This is going to be very informative and educational to have this sort of just long view of the race, watching these teams move down the trail, watching how a musher manages the dog team, how they manage themselves is a really important aspect here. We've talked about it a little bit before, but kind of the mental toughness that it takes on these ultra long distance races and, you know, being the leader that your team needs, you know, and, and that kind of means becoming that person because quite simply, you can't fake it for four days or nine days on the Iditarod. You've got to actually be that person, especially when you start looking at the sleep deprivation. You've got to know how to manage yourself as well as the team. And that means you have to take an unfiltered look at yourself and understand this is who I am. And that can be challenging for some people to really take that look at themselves and become you know, the personality type you know, that's calm, that's steady, that's consistent for a dog team. You can't have huge emotional swings. The dog teams, they need to have a good, steady leadership and somebody that they can rely on and trust. Because when we see this team running down the trail, we see these dogs all leaning into the harness. Let's look at this from their experience for a second here. Mm -hmm. We're watching with GPSs and helicopters. We know where the finish line is. We know there's a mandatory six hour rest coming up. Only, what, what were you saying, about 20 miles down the trail yeah. here. The dogs don't know that. The dogs don't know if the checkpoint is half a mile away or 50 miles away. All they know is that this musher on the back of their sled is their friend. He's never asked them to do something that not only will they be able to do, but they will be able to conquer in good form. Here we see this team just attacking the trail. That's confidence, that's trust, and that takes years to build. So that's one of the most amazing views here is the dogs, they're running on trust, not because they think the finish line's around the corner. They're happy to do whatever, knowing the musher's got their back. Now over to our expert Nina at the checkpoint Orkelbogen. Well, Maria, right now I am together with the race marshal of the whole feminine race, Runa Hestammer. Runa, 
We are expecting the teams coming into the checkpoint in one, one and a half hours time. Oh, it says it's about 3, 3.30. We expect the uh, robots early to come in. So that'll be a little bit, a little bit more than one and a half hour. But uh, do you feel the excitement of uh, the first registers coming in here? Yeah, if, uh, people are coming now to the checkpoints here, and uh, there's a lot of activity, and uh, we are having tents when they follow the live stream. So it's people really like this. When you are the head of the race, in the case, uh, I mean, you're the race marshal. What do you actually do? All traveling around, checking uh, all the checkpoints that they're prepared, and uh, if there are any questions coming up during the race, it yeah, has to come through me. And I'll try to have so e every musher have an equal uh, opportunity to win this race, and so on. <laughs> So, uh, Runa, you actually are the uh, race marshal, the Mark Norman, as Mark Norman is in the Aditurate race. This is your position here in the Femen race. And you have been the race marshal here for many years, as I would know. No, I've been there for uh, race marshal for two years. and uh, But I've been uh, uh, race coordinator for uh, nine years. So, uh, I've been working with Roger Ligar. So, uh, so I'll, I get to know this race now. But Runa, I just have to tell all the viewers, this is pretty interesting. You had a year in Canada. What did you do in Canada? Well, I was going to go uh, beer hunting and someone told me you have to try dog mushing. And uh, OK, I'll stay one year up in Yukon in Whitehorse and um, worked in a big, uh, large kennel there and became uh, the second best dog musher in Yugan territory that year. Which year was that? In uh, 82. 1982. Yeah. Which kennel were you working at? Uh, Chris Camping. He, um, he was uh, been working with uh, Earl Norris uh, in uh, Willow, Alaska and moved uh, up to Whitehorse. I'm sure some of the uh, uh, older American mushing fans are familiar with your name. But I mean, after Canada, you went back to Norway. Um, what did you do? Because... Oh, when I was uh, in Whitehorse, everything... Uh, the biggest race is, uh, of course, Aditarad. And uh, I went back to Norway to save money and work with sponsors. I worked up in Spitsbergen, north of Norway. And um, and I saved money and uh, I wrote to the best dog mushers in uh, Alaska and asked to, uh, if I could stay there. And uh, Susan Butcher uh, replied and uh, she said I could come and stay with her. But uh, she thought Rune was a female name. So when I come, <laughs> oh, you're a boy. <laughs> but that was okay. And, uh, uh, I had a very good year there, and uh, I leased dogs from her and trained the dogs for one year. And uh, I come in 10th place in uh, Best Rookie, and uh, Susan won that year too. As far as I would know, that would be 1986. Yes. Was that her uh, young dog team or her B team? No, well, probably a B team dog team but uh, many of the leader many of the dogs uh, I had on that race uh, she used them for the next common race and, uh, she had trouble with uh, I use a lot of uh, high tones when I speak to the dogs and uh, she had a problem with the Norwegian <laughs> but <laughs> the dogs worked worked very well but did you use Norwegian words for left or right no, or did no, you use G and H? G and H but uh, I was always uh, whistling and singing for the dogs and uh, we had a good time. Did you go with the dogs trap lining as well? No, not not in uh, not in um, Alaska, but I I had 20 dogs up in Spitsbergen and there we've been uh, traveling all over for, with the island on tours. But Rune, what happened to the bear hunting in the Yukon territories? 
No, that got, we didn't get any bears. <laughs> so you got no bear skin on your wall, huh? No, no, uh, I don't, I do not have that. But we saw a lot of bear and we had, a, I have many fine stories about bears and I had them all around me and... <laughs> well, let's go back to 1986. Mm. You lived at Susan Butcher's Kennel. Have you ever been back to Alaska after 1986-87? No, sorry, I haven't been there. But I love to come back and watch that little... Maybe you should head up with Svein Hovard Fiesta, who did the Aditra in 1977. So you guys can do like a veteran race. Yeah, it would be fun. And uh, take Roger Gerligar with us too. He did, was there in 1983. Roger Gerligar. <laughs> yeah. But uh, right now, here and now, at Orkelbogen, mm. what are you looking for? I oh, will come here at uh, 6 o'clock this morning and uh, watch the uh, first 450 teams go come in there. And uh, there been, uh, we had a really bad weather this morning and people struggle uh, over the mountains. So we had to have the snowmobiles out and prepare some of the tracks. And um, then the dog musher had a lot of questions, so we answered them and helped them as good as much as we can. And uh, follow that everything is going okay at the checkpoints. And the veterinarian do a very fine job. And uh, I've never seen, I've never been so few dogs that have been dropped out on a race before. So that, that looked good. Great animal, dog welfare. No, yeah. no. And I was just looking at the uh, life team now and see. See how fast and smooth the dog teams are running. It's incredible, incredible after uh, 500 kilometer, and they're still moving on like a train. Do you still have dogs? No, I don't. I quit uh, in 1996, so it's a long time ago. But I had a large kennel in in the middle of Norway, in Gøstal. I lived there for five years and. Uh, well, uh, Runa, right now I am sure you have a lot to do before the first 650 mushroom will al arrive. And I'm sure you know Robert Sterling very well. Yeah, I mean, I'm amazed what he can do and pull this off again. It's incredible. Have you met him in competitions? Oh, yeah, I, uh, I was racing uh, middle distance before and uh, R Robert was always uh, close behind me. Behind you, that's important. <laughs> I was three three time region champion on the road. <laughs> yeah, I know your name is famous here in Norway in dog mushing history. So, but uh, right now I am sure you would like to prepare for the first 650 mushes arriving. So thank you very much for uh, taking time to talk to us. Uh, and thank you for being here. All right, over to the studio. Thanks, Sina. Now, that was uh, Rina, and uh, he's talking about uh, your territory, the White yeah. Horse. And, uh, we heard a lot of names in there that are familiar to us, starting with Earl Norris, famous Siberian uh, mushing family in, in Alaska, Martin Boozer, uh, who went on to win four championships, started there in that kennel as well, running Siberian to eventually move to the Alaskan Husky and, and kind of started his own genetic line there. But yeah, a lot of famous names in yeah. Alaska mushing history. And uh, during the 70s and 80s, was there many uh, foreigners like the Norwegians coming over to, to Alaska at that time? Well, in the early days of the Iditarod, not really, but as that, <clears throat> it was pretty much an Alaskan race. Mm -hmm. But as interest grew with the public of these dogs traveling over true wilderness land, no roads, no nothing, I think it captivated them. And, and gentlemen like this and uh, another name mentioned, Roger Lagarde. Roger Lagarde was the first name I ever heard of a European musher coming over. And what these guys did, this is that very beginning of the exchange of genetics. They were buying dogs, doing breedings, working with people like the great musher Rick Swenson. That Rick was the first person I ever heard talk about Roger Lagarde and that over here they were breeding a lot of hounds into their dogs to go faster, which works in short distances. But then they, the Europeans soon learned that they don't have that steadiness of the Alaska Husky to go longer distances. So that 
everything that he was describing there was kind. He was there at that apex when this whole thing of competitive racing and the exchange and of uh, genetics and improvement of this breed to get where we are now really started. He was there at a pretty exciting time, actually. Yes, and uh, this sport is starting to like going across borders and we see that Robert is familiar to you, Robert Surly, but uh, still we have most Norwegians in this uh, race here in Norway. And yeah, and I, I forget what year it was, but weren't there like 15 Norwegians, one of the Iditarods that came over? I mean, it was like a, a, a you know, a, yeah, a huge number mm -hmm. of Norwegians that came over and ran that race. And so, uh, yeah, we the race has had people now from all over the world. There's a, there's a guy that's run it from Jamaica, <laughs> right? And oh. so really, uh, mushing doesn't know borders anymore. And, and information is flowing freely. And, and an operation like what we're doing here is going to really add to that. And when again, when people can tune in and watch these dogs running in motion, I think it's going to inspire more of the younger generation to get involved. And so, you know, in Alaska, if your name is C.V. Reddington or a Mackie, it's almost genetic on the human level as well, because you grow up in places, the information is handed down through the family tree. And so you begin at a different place. What's going to happen now, I think, is that you're going to be able to grow up in Chicago, Illinois, or someplace in Norway or in Europe that maybe you're in the middle of a city and dream of doing something like this. And now I think it's going to be a lot easier as we continue to educate uh, with great, you know, mushers like Dallas and Bruce uh, helping in that process. It's but, an exciting time. But also, I mean, if, let's just take Alaska, Canada, Norway. People think of the world as a globe, kind of turning this way, you know, and how we visualize the planet. But for Northerners, we would turn the globe this way because we are all around this Arctic Circle area and our cultures are very similar. Yukoners and Alaskans have often jo joked that we should be our own country and the Yukon shouldn't be part of Canada and Alaska shouldn't be a part of the United States. We're more similar to each other than the rest of our countries. And I think you can say that up here in the Northern Scandinavian regions, we look at the world this way, we have similar plants, similar tundra, similar ways we deal with our weather. So in that sense, it, it's, it's a very shared culture, even though we speak different languages. And it's easy to understand the importance of these dogs in this Arctic environment. Yeah, and we also uh, met uh, the son of Robert Surly there, Magnus. <laughs> did you think, did he uh, look like his father? <laughs> I don't know if he looked like him. He sounded like him in, in ways, and but I didn't. I didn't hear the passion. I didn't hear the passion for dog mushing coming from him. But again, another indicator of how you know to be really good at this, you need the entire family involved. And still, uh, you know, Robert uh, portraying that as well with family members there to help him out. Uh, you cannot have a great kennel and a championship caliber dog team without having a lot of people with their hands in the pie, so to speak. And Robert is always very reserved. And it's fun for me to see him over here because I always thought maybe it's the language difference. And interviewing him or talking to him out on the Iditarod Trail, it's always very much, yep, yep. nope. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but the most animated, most laughing I ever saw Robert on the whole Iditarod Trail yeah. was halfway I did her. In, in the town and the little checkpoint of Cripple, which is a just cripple. a tent. He had a broken tooth and we were all yeah. just sitting out there on straw bales laughing about if he would let one of us get the tooth out with a hunting knife or a pair of pliers. And he was laughing. It hurts him so bad, but he wouldn't let us take the tooth out. He said he'd wait to know him. But he was laughing at the predicament and picturing us trying to pull his tooth out. And then he was laughing. Yeah, he was, he was hysterically laughing. <laughs> yeah, they should have just tied a string around it and sent his dog team off. Yeah, and they would have yeah. got that right yeah. out. That yeah, would be great. Uh, now over to Dallas. All right, we're getting our first view here of Barbara Inuit coming across uh, our kind of camera station out on the trail here. So we're getting a live shot of Barbara coming by the Tinset, uh, not checkpoint, but kind of road crossing and town area. Um, nice looking team once again. We've seen her steadily, tra steadily traveling down the trail with a nice looking team. Not quite the speed of some of these guys ahead of her. As she goes down this hill here, we see her like picking up a little bit of speed. 
Most all the dogs looking really good as they uh, do go a little bit faster down that incline, but a nice looking team. So she's that's Barbara Inuin running in fourth place right now, um, kind of on the hunt for Carlson up ahead of her, but I think uh, also keeping a pretty <laughs> consistent eye behind her for Rolf Johansson, who's not that far behind. But nice looking team. You see her trying to steer the Trisled back on the trail, staying on that harder pack surface, trying to make it a little easier for the dog team there. Mm -hmm. Still a very nice looking team. And that's the reason all yes, these teams are at the front. They're all really high caliber, smooth teams. And just as you're watching or trying to learn, just look for that consistency in each dog and a team moving about the same. Looks like we're back at maybe Robert Sorley here, a big team and the way they're lined out. Looks like him on the trail again. Yeah, I'm hearing that uh, Barbara's about two hours and five minutes behind uh, Robert Sorley out in the lead here. Um, so that's two hours and five minutes off the pace, which is still a very respectable race that she's running here, staying in fourth place, uh, having a very, very nice race. Now below us right now, we see uh, Robert Sorley there cruising along down the trail. Um, man, that, that is a nice dog team, and he's setting a brisk pace in this race. Not far behind him, we have uh, Birgitta Ness, and um, he's just recently overtaken her a little while back. We watched that pass before, but we keep coming back to what a nice-looking dog team that Robert Sorley has here. But I'm also very impressed and very pleased to see how nice all of these teams are looking. You know, despite being just uh, you know, only, only two hours and five minutes off the pace, you know, Barbara's team was looking very solid there. And Greg, before, a little earlier, you were talking about the innovations and in, in nutrition, equipment, everything, and how these races get faster and what might happen. And th there is a lot of that happening, but in mushing circles, I've always said there's also a lot of voodoo because if Robert were to win this race and have his sled runners painted purple, and he did that in the next race. I guarantee you somebody would come in the next year with, with sled runners painted yeah. purple and some reason like it slides on the snow better. So there's also a lot of voodoo and rumors in this that's kind of the humorous side. But uh, I don't know. I mean, you've watched this a lot. It's all everyone's always open to any idea that you can reason would help the dogs and help the sleds move faster. And lighter gear is part of it, like you were saying. Yeah, it's like somebody, you know, that's a baseball player and has committed their life to it. They're going to have that bat in their hands all day long, trying to figure out where do I shave it? Where do I put extra weight? How do I grip it? Things like this. So when you're a musher, you're constantly looking at ways to go a little bit faster because I think we're in an era now and, and maybe Dallas can, can contribute to this, but we're, you know, especially in the Iditarod, I don't think we're going to see major jumps now in, in times. It's gonna, you're going to have to get the micrometer out to separate first as, and second, as please. A, right? Yeah, and, as a musher, I mean, every, every minute I'm standing on the sled, it seems like I'm always looking at the equipment, the training that we've done to be here. Uh, what am I going to feed these dogs at the next checkpoint? In every aspect there, we're thinking, is this still the best way to do this mm -hmm. uh, and I mean is, is has anything changed is this am I doing it this way because that's the way that my dad did it or my grandpa did it or that's this is uh, kind of the standard right we get sometimes a little bit lazy on those things we do things just because we've already figured that problem out five years ago but things change and evolve and all of our systems have to work in in sync I do want to just real quick say explain the the shot that we're looking at right here we're waiting for Barbara Inuin to come uh, by the tin set check or uh, town here um, this is 50 kilometers from Orkelbogen and uh, we should see her coming into the screen uh, here in the next few moments but you know one of the things that I like to consistently or constantly ask myself and kind of challenge myself in our kennel is where is this sport going to be in 10 years I think we could all say, you know, is the race going to be faster in 10 years? I think we would all say yes, if we're talking about the Iditarod or the Femmond or uh, the Bear Grease that we watched last weekend, right? But the question is how? And then if you can answer that question, you know, how is it going to be faster? Are the dogs going to run faster? Are we going to take shorter rests? You know, is it going to be the equipment is lighter and the dogs will have the same output, but we'll be moving down the trail quicker with less resistance? If we can figure out how the race is going to look in 10 years, we can start to actually take the race there and be the one that does that you know that breaks that record 10 years from now um, i do think that as much as it's exciting and fun 
to work with equipment and develop that and I love working with everything from the clothing that I wear on the trail to the clothing that the dogs wear on the trail and the sleds themselves that's fun and it's tangible and it's something that you know as a spectator or as a commentator as you know, kind of the role I'm playing right now we can talk about it very easily we can look at you know Jeff King's uh, sit down sled and it's a tangible thing but the big innovations in this race that are yet to come I do not think are necessarily in the equipment as much as in the dogs. I think we are doing a good job of nutrition and sports medicine, but I think the dogs themselves have much more ability than what we've yet realized. And I think it's going to come down to training. So I've always been careful there that it's fun to do the equipment stuff. I love kind of tinkering with that, but I want a dog team that could pull a refrigerator down the trail in a record breaking pace. I think we have room to grow in that engine. Dog teams win races, not equipment. Now equipment can cause you to lose a race, that's true, but it's gonna take that amazing dog team to win. I don't care how nice your sled is, how good your runner plastic is, if you don't have a phenomenal dog team in front of that operation, you're not going anywhere. So that's where most of my focus is at at this time, is developing how we train and prepare these dogs from day one through their last day on this planet. You know, usually somewhere between 13 to 17 years old. You know, what is their life experience? How do we make that a better life experience? How do we continue to improve that? And then at those high points, you know, crossing the finish line in Nome at the finish of the Iditarod, how do we have them have higher high points, accomplishing better things there? And I do think our big innovations will be on uh, developing the sled dogs farther than we ever have before. And that's going to you know, encompass more probably year-round development of the athlete rather than peaking for one specific race. Yeah. Here in the very back of that screen, I'm seeing my first glimpse of a dog team back there. It's kind of looking through the shrubs and underneath the brush. <laughs> Yeah, that is a dog team. Now, this is, this is so funny because I'm sitting here watching. This is exactly what we'd be doing if we were a fan standing out there on the bridge or standing right where this camera is. You're, you're watching down the river, waiting for that first glimpse. Uh, and it's kind of like I'm standing there right now, although I'm a bit farther away and maybe even a bit warmer sitting here in a, in a studio. <laughs> but that's a nice-looking dog team shuffling down oh, the trail. That's a good observation. <laughs> Yeah, they're, they're steady, right? They're picking up their feet, putting them down. Everybody seems pretty comfortable in there. We see smiling doggy faces. That's always a good thing to see. You know, n not flying down this stretch like we saw Robert Sorley doing a little, bit of a little bit ago, but very respectable pace and a nice looking dog team. That's a dog team that, again, any musher would be proud to be driving. Right. Uh, that's a nice line out. But just a little slower cadence to the step. The, you, you can see that their legs aren't just they aren't firing as fast as Roberts were. Their cadence is a little bit slower. And given the miles, that adds up and causes these separations. But still, we're talking about one of the top five right now. So it's relative yep. to the leader, not to the whole the whole field of mushers. A very nice team. But even someone new to this can see those legs are moving at a little slower pace than those first two teams. A little more teams. casual pace, yeah, yeah. And that may be natural for these dogs. That doesn't mean they're more tired even. It's just th that's where breeding and training, like you were talking about, comes in. And, and matching up dogs, you could have a faster paced dog in this team, and it might have got dropped already because it was overworking relative to the team. But a very nice team, great traveling team for going cross country. Yeah, you like guys? you just pointed out, Bruce, this, they're traveling. Uh, it's a nice traveling team. And, of course, we've had the benefit of watching, you know, Robert Sorley and Brigitte farther up front with really phenomenal-looking teams. Um, and so we call this a traveling team, you're, and you're right, but they're still in fourth place. Right, <laughs> and I right. And uh, I would call their gait or their, their mode of travel a little more casual. And you're spot on. That cadence um, is a little bit slower. The dogs are just kind of sauntering down the trail versus driving down the trail would be the word I would use used to kind of uh, describe Robert Sorley team. But this is a very nice looking dog team. You know, probably gonna leave, I would guess she's gonna leave one or two behind before continuing on on the last stretch there. And she may even get a little more speed from that if um, she's keeping the pace kind of monitored for those ones. But here on flat ground, we do see her helping out the dog team. A uh, little bit of slack in that line. And the dogs are just cruising along. And this is a pace that they could do for a very long time, I feel. But the important thing is, looking at this, they're all the same. And that's where the word team comes in. She has put together 
a group of dogs. I mean, look at them all in line there and their leg movement relative to each other. It's not Robert's team, but she has built a team that consistently moves the same throughout the team. And that's probably why she's in fourth place. And I mean that in a, ahead of everybody else. It's are really you, important to have them equally What matched. are you looking at then? Are you looking at their backs or at their legs? I'm looking at the flow, how level their backs are. I'm looking at the cadence of how they're all moving in sync, in the same timing. There isn't a bunch of different gates and unequal movement. It all, all their legs, don't look at the body, look at all the legs across. They're all moving the same as if it's one animal instead of 10 animals. Does that make sense? Yes, to really. Why don't you experts talk about breeding? Like you, you have one dog that you love this quality of it, and you have this dog that you love the quality in that, and, you, and we've seen a few breedings happen on this show in the last <laughs> few days, but you bring them together, right, and you try to, uh, in a scientific way, bring both qualities together in the next era of dogs in the kennel. Yeah, and it's kind of a guessing game. Well, we got a team coming here. We'll get back to this yeah, to see who we got here. This one here, we have... Uh, yeah, we have we got Rolf Johansson coming around the corner here. Yeah, <laughs> he's uh, in fifth position right now, coming around the corner. Another nice-looking dog team. <laughs> Just trying to get a good glimpse of everybody here. They have a little bit. Uh, a little bit brisker pace, it looks like, than uh, what we just saw with um, with the team a few seconds ago with Barbara's gang there. But nice looking team. We've really been enjoying this team uh, for the mm -hmm. last, you know, last 24 hours at least, uh, a little bit longer than that even. You know, enjoying watching how they move down the trail. And this is a, another very kind of symmetrical team, if you will. Um, nice looking gang. And I'm going to say they're holding a little bit brisker pace, or at least they, they seem like they're a little more, um, have a little more pep in their step as they go down this section of trail. Yeah, yeah, Ralph may catch a few teams. He, before he's this possibility he'll catch somebody, especially slingshotting off of that six hour break, but still moving relatively <laughs> consistent to how we saw him in the beginning of yeah, the race. True. So now we're looking at a little bit earlier today. This is Robert Sorley going through the same section of trail that we just watched Barbara go through a few minutes ago. Um, we were talking about the little bit different paces. You know, Barbara Inuit and Steve, we were talking about them looking a little more like a, a casual traveling team relative to Robert Sorley, a little more charging pace here. And right off, we see that faster cadence that Bruce was referring to there. So let him get uh, past some of this brush get through the alders and out to where we can see a little bit better. But yeah, just longer strides, um, very, very, very even team. Yeah, that is a, a nice looking dog team right there. <laughs> just a quicker pace. So breeding this type of dog, team like you're talking about greg genetics is really the fun part of this for me everybody has their own different thing i think genetics and breeding is really interesting and you it's not something you ever have totally the grasp of mm -hmm. because it, it is kind of a crapshoot as far as what turns out if it was if there was an easy answer the same line of horses would every year win the kentucky derby but it's not. It's all, there's always this variable of the unknown. You can do the best you can for size, for attitude, for length of leg and gait, but there's always going to be a genetic throwback in there or a throw forward. And some of the best dogs in the history, we were listening before to the race marshal talking to the history of when he was involved. There have been some champion lead dogs winning the Iditarod and lots of races that never really threw good pups. Mm. And then some mediocre dog in a team throws great pups or they skip a generation. And maybe the next litter isn't good, but the litter after that is. So it, it's always a guessing game and it makes it intriguing. And it's, yeah, there's, it's uh, breeding is definitely both an art and a science. <laughs> um, trying to figure all of that out and kind of get some consistency. And I, I want to go back to that just a second, uh, or in a second. You know, uh, Bruce was touching on how even they all look and like in that aspect. And I'm going to have to be the the champion of the odd dog here because I have run teams with huge size variations. Um, in 2015, my two lead dogs that I had on the podium with me, wreathed in the yellow roses, were Hero and Reef. Hero was the largest dog in my team at 75 pounds and constantly loped. And Reef, who was only about 52 
two pounds and had the fastest trot I've ever seen. And these are the two of the best dogs I've ever gotten to work with. They worked great together despite their size differences. And we're kind of swapping out in leader position towards the end of the race, both setting great paces, working well in the same team, despite being, by all appearances, completely different dogs. So it's about figuring out how to help that dog be their best version. Yeah, and uh, now we're going over to Nina. How is it going at uh, Orkelbogen? Well, you guys, I'm going to show you where the mushers are resting and sleeping while they're here at the checkpoint of Orkelbogen. Right behind me here, we have a big wooden uh, lavo or a teepee, as lavo is a Norwegian term for a teepee in the native uh, l uh, Sami language of Norway, Norwegian, uh, Norway. Uh, anyways, uh, this is the, where the mushers are sleeping. The handlers are not allowed to sleep in here. The mushers will sleep in a circle on mattresses. They bring their own sleeping bags. And in the middle, there is a wooden oven, wooden oven uh, which means they can fire, uh, that it's warm and nice in there. They're able to dry their clothes and it's going to be quiet in there. Right now there are a couple of mushrooms resting in there, it's really dark inside and we're not going inside because that will disturb the resting mushrooms of the 450 class. Next, next to the lavo, next to the teepee here, we have the outdoor toilet. This is the facilities the mushrooms have if they need to go to the bathroom actually. So in this checkpoint this is quite nice it's um does not have an electricity here and they make like in the cafe they make everything based on a, a, a fire or a prepaid a pre-made food but right here is the area of the uh, resting area of the mushrooms and we're just next to the dog lot so uh Oh, the weather is getting so nice now. I'm getting suntan here now. <laughs> it's very, very nice for the measures of the 650, the leaders, Robert and Birgitte, arriving here now. I know it's windy in the mountains, not so windy here at the checkpoint, but sure is beautiful here, catching some sun uh, for the first time of the first hours of the race. We are very happy to see you waiting for the measures to come here. We're really, really glad to see them and hopefully get to talk to Robert and Birgitta. Over oh, to the studio. Yeah, I hope so too, Nina. And uh, they're getting closer to Orkelbogen. Now, in the meantime, we have our reporter, Carrie Ann, at the point of Röros, where she has uh, interviewed a pretty special guy. Here in Rödos, we're at the Finnish area and we've been talking to a lot of mushers. We have a theme here in Rödos today, the music, and Max here, he loves Adele. And um, for the first time in my life, I'm going to make an interview with a dog and he's going to show me how to sing. What do you think, Max? What, can you hear it? Oh, stay here. Come here. Oh, here. Sit. Sit. Here you go. It has to be Adele, huh? Yeah. She's good, huh? Live from Rörosa. He's just coming again. The refrain. Good boy. Ah, you don't sing when it's not the refrain, right? That's what you prefer? Huh? They're a good dog, aren't you? <coughs> ready? Are you getting ready? <coughs> And here we go. Let's 
Yes, you see, Rudos, we have great music, and uh, I'm gonna give uh, our friend here, Max, a, a treat and a little snack because of he has been working really hard for us. Back to you guys in the studio. Wow, we really hit the high notes there. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that we're making a great assumption in that, though. We're making an assumption that Max is reacting to music that he likes. Maybe he's not a fan of Adele. <laughs> it hurts and his he's, ears. He's revolting against the melodic sounds of, of Adele. Who knows? Uh, God, these what guys do you are think good about out this? the field. Have you ever seen a, a dog into music before? I've never interviewed a dog before in my entire life, no. <laughs> but, but can dogs have a, a sense of... A, they have ears and they have sure. good hearing, so can they... Do, can but they, as Greg is said, do they like it or not yeah. like it? That's up to the dog. But one of the great things about these sled dogs, though, it, it, it's... It's really great to walk out in a kennel and you feed them and it seems like they always do a group howl, like a pack mm -hmm. of wolves. And it's, I really think it is a bonding thing to them. And often if I'd pull the hook and run a team and get out a mile or so and I'd listen and I can hear everyone left back in the kennel howling, it's because they wanted to go, but they're kind of reaching out for wolves. Like I work at Denali National Park in Alaska as a wildlife guide. Part of a wolf's behavior is how, howling when they're out split up hunting is, I'm here, where are you? I'm here. But it's a bonding thing, and it's just a great chorus to hear 50 sled dogs yeah. all howling at once. It's a wonderful sound. sound. Yeah. Huh. It is a great sound. I'm yeah. not sure that was the um, same thing. That was a golden retriever, right? <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah, they, uh, pre, uh, they have a different uh, uh, temper and, uh, and not how as are good they different? And, and not as good of a voice. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, sled dogs have a better range, a better. They're a top quality athletic singer. Uh, <laughs> he would be better at the yeah. Adele then, maybe. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I actually, uh, I, I had uh, to, I got the responsibility for a border collie once, and I was listening to music, uh, this song called True Colors. Have you heard that? True Colors, yeah. yeah. Cindy Lauper, right? Yeah. yeah. And uh, the border collie suddenly froze, like freezing. And uh, so I turned the music off, and then it acted normal again. And I turned it on. And he was like hypnotized. And I think he actually reacted to the song. So I texted wow. his owner and she's like, yeah, of course, True Colors is his favorite song. But as Dallas said, you need to look at it from the dog's point of view to understand those things. And what maybe what the dog was thinking is, how did that little person get into this box? Where is this <laughs> yeah. voice coming from? Maybe. <laughs> Always got to look at it from the dog's point of view. Yeah, uh, yeah. Or... They think differently than, than we do. Mm. Yeah, maybe there's a secret that, you know, a, a dog trainer needs to look at music, right? I mean, you, you know a dog that froze because of a reaction to music, and we just met Max, who howls as a reaction to music. Maybe there's like a kryptonite effect that you, as you're passing by another dog team, if you have the right song on, maybe it'll freeze your opponent. <laughs> 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 like, I think there yes. could be something to this from a strategy standpoint. You could put them to sleep, possibly, you know? But they music, are wonderful creatures. <laughs> yeah, music soothes the savage beast. I don't know. There's, there might be something here. But how is it to to <laughs> connect with and learn to know a dog who can't talk and he, he can listen, but he can't Oh, talk. they can talk. Oh. They just talk in a different language, and you have to learn that language. And they talk with body language. Mm. They talk to each other, how they're holding their head. What is one ear pointing back, one ear forward? What's their tail doing? I mean, everybody knows how a dog wags its tail. You can tell, hey, it's happy to see you, you know? And, and there's a great amount of communication that goes, even in their eyes, they look at you, or you walk out into a dog yard in the morning, you know, and it's just getting light, and some of them are still curled up and going, oh, I'm still sleepy, but I see you there, yeah. But others are like, hey, what are we doing today? It's just a different language, and you need to speak their language. And it's just, it's a part of being a musher, and it's a great thing. Well, let's uh, go over to Nina at the checkpoint Orkebogen. Do you have any talking dogs around you now? <laughs> 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 well, at the checkpoint of Orkelbogen, I actually got the... Uh, I got hold here at checkpoint of Orkelbogen of uh, another musher, but he's in the 450 class. But this guy is really familiar to Dallas CV, Geiri Elvik of Norway. Hey! Hey! You're doing the 450 class. How is it going? 
Ja, det är efter det plan. Så resting a lot. Yeah, resting a lot. But uh, guy, you've been sleeping in the mushrooms uh, lava here. How do, how is it? Does it feel to sleep inside a warm cabin here? Yeah, that's warm. <laughs> uh, different to rest in the trail, like uh, do a lot in uh, Edith Road. <laughs> yeah, Edith Road, you said. How many times have you done the Edith Road? Uh, two times. <laughs> you have to tell the audience which dogs, which, uh, who, who, uh, whose dogs were you racing? Uh, this year? Uh, in the Edith Road. Uh, there was uh, first year uh, uh, Dallas B team. And the second was a puppy team. So you actually raised both the bee team and the puppy team of Dallas CV living as his kennel, training his dogs? Yeah. <laughs> the whole season? Uh, like uh, four months before I did it. <laughs> I don't remember right now, Guy, you have to excuse me, but did you get the rookie of the year? Yeah, the first year, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, I remember a little bit about that. Will you be racing the ID track again sometimes, do you think? Maybe. <laughs> Your secret. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, right now we don't have any plans for that. But Well, you surely need to take care of your dogs and get back to your team. And you want to say hello to Dallas in the studio, maybe? Oh. Hey, Dolos. Uh, see you after the race, maybe. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure Dolos is here that guy. Yeah, I want to hello. see him after the race. Yeah, we have Dolos here now. <laughs> Dallas is telling, saying hello to you, guy, right now. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> Look at the camera. You might see Dallas in there somewhere. <laughs> well, I have one of his uh, dog in my team, oh, Finnmark. <laughs> you have... Uh, Okay, uh, he tells he has one of Dallas' dogs in his team, actually, Dallas. Yeah, he has uh, Finnmark, right. um, okay. who he's, he was actually running in yeah, the puppy he's, team. Finnmark. He feels very good. <laughs> he just, yeah, guy, uh, Dallas, guy, Dallas is just saying it's the dog Finnmark, right? The name of the dog is Finnmark. Yeah. Yeah. Is he still in the team or have you dropped him? No, no, he is in the team. He feels very good. He feels very hard. <laughs> the lead dog? No, sometime. <laughs> well, you need to take care of your dog team and continue the 450 race, the guide. Good luck. Thank you. <laughs> so that was Guy the Elvik at the, in the 450, and uh, we'll get back to you pretty soon when we have the front runners in the 650 arriving at the checkpoint. Back to the studio. Thanks, Sina. Now, uh, this guy, Guy, is he familiar to you from my yeah, uh, Well, she's had two great guests, right? It was Rune first, yes. if I'm saying his name right. He was the Rookie of the Year in the Iditarod in 1986, finished 10th. And now we have Gear, who was the Rookie of the Year in 2016, finished 26th. So it, it's great to see these people that have already come uh, to Alaska to run that race. Yeah, it's hardcore mushers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. For sure. And they certainly must have a different perspective on all these races now. The Iditarod is a little different than than everything. Truly, uh, you know, you're out in the middle of nowhere. There's no roads uh, for nine or ten days. Or uh, in Rune's case, I think it was more like 12 days back in 1986. So he, or 13 days, I think it was. And, and he was out there for a long time moving across the Arctic. He got a chance to be in a really great kennel, though, yeah. of Susan Butcher and David Munson's. Actually, I was out there that year. He was there trying to buy puppies to breed and build that was a better team the first when I was yeah. just kind of getting into it. And and then Susan went on to win that year. And uh, And it's really interesting that he was Rookie of the Year and finished 10th, and that's a huge accomplishment. And I, I didn't put it together when he started this interview, but I remember we were all, all the mushing community was going, a handler finished 10th in the Iditarod? Even though he had Susan and David's dogs, it was just, that was a huge accomplishment at that time period. It would be today a yeah, huge accomplishment, accomplishment to come to a new race and you, and run the B team and get Rookie of the Year and be in the top 10. It kind of blew all of our minds. So, again, uh, yeah, as soon as uh, the faces popped up, we're, Greg and I are going, yeah. wait, we whoa, know whoa, whoa, this we guy. We know that guy, so, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes, and now he's the race uh, marshal. 
of the uh, yeah Rooney yeah. Rooney is Rune, yeah. is that how we say it yeah he is at the Orchid uh, no at the um, at the feminine race and Greg yeah. I think you visited Dallas's kennel when he was yeah when her. when he was uh, working with Dallas I remember I interviewed Gear at, at Dallas's kennel uh, talking about his first Iditarod and how excited he was and to come all the way from Norway and he was so excited to be working in a kennel at the caliber of, of Dallas's kennel and uh, just you know he's one of those guys his eyes are wide open as you see oftentimes with the rookies in that race you know it's the culmination of a lot of dreams that started young in one's life and so to see that kind of happen uh, and to be there and and to see their eyes wide open and the excitement that they bring it's it's awesome and it's inspiring and we see it every year with these races when when people finally get to come and run that race it's a big deal for them and maybe we should explain the terminology of a handler it's like it's it's a person who helps the main musher in the kennel and it it also is like an apprenticeship and i can think of no better way for a musher to learn than to work as a handler an apprentice in somebody's kennel that is a level above you and we all learn from each other all the time and when we're out on the Iditarod now, you sit on a bale of hay and Dallas will be talking to another musher. Or I'll be talking to a musher. And like we're saying, we're tweaking these little things or going, boy, that dog's got a nice gait. And and would that be a good dog to breed? Or what if we did this? Would you get your food prepared faster? That's part of the intrigue. But where you can really get propelled forward is to get in the, into a kennel that knows the type of event and dog that you like and learn from that musher and their family or who all's there in, in an apprentice type situation. It's a golden opportunity. I can think of no better way to learn about sled dogs than to work in one of these kennels. Is it like a jo <coughs> job, a handler? To, can you have a full-time job as a handler? You can't really have another full-time job and do that because I would describe a handler as someone who works 20 hours a day, makes no money, is cold a lot, and does every job imaginable from using tools to standing at a bandsaw cutting meat to walking puppies to getting to run dogs. You have to be a master of a lot of trades to be a musher. And the way that you do that is by basically working your butt off in a kennel, supporting that team. You're not just supporting the musher, you're, support, you're supporting the whole kennel. And it takes that 100% effort. You're going to be tired, you're going to be cold, you aren't going to make any money, but you're going to live a rich life and a rewarding life learning about these dogs. And a lot of people become handlers because they dream of running the race. Right? And so they sacrifice pay, they'll get room and board, so a place to sleep and food. And hopefully, if they can continue to develop the relationship with the kennel owner that they're with, that in time, they'll be entrusted to take a B, a B team or a second or third team down the trail for that musher as they begin to to kind of train the next up and coming generations of dogs. And so, yeah, it's it's a process for a lot of them. And we depend on them. Yeah. I mean, the year I won the quest, I attribute part of my team were my two handlers that came that year because they really took the burden off me to focus on that team. And they were a part of the team. Mm. And without great handlers, it's hard to be a great musher. Yes. And uh, we have seen that a lot of mushers has their family members as handlers. Is that because of the costs and that you have to help each other out like a family almost? S some of the time, yeah, that's it, that they're just there, but maybe the family members are interested too. But whatever is backing you, handlers, family, community, it, it, it is one big team that gets those dogs as the main focus. Yeah, nobody does it alone. Nobody does no. it alone. No. Yeah. And now we'll take another look at those dog teams out there. Over to you, Dallas. All right, we're going to take a quick look at our map here. We're starting with our top 10 um, with Ronnie Friedenlund in 10th place here. He's got a few mushers close behind him, holding a nice pace, moving down the trail. We're going to start working our way up the trail. Ahead of him, we have Nina Vollen in ninth position. We're starting to see a little bit of gap spread out here, but we got Nina Vollen in ninth position right there. Um, again, from what we know, moving well down the trail. We're going to keep working our way up. In eighth position, we have Thomas Werner, who was uh, leading earlier on in the race and has taken a little more rest and holding a nice speed now, uh, steady speed. Ahead of him, we have Daniel Hagenson. 
uh, running in seventh place and Pete Jensen in sixth position, uh, who was camping on the trail a little bit earlier on, so it makes it a little di difficult to assess traveling times when there's that camping time on the trail as well. Then we're gonna go quite some distance down the trail, and we're gonna find Rolf Johansson. Uh, Rolf, we saw not too long ago on the trail with some nice aerial footage. Um, very, very nice looking team, moving very briskly down the trail. A very a solid long distance team. Barbara Inuin in fourth position, um, then quite some distance ahead of her we have Petter Carlson in third position um, he's a little bit in a bubble with a big gap behind him and then also a large gap in front of him so he's kind of got a little bit of uh, wiggle room there we would say now we're gonna zoom quite some distance down the trail to find our lead mushers in second place we have Birgitta Ness um, very nice looking dog team traveling very steadily I would say has a solid grasp on second place at this point but she has been passed by Robert Sorley who has a phenomenal looking dog team left this uh, the previous checkpoint behind Birgitta has passed her in the process and now has put some distance in between there I think there's about uh, 1.6 kilometers roughly in between them and uh, Sorley's team has just been looking phenomenal the entire way and I'd love to go and take some uh, take a look at some live coverage of Robert Sorley on the trail here here we got uh, Robert Sorley from our helicopter. Um, he's starting to climb up some hills here, helping him out by pedaling alongside. We see all the dogs with nice tight tug lines, kind of uh, looking down the trail, working our way up here. A couple of them grabbing a mouthful of snow. It is fun to look at these teams, particularly in a climbing setting, where it's not super exciting for the dog. It's not the faster pace. It's just time to pull up a hill. And I'm liking to see that the, almost all these guys have tight lines, pulling hard. A couple of them are getting a mouthful of snow or checking on their neighbor. But all in all, this is a really solid looking dog team climbing up these hills. Yeah, and it looked like from the map, I, ha I haven't traveled this trail, so I don't know it intimately like the Iditarod Trail, but uh, there is one last big climb, one big push, it looks like, on the maps before they drop down into the checkpoint for that mandatory six. So they'll, they'll get a big climb up, get the dogs in the more pulling muscle type of gait, and then later on, there should be a downhill run coming into the checkpoint itself. Yeah, I think we're gonna see him climb a couple hundred meters here. Just looking at the, the topo map, I, I see a little bit of elevation gain going on here. So we're probably gonna see him, you know, primarily climbing. Of course, there's these little shelves and these plateaus along the way, but I think we're gonna see him climbing here for the next little bit um, as they kind of work their way up here. And then I believe it levels out just a touch. And then um, ultimately, uh, I think they are gonna have a little bit of a descent there, but I'll have to take a closer look at the later portion of this, of this run. But nice looking team, you know, and I, I'm impressed. Robert's still helping him out, still pedaling, um, taking those little breaks on the seat to kind of give his legs a rest along the way. Personally, I would love to have a ski pull in here. <laughs> it's kind of hard for me to just pedal. Um, I much prefer to use a ski pull and pedaling in unison, but that's kind of a personal thing. Some mushers are more just pedaling or running. Some mushers that we see them using two ski poles and not as much on their legs. Others, uh, you know, like myself, I like having the ski pull and, and pedaling kind of in, in tandem there. Yeah, I think you get in a lot of situations a little smoother pull uh, push with the ski pole, like you're saying. But all that's kind of an innovation in what people are doing and what their dogs are used to, the feel. But uh, it helps on these uh, on these hill climbs to just take a little bit of pressure off. It's probably a little bit too much to get off and run up one of these the entire way. But anything the musher can do to help propel the sled helps the dogs. And I think we're looking at a live picture of one of the hill climbs or, or maybe towards the summit of it. We see some wind blowing across there. Uh, maybe a good thing, cool the dogs off, get them refreshed a little bit. Uh, doesn't look like it's blowing the trail in too much. Yeah, and I love this kind of landscape. To me, there's nothing better than sled dogs out in open tundra. I, I just love yeah, that. And we got a dog team coming into view here. Yeah, Yeah, we're going to start seeing these guys climbing up this hill here. Yeah, they're getting up above tree line. We've got a little bit of a breeze coming across here. Um, yeah, man, it's, uh, I'm hoping to see what this trail looks like as the teams go by. How deep are those runners sinking in? Uh, what does the, the track look like once the, the sled's gone by? You know, so I think here we've got one of the... Uh, yeah, one of the eight dog... 
Yeah, I think these are some of the eight dog class, but I believe this is the same trail that those other mushrooms are going to be going over here in a little bit. So uh, it gives us a kind of a preview of what the mushrooms got uh, in front of them. Um, it is, I mean, it's not an easy trail. You know, this is not a trail that you can just kind of coast along, at least in this section here. This is where having a little bit better rested team, um, having a little more horsepower, you can make up a lot of time in this sort of terrain. And I wouldn't be surprised if we did see maybe the gap between Sorley and Birgitta start to grow in this terrain. Maybe it's going to close in this terrain if Birgitta's got a better setup for this. So it'll be interesting to see as the trail changes, how does that affect the dog teams? And guys, we saw a team right back so there as we look at Ralph uh, Johannesson here. Saw a team with, with a single leader. Yeah, and some dogs like to be alone. Some dogs, uh, in some teams, they only have one good leader. But it's not in real complicated trail with a really good g -Hall dog. I like having a single leader, but it also takes the stress off them and sets the pace a little bit to have a buddy. So in racing, you see mostly uh, two lead dogs together. Ralph's team here, again, look at that cadence. Look how their little faster clip. He's probably making up a little time on the team in front of him. It's just a faster, faster pace moving along here. You know, I, I don't want to say this just yet, but I have a pretty strong feeling that he left the previous checkpoint with 12 dogs on the ground. I'm seeing 11 dogs right now. I think there's a fairly good chance he's got a dog in that sled. I'm double checking this real quick, but uh, there is a good chance that you're loading up carrying a dog in here, which as we just saw from farther down the trail, where they're having some good climbing, maybe some softer trail, that may uh, affect his run time there. Um, also, if you have a dog that you're concerned about having the fuel to make it all the way to the checkpoint, and an experienced musher like Rolf who knows the trail, he knows that there's a climb up ahead, he may opt to load that dog in the sled, give it a ride so that it does have the energy needed to be able to you know, run with the team and go over those hills later on. So that's a big strategy point as a musher. If you recognize you are going to have to carry this dog at some point, the sooner you do that, the better. Uh, I'm thinking he's... Looking I'm thinking you're there, right I'm here. There's probably a dog in that sled. Yeah, just uh, mm -hmm. checking out how it is. But the strategy you're describing is that's that's a really good point to use that dog on the uphill, save it rather than haul it up. And uh, that's a good catch that he has actually possibly pulled one out. But that his action there to reach down in the sled and fool around check on the dog it, it looked like he was checking on a dog that so. looks like a musher carrying a dog to me absolutely <laughs> and, and guys talk you know, about maybe that not. If, if maybe this that dog's is... gonna need to ride the whole way but yeah. if you, like I said if it's an option that you're gonna he's gonna need to do 20 miles less of this run for it to be a good run for that dog obviously this is the terrain that you want to carry that dog and also preemptively resting the dog is is helpful too we found that if you carry a dog for 15 miles in the middle of the race they'll then be able to run 20 25 miles maybe 30 miles to the end whereas if you run them that 15 miles you might be carrying that dog for 30 miles later on so the sooner they get that rest the better especially if you got you know give them a big snack get some fuel into them let them ride in the sled and get a chance to digest all right. Okay, so Thomas. next musher up here is Thomas Warner coming past our live camera on the trail. I'm excited to see what this team looks like. It's been a little bit Whoa. since we've gotten a good view of them. That's a pretty solid looking team. They're definitely perky. They're on the charge. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, they look good, and maybe what he needed to do was to rest more back there just to get them back up on step like this, get them feeling good, get some more food and hydration in them. There's nothing wrong looking at that yep. dog team. That's a nice-looking team, and I, I think you're, you're right on there. You know, I know that uh, Thomas has really focused on the Iditarod this year. So, oh, here we have another one. Daniel Hagenson, yeah. That's bib number one, Daniel Hakinson coming by there. Another nice looking team, a little bit smaller team, um, but all in all, that's a solid team as well. I'm really impressed with how Warner Thomas did leave teams. behind him from the previous checkpoint. I'm really impressed with how Thomas's team looked, and, and that is a good point. He, I know his main goal is the Iditarod, but if he was having trouble getting him to eat, that little bit extra energy shows in how fast that team's moving, and uh, that, 
that's an impressive looking dog team. He's way back, but still. So you can kind of see down in low gear here, picture this four wheel drive. It's it, compared to Robert being out on the flats where he could use that speed. Now we get down to the grind of climbing a mountain and all they've got to do is just ease into that take it a step at a time, just like a climber on, uh, on a high mountain. And don't overexert, just get into that rhythm that gets you to the top of the mountain. Now is yeah, it harder is to be in front? Four or? wheel low. <laughs> is it, what was the question? Is it, is it harder to be in front now? For the whole, for Robert? Yeah. I don't think it's harder to be in front now. These look like good trails. We can see some wind scouring, so he's getting up in that higher elevation, uh, blowing the snow off. If it were heavily drifted trail from a big windstorm in deep snow, it would be harder to be up front. But the shots we got before, it, you can still see the trail. I don't think there's, if you know the trail and you're not going to get lost, a real disadvantage of being in the front. What he needs to do now is lengthen that lead that he has, use the speed and capability of this dog team and start getting him out there to get into the checkpoint earlier to start that six hour break. And I would agree with you on that, Greg. I think having or a uh, Bruce, sorry, having a having a nice lead in the checkpoint will certainly make it more comfortable for him there. But uh, at the same time, they, when they leave that checkpoint, they still have a long ways to go to the finish line. And I would be looking at how do I use every step of the trail between here and the finish line as solidly as possible. You know, and if that means taking a little bit easier up the hill, I'm just trying to look at the opposing view or the, um, another aspect of this. Um, you know, sometimes if his team's strength is moving quickly on a better trail, maybe you just get them through the mountain stuff and then leaving that, <clears throat> that last checkpoint and having that last haul to the finish line, having a good pace from there to the finish you know that that's another aspect of this but it is a nice looking dog team climbing this hill and having the right pace up the hill is important as a as a human runner as well here when i hit hills you see your heart rate spike as soon as you start climbing up them and if i'm doing a very long run i'm often going to walk up the hills keep my heart rate a little bit lower or at least even with what my heart rate is on the level ground and then pick up a little time on the downhill and we saw Robert Orly, or Sorley earlier being able to really lengthen this team out like we see right now they've got that upper end speed so he has the ability of making up some time going down the other side because all these dogs are comfortable at a little faster pace these are spectacular images by the way I mean to be able to to sit at home and watch this live and watch the leader of the race and watch the changing environment right they're down in the the trees here and the timber and then to to juxtapose that against where Robert is right now up in that wide open windswept territory is fascinating yeah. Pete Johnson going by our live camera now and another nice looking dog <clears throat> team cruising by um, you know, he's not too far behind Hagenson and Warner, who went by our camera here a little bit ago. But another solid-looking dog team cruising down the trail. Yeah, I'm not sure how many miles they have up on the mountains like that. But uh, I like that country where you get the dogs up and it's great to have the helicopter view so you can really see it in scale of the country that they're going through and in this wind drifted country and uh, I, I like dogs in that type of landscape. It's much like the Bering Sea coast or going from uh, from old woman into Uniclete on the Iditarod. Uh, little bits of timber wind being the predominant factor in the condition of the snow that you're traveling on but it just gives us the opportunity to see the climbs to see these hills in this open landscape yeah this does uh, kind of bring me back to you know outside of shack tulik actually heading towards unilocleet there's a couple places we're hitting those those kind of wind blowing tops of the hills there and climbing up um, this is this is nice country uh, it's like you said it's kind of what seems like it seems like this is where a dog team belongs, right? And also think of the diversity they've had on this run, getting to go through that forested area and getting up here. This has been a really beautiful run for these guys. And uh, it's been a little warm for them, I'm sure. But up here, they've got a nice breeze to, to help kind of keep everybody cooled off. 
Yeah, that does help the dogs. And I think then once they come off here, we'll pretty much have that downhill run into the checkpoint and we'll probably see the speeds pick up a little bit. But good point, Dallas. It's still approximately 88 to 90 miles to the finish line. You don't want to get over exuberant, come off of one of these mountains, letting the dogs overrun and then lose that edge by using that ener ener uh, energy incorrectly or risking hurting a dog's shoulder. So there's still a ways to go, but 90 miles, you start to feel the finish, you start to smell the finish line and feel that it's out there, but you still have to manage that team. It's not over till it's over. And that image there showing some of the expanse of that country uh, up at the top, near the top of that summit. 18 kilometers from the next checkpoint, about 11 miles now for Robert Sorley. So a little over an hour, he'll be there. Yep. Mm -hmm. And it looked like they were going uh, over 1,000 meters above sea level. So uh -huh. they're pretty far up. And they're headed for Oracle, Oracle Bog in here. And so there's a live look, and those are teams from the 450, I believe, sitting there, right? Yeah, these are beautiful images. I, I agree. That's Th fantastic. This is the landscape sled dogs belong in, in my mind. All through the Arctic, circumpolar. And obviously there's a trail there, but in your mind, you can just imagine, you know, 100 years ago, people doing these things by dog team, not quite sure what's o up over that summit but again somebody traveling up these wide open expanses on dog team and and just with a sense of adventure right it's the old adage i do it because i want to see what's over the, the top of that hill or what's on the next the next horizon or also because i'm looking for food to feed myself that, yeah. and that's part of what these dogs have provided to people over time is more exposure more travel in the country to look essentially for food to feed your family so they're working dogs and in their history they provided a great service to us just like horses did in temperate climates and dallas i, I would imagine somebody uh, of your physicality your age would look at hills in a race and think i have an advantage over a lot of these competitors that are older in this race so i, I wonder is your mentality towards a hill a little different than robert's mentality towards facing these hills or mountains yeah, I don't want to speak for Robert on this, but um, I do feel that we can, we, my team and I, can make up a lot of team or time in these steeper hills and these softer conditions where your ability to be physical does help the team. And I think part of that is reflected in the team. I like training in hills. I like having a lot of climbs. I've always had a strong hill team. And I, you know, I, I love passes like this, especially at night when you see a headlamp, you know, a mile ahead of you up on this hill. And you're like, I bet I can catch him by the time we crest the top. And sure enough, you catch up with him. And it's kind of rewarding for me. And I, I think the dogs do enjoy catching up with another team. I don't think they're keeping track of what position you're in, but I think they do like seeing another team out there. So yeah, I, I think that it's an advantage for me at the end of the race to be able to help the dogs up these, up these hills. The human is by far the heaviest item on that sled. In, in my team's case, I usually weigh much more than the sled and all the contents of that sled combined. So the ability to get off that sled, you don't have to push the sled. You just have to take your body weight off the sled and help them up those hills. It's a huge asset. It's that much less work your team has to do. Now the key is to having enough energy at that point late in the race to be able to help them. And that means not overdoing it earlier in the race. And you might look at this and go, well, those dogs aren't really going that fast. You know, they're just kind of trotting along. I guarantee you, when you step off that sled yeah. and you're trying to run and keep up yeah, with them, it's tough. It's, you really got to put it out. It's, they're going at a pace that you really have to be running. Well, plus you, you're running in sand in essence, right? Because you're not running on concrete or a sidewalk. You're off the sled running in soft snow. Mm -hmm. It's a difficult. And your your footwear is a little different than if you were jogging up this hill as well, right? You know, when I'm when I'm running a, in a marathon, my shoes weigh, you know, ounces. True. <laughs> and you have a, a very light pair of shorts and maybe a t-shirt. Out here, it's not uncommon to have 30, 40 plus pounds of clothing on your body. You've got these big heavy boots and then they say that every pound on your feet is the equivalent to 10 pounds on your back right so when you look at these mushers in their large boots that are keeping them warm out here um, that's that's a lot of weight on their feet then we have all the stuff in our pockets on a long distance race like this anything that you want to have thawed 
is up against your body, especially on the Iditarod where we don't have any handler assistance and the, the items in the depot bag, like the foot ointment, can't be thought. Now we're back to our live camera on the trail. We have Nina Vollen coming around the corner. Fast pace there. Yeah, they look great. Yep. Real, real smooth looking. And I'm not surprised. Nice I'm not surprised to see all these teams looking very strong. Little subtle differences like we've discussed, but these are the top teams in the race, so you kind of expect that. And well rested, well cared mm -hmm. for. And a big team here. All 12, yeah, that's a nice looking, nice looking team right there coming by. And, and again, in the top 10 of this race, clearly being very competitive, despite not being all the way up in the front. And that's another thing to remember here, is there's competition all the way back in this race. So it almost, I mean, looking at the, the sheets, almost any position on this race, you have good competitors, experienced mushers, and very strong dog teams, either a few positions ahead of you or behind you. So this race is gonna play out all the way to the end with teams competing with the group of mushers around them with a similar, uh, teams with similar ability. Now we have some viewers wondering, um, here. yeah, wondering about if the whether the helicopter is affecting the dogs. Good question. Good question. I guess since I've worked in a helicopter before, uh, covering the Iditarod years ago, if you get too close with the, the helicopter, it distracts the dogs because they hear this big thing going on. And I always tried to explain before the race when we were using a helicopter to the pilot, there is a distance at which we should respect and not interfere. So there's some trail etiquette. And that also applies to people on snow machines. Uh, Greg and I explained to our camera guys when we're out on the trail, there's always, we want to share the story of the musher and the race and the dogs with the public, but you don't want to interfere with the race there's also a proper time to talk to a musher and a time not to talk to them when they're dealing with their dogs news people camera people should give them have the respect to let them deal with that and it's the same in a helicopter but see now he's drawing back yeah. so greg can explain more how these cameras work you could be a half mile away and get a close-up yeah maria so look the images it looks like the, the helicopter's right on top of the dogs, but these cameras that they put in these helicopters have such the ability to zoom, in some cases, a half mile or three quarters of a mile. There you see the helicopter in the air, and if they can pull out from the ground quickly, maybe you can kind of see where, where Robert is and truly how far that helicopter is. But as the pilot, if you see snow drift, right? if you see wind drift, if you get too close to the ground, you'll see the wind blow. So you have indications up there and you can also watch the dogs. If their heads start to look up, you know you're too close and you can back off. There's no reason for that helicopter to be super close because of the phenomenal uh, technology that's aboard and the ability to zoom. So I don't think it affects it at all. And you can see the distance As a musher, here. I would say it here, we, you know, I've, I've had helicopters following us and everything else, and I would much prefer a helicopter. And just like Greg was saying, they have the ability to carry very large cameras and zoom in. Um, I would much prefer to have a helicopter at a distance zooming in, covering the dog team, than a drone. And I have seen dogs react yeah. to drones because it's a much smaller camera. It's much, you know, smaller equipment, and they that's have true. to get a little bit closer. Closer, and you're absolutely right. If you see the dog start looking up, kind of looking at the, the camera, then it's a good indication that maybe you need to back off a little bit. But I, I don't mind having a helicopter out there as far as the dogs. It is, at some point, as a musher, you feel obligated to run up the hills. You're like, oh, they're watching me. I don't want the yeah. people back home seeing me sitting on my sled up this hill. So that can be a thing as a musher, but I don't think it affects the dog so much. And the, the one thing I would throw in here that with helicopters uh, covering dog races, so Robert's out in front. Whoever's in second and third and fourth may not know exactly how far out in front he is, but the helicopter gives the, the, the chasers the indication, okay, well, I know he's up over that knoll or he's probably a mile away because the helicopter gives him that. So, but you know, th that's one of the gives and takes that, that I think everybody has to understand when we wanna bring events like this to the world and to open up the lifestyle and allow people to kinda C kind of pose in you got to give something to get others right and so the fact that we're able to fly this helicopter and bring to the world these images right now is well worth uh, the downsides of it and there's only a few of those
But so here we're watching Brigitte starting to get out into the open country here, breaking up above the tree line. Uh, so it's going to be interesting to see how this team's traveling. You know, now that we get a big open view of them um, as they're, you know, up on the hillside, I think it's a pretty good indication when you see them climbing. It says a lot about a dog team as well. And, you know, we saw Robert's t team, uh, their pace drop obviously quite a bit as they start this steep climb. And I'm seeing Brigitte... Dogs are looking good. Everybody's stepping out nicely, um, leaning into the harnesses. It's hard to compare one team to the next because you see that drifting on the ground there. I, I want to say that this team might be a little bit, little bit slower, but again, this could be a steeper slope than when we saw saw Robert there. Yeah, you can it, tell this the could be. Them on the nose here. Yeah, this is a, probably a pretty steep pitch, and that's a good catch, Greg. That you could see the drift and the wind is a little bit into their face, and that tends to slow them down a little bit too. But still lining out and going up the hill fine this is when i think dogs you see them look around a little bit they want to know are we doing okay or is this this is kind of tougher than what we did before and it's really important to encourage them at that point don't drive them say okay get up there guys mm -hmm. go good boys you know like yeah this is okay you're going slower but now look she's past yeah. that steep pitch and boom right back into the to the gate, the traveling yeah, that, gate that, that they can That was a great maintain. look at that. And we should point out when they crest the top of the summit, it's all downhill to Oracle Bogget, mm -hmm. right? And so these dogs will, will pick up pace and they'll fly into this checkpoint when they reach the top. One but of the that, cool things I just saw there is with these, with those little drifts you guys are pointing out, we can see from the leaderboard on the side that Brigitte is only 1.7 kilometers behind Robert, and already there was no, I mean, where the drifts are coming across, you, there's no sled tracks. So this yeah. is going to make it a pretty even trail for each team. Being in lead in these conditions doesn't mean that you're necessarily breaking the trail. Being in the second position doesn't mean that you have a broken trail. So it's, it's one of the nice things I've experienced racing here in Norway is that while the drifts and the blowing snow gets annoying, it does keep it a pretty even trail with just, you know, not even two kilometers in between them. The drifts that Robert had to break, Brigitte is going to have to break as well. Yeah, that's an interesting point, too. But your question about the helicopter, that is, you know, it's a thing all the press has to deal with and learn. You have the chance to get around these mushers in the heat of the competition. And it does, you do want to share the story. And that's the beauty of this helicopter, getting to see these teams run for a long extended period and really see what mushers and dogs do. But as I said, like, I would tell a pilot before we ever left covering the Iditarod, if you ever see a dog look at us, you need to get that thing farther away. There's just no need for that kind of interference. And I'm very protective in our roles of the teams and the mushers because I know what it's like to be on those sleds and feel so protective of the dogs. Now we're watching Thomas Warner come by uh, our camera a little bit farther down. Watch, get, I love this view through the elder trees here. This is a really cool shot. Uh, about to pass underneath that bridge there. These guys are moving along nicely, and we talked about it briefly before, you know, backing off, um, taking a little more rest, getting that speed back up in there. I think that was a good move on Thomas's part. I think recognizing, all right, we're not going to win this race. Um, you know, and he recognized that fairly early on, and then back off, use it as a training run. I think it was nice that he's, you know, he's going to take a try, he's going to make an effort at it, and if something doesn't go well, you're going to back off much more easily. And that's just as a musher, knowing that this is your B race. This is not your A race. This isn't the big event for the year. So yeah, we'll go give it a shot, and if everything goes smoothly, maybe we win it. But if we start seeing issues, we're going to back off, and we're going to have a solid team for our main race. But this is a nice-looking team here. And that that's just one little hill coming off that river but that more rest in that dog team they hesitated less on that hill than any team in front of him which shows the level of energy they hardly broke stride at all where the others kind of hesitated yeah. or slowed down and that's that rest that he's put in them yeah that team is charging there and Thomas obviously well, a, must be uh, feeling better as well. There, Bruce, um, I was just thinking the same thing. It's like these guys rolled right up it. There was no break in the speed. It was a very smooth climb. They crested over the top and right back into that fast pace. I think this is a very, very nice looking team. And, you know, he obviously is not going to be winning this race. But I think Thomas should be uh, pretty excited as he's looking forward to, you know, cr crossing the Atlantic and going to the Iditarod here in just a couple, couple. well, I, I can guarantee you it's going to feel like short weeks between now and race time.
Is this or this? back over to yeah. Brigitte to climb in the mountain here, uh, up in that open country. And I, I love these broad shots where you can actually get the kind of the scope of the terrain that we're traveling through. That's one of the greatest feelings as a musher when you're cruising along and you, you know, you cross a mountain range early in the morning and you're traveling all night and right before or all day and right before the sun goes down, you look back and that mountain range is just forever behind you. And it's like, holy cow, did we actually cover that distance today? <laughs> All right, I think we got uh, Daniel Hagenson here. Yep, that would be bib number one, Daniel Hagenson coming by our trail cam. Little more casual pace, but everybody's looking really solid there. And I would imagine yeah, by nice this looking... point in the race, you know, the, the mushers are sleep deprived. They're really, especially this time of day, late in the afternoon, it's going to start, uh, the sun is going to start setting. The adrenaline, right, has worn off, and now you're kind of into the grind of this race, knowing that uh, the, the, ra the real race is about to begin. Yeah, but yeah, so here we see a team slow down a little bit more and he's having to give the sled a bit of a push. Still, he moved right up that hill, no problem. But comparing it to Thomas's team, there's definitely a little less power here. Now, Thomas did make up about 15 minutes to catch up with Daniel um, from leaving the last checkpoint. And then since he's passed him, he's made up a little bit more time. He's a, a couple minutes ahead here, I think. Well, one of the Almost things we should point out. three minutes ahead of him at this point point out here greg is because we keep talking about the mushers being sleepy the mushers get less sleep and less rest than the dogs do right so that's that goal of get into a checkpoint feed your dogs and let them sleep so a musher might capture an hour here and there but the dogs are actually getting in a six hour break they should get at least four five hours well four hours of sleep i mean it takes time to feed them deal with booting preparing to leave all of that but the dogs are, are, have a lot more sleep than the mushers ever do. Yeah, with just the, the one six hour mandatory rest to this point, and obviously they're all moving to the final mandatory six hour rest, they'll get a couple, three hours of sleep there. The mushers haven't had much sleep to this point, and they won't, uh, all the way to Oracle Buggin. A really focused, well, planned out rest stop could gain at this next stop a musher should get three hours of sleep if you're getting less than that to me you're unorganized but I, i've also been in the situation covering the i did a ride where if you don't sleep for a few days then you lay down to sleep and you have a hard time sleeping right your body gets in a rut it gets into a position where then it's hard to sleep well because your head is processing everything you're yeah. thinking oh this dog didn't eat maybe i should get up and give him a little bit more or what's my competition if your head gets into that spinning like you could do in any job any competition you can't go to sleep even though you're tired and since we are in norway and there are mushers that someday would like to go to the Iditarod, I would just use this view and this opportunity to say, if you're going to run Iditarod, yeah. you aren't gonna be in this landscape that we're looking at right now, going up over a mountain and down. You are going to be in this open tundra landscape for hundreds, hundreds of miles. And, hundreds and, hundreds. and wind is a real factor. And you're, you need to train leaders that comfortably can run in this landscape. You get in this going to the community or the checkpoint. There isn't a community of Iditarod. You get in it going over the Alaska range. And from the time you shortly after leaving Caltag all the way to the finish line, this is the landscape we live and travel in. And wind is a major factor in this kind of country and I, I don't know exactly what the number is but you know 60 65 percent of that trail you, they travel down frozen lakes and rivers which are often wind swept uh yeah territories. The, the yukon river can be yeah. really windy as well so wind leaders are important all right we got a live shot of petra johnson here coming through the tinset uh trail cam out there just taking a look at my dog team here or his dog team <laughs> uh, two four <laughs> six eight ten eleven nice looking dogs here yeah I, mean, I i can't help it sorry when i see a dog team i zoom in and i'm looking at each one here trying to watch these guys as close as possible sometimes it's hard to 
talk and watch a dog team at the same time, but I guess I'm getting practice now. Uh, they cruise right up that hill very, very smoothly, and obviously we see Pete there hopping off, running, pushing. He's got a ski pole tucked in in a nice spot right behind him that's easy to access there. Makes it easy to scoop up that ski pole and help the dogs out and then stow it when you have to do some technical sled driving or you want to get off and run beside the sled without having to wield the ski pole. But that's another nice-looking dog team. Yeah, and it should be pointed out that his training run is still going well. Yeah, <laughs> yeah he's on the top. Yeah, yeah. 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 He told us, uh, what, two days ago that this was a training run for him. And so, well, really good job training him. Yep. No, you were just talking about uh, how much of the Iditarod has open country, like what we were watching uh, Sorley and Brigitte run through a little farther down the trail than where we are right now in this shot. But um, I think you'll uh, find if you stay here in Norway long enough, there's a lot of very, very good dog teams when it comes to traveling in that open high country. You know, we haven't seen that much of it in this race, but I do know up in the, the Finnmark region um, and running that race, there's a lot of open, windswept, drifted stuff. And I've been honestly thoroughly impressed with the quality of lead dogs not just in the professional teams but in all the teams the recreational teams it seems like all of them have numerous lead dogs that going off trail is no big deal I think that's partially because a lot of the training areas for the dogs they are not allowed to have snowmobile access there's just not a snow machine culture here as much mm -hmm. and so the idea of having a snow machine trail is a little more foreign. So a lot of these mushers, every run they go out and do, they're breaking their trail again. And I've been really impressed with how many good lead dogs for just off-trail work. It's more of a day-to-day -day normal part of their, their mushing experience, whether or not they're racing. So that's been pretty cool to see. Interesting. But is the feminine race more hilly than uh, I did, Arad? I have never compared to know how the two races stack up to each other with hills. The biggest hill race I know of, well, the stage race in Wyoming that's going on right now just started. It is incredibly mountainous and really steep. The Yukon Quest is much more of a, a hill mountain race than the Iditarod is. So they all vary and, and they all have different challenges, but the hilliest rate, well, Dallas, you run both. I mean, the, when you talk about a hill in the Yukon Quest, it's a real long climb. Uh, in Iditarod, there are some big hills, but they don't go on as extensively. And then the Rocky Mountain stage race there in Wyoming, it's just, it seems like the whole course is uphill and you don't know why, it's always uphill. <laughs> Well, I've never run the, the stage race there, but as far as the Yukon Quest and the Iditarod, yeah, I think you're right, Bruce. The, the Quest has some long kind of gradual, I don't want to say gradual, they can be pretty steep as well, but long climbs. But one nice thing about it is the team can kick into low gear, kind of like what we're seeing with Brigitte's team here. Yeah, they're traveling, it's a hill, and they're going to be climbing for some time. And the Iditarod, we do see a lot of really sharp hills where the dogs have to, you know, dig in and put it in a very low gear, and then accelerate down that hill um, on the other side. I'm thinking even early in the Iditarod, leaving, uh, leaving Finger Lake. Man, some of those mm. climbs are just brutal, right? Incredibly right. steep, and they're not super long, but they are steep climbs. So the Iditarod has a lot of little climbs up and down, up and down, whereas uh, the Yukon Quest, it seems to be more notable because they are mountain passes that you're going over, and you do hit a higher you know, top elevation there. So we're seeing Brigitte kind of getting down behind the sled there, trying to minimize her wind resistance. Um, you know, when Start I'm watching musture, yeah. posture here, I think they probably do have a bit of a wind uh, working against them in some of these places. You know, obviously she's cognizant of that, and there are times that it it's more effective to get small and hide behind your sled and reduce the wind resistance. That's a more effective way of helping the team than trying to pedal while standing up. There's been many times that I'm working my tail off, standing there pedaling and ski pulling, and I sit down down to take a break and my team speeds up because I'm no longer producing that wind resistance with my body. So here we've got uh, the trail shot of Robert Sorley getting up towards the pass on this mountain. I see the wind is a little bit stronger up here and there's going to be some drifts and he can have some comfort knowing that Brigitte is going to have to bust these same drifts because they probably will reform by the time she arrives. And again getting down out of the wind just to lessen that resistance and there's places that is the very best thing to do but even with this wind those dogs just maintaining a nice steady pace 
It's yeah, not they're, really they're a heavily this different trail very very well. Yeah. It's not really a heavily blown in trail. It's just a trail. The dogs you can still see the tracks where the trail's been put in, but it's it's a trail where they have to pay attention to find the best footing. It looks like an area mm -hmm. where the wind may blow quite often so that the snow doesn't have an opportunity to really bury and, and to get deep. Yeah, it wouldn't yeah, get deep and, and it There packs. is a good base yeah. here. Yeah, good base. Yeah, and yeah. having this base makes all the difference in the world because it, it's one thing for your foot to sink down through two or three or even four inches of snow and hit a solid base and then propel your body forward off that base and ultimately propel the sled forward using that base. But if this was a trail where, you know, they were sinking into their shoulder, you know, that is where it really gets into just a slog, slow walk in that type of terrain. And that is something we've seen farther north in Norway at the Finnmark race a lot, just deep, deep sugar snow. So I'm happy to see a hard base here. That's going to make it easier for them. The main thing that those drifts do, it seems like, is it breaks whatever glide you have with a sled, right? So you have some amount of glide, and then it hits that sticking point, and the dog's got to pull the sled through that little drift. And then right when they get back up on step, a glide again, you know, maybe 15 to 50 feet later, there's going to be another drift that brings the speed back down, and it, it does make it more challenging. It's just spectacular to me, and I'm not a musher. We, we can never take for granted what we're watching in these images, these dog teams moving through wind and blowing snow like this. Like this is, for, for much of the people on the globe, this is a major storm that these dogs are, like they would be running for shelter, right? And yet you have dog teams <laughs> running across these environments through blowing snow like this. This is impressive to watch. And of course, the fact that it's Robert Sorley as well is, is really cool. But wow, th this is majestic stuff right here. I love this. Well, and they may be running through, running for shelter, but it just looks like a fun day to me. <laughs> exactly, actually. right? I mean, it's a, it's a mentality. A total different thing. And not Before knowing this terrain. Before we move to the shot, guys, I just wanted to draw your attention to one thing there. You see with that crosswind, we're watching Robert pedaling on the left-hand side, on the uphill side, and he's also having to muscle that sled over because the wind was actually pushing the sled off the other side of the trail there. And this is where it can be really physically challenging for a, especially a tired musher. Not only are you pedaling, trying to push the sled forward, but you're also having to use that core strength and your upper body strength, kind of twisting the front of the sled back onto the trail. And that can be exhausting terrain, getting over a mountain pass like that. I'm, I'm pretty sure Robert's going to be happy to get on the downhill side of this thing and maybe take a seat and uh, catch his breath a little bit. Yeah, and it looked like, I, I, not knowing the exact trail mile for mile, but that he was actually cresting the summit of the pass there. He was dropping down, so we might see him pick up speed a little bit. But... Uh... It, it looked like the terrain was dropping off there. And, and yeah, that sled bag works almost like a sail on a boat, and it does want to blow it sideways, like you're saying. And it's the musher's job to keep it on the trail. Now, now we're, here we're going back to the 10 set camera um, with Nina Volen coming by here. I want to take a look at this dog team as they kind of poke their way through the alders here and come up that little crest. We've seen all the teams come over there. Got a little bit of irregularity in a couple dogs' gait, but man, this is a pretty nice looking gang all in all. Those front six dogs are all very evenly man, just kind of trotting that. along, covering the ground. They had another team that uh, she ought to be proud of this gang. They're looking, looking pretty nice. And some of these teams may be back a little bit just because they took longer rest at various points, but they did that to maintain the team looking like this. It, it is about speed, but it, it may not be that this team is actually that much slower, but that they had to take more rest to keep the team at this performance level, which is exactly what a musher should do. Man, they're really, 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 a lot of really nice dog teams yeah. in this room. And look at this nice, this is Arctic sun to me. This is northern light, that low angle sun highlighting the dogs. They dig right in and pull up the hill. That's, yeah, they're, that's a nice looking gang for sure. Yep, she didn't even Solid step off the team. sled. <laughs> she just rode it to the top, didn't even slow them down. That's a pretty cool shot right there. I, I like that lineup. All these guys, kind of they're just fast beaten little feet going down the trail. Um, 
Yeah, I think this is a, a, a solid dog team. And again, in a good position in the race, you know, not at the front front of the race. And I think what you were just touching on there a second ago is a really important point. You know, it's so easy for mushers uh, that are trying to work their way up in the Iditarod or any of these big races to watch the schedules and how these lead mushers run the race. But what's really important is not the, you know, X number of miles and then Y amount of rest. What's really important is what is that relative to that dog team? You know, is that dog team running at 50% um, of their ability? You know, and so for a, a musher with a less experienced team or a less quality team, if they did the same exact runs, that another musher can do easily, that would be you know 70% of the team's ability, and that's too much. So for me personally, when I started racing the Iditarod competitively, the mushers that I was researching and following were Jesse Royer and Sam and Ramey Smith, quite frankly, because I felt like those were the mushers that had comparable dog teams to myself that were very good mushers and maximized those teams. It would have been a mistake for me to look at Lance Mackey, who was winning the race, because what his team was doing was not even relevant to my team because it was a different quality of team. If I had tried to copy him, we would have had very, very, very little success. <laughs> Back up towards the top of the hill, we have Brigitte Ness and a nice looking dog team, just, just choguing along, going up this climb. You know, you can kind of see here, this team is kind of settled into the climb, climb uh, gear a little bit better. When they first got up above tree line, we saw a lot of dogs looking around, kind of backing off a little bit. Kind of, I think the question here is, is this okay that we're going this speed? You know, we've been doing nine miles an hour or so. Now we're slowing down. Are we stopping? Are we still going? Now they've become accustomed to the climbing here and everybody seems to have settled in to a nice pace going up the hill. Again, looking at it from the dog's point of view, and I, I agree totally. Often they will look back going, are, are you wanting us to stop? Or they're not equating, are you on the brake? Or they know they're on a hill, but all at once the traveling pace has changed and they're just checking in, looking back like, yeah, what's going on here? And so again, looking at it from the dog's point of view, and then once they realize if they were traveling at this pace all the time, then they relax into that and go, well, it seems like we're doing good. The musher's happy with us and we'll just chug along here in low gear. So confirmation, confirmation from the musher is very important for the Confirmation dog. from the musher is important to just, you know, that thing of good boy, good girl, just, yeah, you're doing great, happy voice. We're doing fine. And then they'll settle into that. Yet, if you were back there going, come on, get up there, you know, and they're going, well, I'm, I'm giving you everything I've got, then they get confused. So it's, again, you, you spoke about language before, that they may not hear your words, but they understand your tone, and it's important to be encouraging to them. According to the tracker, Robert Surley, about 13 kilometers or about eight miles from the checkpoint. And so explain to us on downhills, do you allow the dogs to go full bore? I would assume they'd want to really run hard down the hill, or do you hold them back and, and try to keep them in control? Well, as we heard a lot of the mushers say in the bear grease race, which is very up and down hilly, you never want them to totally go full bore because when they, with the dog, when they are running at, at a lope, they're coming down on those front shoulders and downhill accentuates that more. Throw, think of yourself running downhill. Each, each step, each leg, it gets a bigger impact than it does on the flat. You know, you can feel yourself overrunning yourself, so to speak. So, no, you don't want to just let them go dead out. You want to maximize the speed that you can. But again, it's not about going as fast as you can right from the beginning of the race. And it's the same running downhill. It's managing that speed and protecting those dogs and let them get settled in. And you'll want to get on that drag brake a little bit and not have them overstretch their shoulders and front legs particularly. I wouldn't say that there's any one set speed that is too fast going down a hill or one t speed that's right for all teams, but I think every team does have a maximum safe speed for da for descents. And that's of course gonna be affected either positively or negatively by the condition of the trail that they're running, running on. Um, and that dog team's condition at this point in the race. So I'm just thinking, you know, if you had a fur Rondi team, they would laugh at you saying that you don't want to go over, you know, 12 or 13 miles an hour down a hill. And other teams would say it's ridiculous to go over 11 miles an hour down the hill. And it's all relative to the dog team. 
So there's no, never an easy definite number or an easy answer for these questions. But especially at this point in the race, the more fatigued the team is, the more tired their muscles might be, the less fuel those muscles have in them, the slower safe speed going down the hill. And I think that's something that we've noticed between Robert Sorley's team here and some of the others is that his team looks very comfortable stretching out, going a little bit faster down the hills. And I think he can safely have a little bit higher downhill speed than some of the teams behind him. And again, I mean, just thinking as a human runner, I love to run fast through a forested trail going down a hill after having climbed up the mountain. But if your legs are really tired, your chance of taking a misstep, the faster you go, the more likely you're going to wipe out running down that hill. So if you're tired and this is the end of a 20 mile training run for me personally, I'm going to be taking it pretty easy. If it's a five mile fun run for me, I'm going to go pretty fast down that hill. So it, that's going to be very personal to each musher, but each musher does have a speed limit for how fast they'll let their team go going down this hill. And another aspect, Greg, good point in how fast you'd let them go. Dallas, just real briefly reference but its key is the condition of the trail. Now, if you know this is a hard packed, consistent surface, you might let them go a little bit more, but we're in a wind blown area, so maybe it's hard. And then every uh, thousand meters or so, there's a drift mm -hmm. and it gets soft and they stumble. So imagine running on a, so on a yeah. sidewalk like surface and then there's a big sand drift across there. So you don't want them to stumble when they're going downhill like that. So paying attention to the trail and particularly these wind drifted trails they'll get hard trail and then a soft place and you don't want them going into those soft areas at a top uh, top speed type of low whatever that is whether it's eight nine ten fourteen miles an hour all right we're we're getting a great shot of uh brigitte coming up here towards the crest of this uh, or the pass of the mountain here Looks like a, at this very moment, maybe a little bit less wind, or at least less snow in the wind than when Robert went by. Uh, well, there it picks up again. And you know how it is up in the high country. Uh, you get these gusts of wind and then a few seconds of a lull and then another gust. But look at these dogs' feet going through that drift. Robert was through there just a few minutes ago, and this light, dry snow filled that drift right back in again. But these guys are looking pretty comfortable here that they're, now that they're getting towards the top. Everybody's pulling. Again, a bunch of smiling sled dogs there. And you'll see that in a low speed gait, you know, in this low gear, this team equals out more. Where, where she was on a faster trail, we saw a difference in individuals within the team. And part of that is it's harder for some dogs to maintain a high speed. But at a low speed, they kind of all equalize out. So here we could have the stress and confusion of where's the where's the trail it also in all fairness can be the distraction of the dogs of seeing a cameraman there and thinking oh are we making a stop or is it over is the trail marker over there and we can see her out showing them where the trail is so distractions along yeah, the trail really? particularly with a tired dog team become an issue and it's kind of hey, i just want to touch on what we what we just saw here um you know the dogs got a little confused there getting off off the trail you know kind of heading in the in the wrong direction a little bit um you know and this can be very challenging for the lead dogs because everything does look similar and drifted in she also took the booties off just one or two dogs there or one or two feet there as they're starting to get balled up with snow and only a few kilometers we're seeing about 10 kilometers to the checkpoint from here you know they're at this point you don't want to take off a booty that's a problem and here again dogs swinging over um maybe a little bit confused on which direction <laughs> some communication errors there um so I have to call them back over this way, get them back on the trail. Now there is about a 12 minute difference between Robert Sorley coming through here when we saw him a little bit ago, well, about 12 minutes ago, to Brigitte coming through here now. The last time we saw him on trail, I think there was a four minute difference. So that gap is starting to grow. And also those dogs are turning downwind, you know, so you can see the direction of the wind from the spin drift there. So it's easy for them to just go, well, hey, if we go this way, Again, looking at from the dog's point of view, we won't be going into this win. Mm -hmm. So it's that confidence. And maybe a little more tired team, whereas Roberts just went right through. So a lot One of One thing factors. that I'm seeing here is that 
there's also we got a cameraman here with a snowmobile probably out here filming the race and that can also be confusing we talked about this before are these humans that we're supposed to follow or are these humans that we're supposed to run by and you see this tan dog he's kind of looking over there wondering if the cameraman and the snow machine is where they're supposed to be going the black dog on the left hand side seems a little more convinced that the trail's over there but isn't confident enough to to drag the other lead dog over this is a situation so there the black one's going to pull him over to the trail Get them lined out. Um, this is a situation where having one lead dog up there, having the right lead dog up there um, might make this a lot easier. For me, before it's a big stressful situation for the dogs, I would take that uh, the tan lead dog, put it in the single spot or the open spot, uh, two positions in front of the sled, and get through this section with just the one lead dog. If you want to switch them back later, you can. But that definitely is a, a factor. This is where you want to have the right lead dog in front. And a lot of times, if, yeah, if you're coming up on, if you've run a race a, no, a number of times and you know there's a particularly challenging piece of trail coming up, finding the trail or out on the ice or something like crossing the, you know, Gullivan Bay, you'll go. put your best leaders up there. And some dogs are trail leaders and other dogs are open country leaders. And once they know, then they're off and going. But if you want to avoid giving away those minutes, sometimes just the quick stop to switch a couple dogs around saves you a tremendous amount of time in the long run. He was now looking a little bit over his shoulder. Along. Yeah. That's a pretty neat shot right there when you get the, the snow blow right at the, their head height. Yeah, so now they're back on course and cruising along, but it can be a little bit confusing. We still see their, our tan lead dog looking back, wondering if, uh, if the folks that they just passed were the direction they were supposed to have gone. But we see Brigitte getting them lined out. And one nice thing to see here is through it all, obviously there's a little bit of confusion, a little bit of frustration on the part of Brigitte, you know, like, come on guys, let's, let's focus on the trail here. But through it all, what the dogs experienced was a, a little stop, they're rolling in the snow, we see wagging tails. You know, so for them, it's not a big stressful thing. And again, they don't know necessarily that it's a race. Brigitte is the one that has a watch and can tell time, the dogs can't. Yeah, the dogs might be going, hey, uh, looking back, going, hey, did, you might have just missed the checkpoint there. I saw those people there. <laughs> you know, you're going to miss your nap here. And, and I'm reminded by watching this, and, and I'm always reminded that I think it's important that the viewers understand that we see these teams during a race. But there's the other days throughout the year that a musher, when it's 30 below, you have to take a team out and practice. When it's blowing 40 miles an hour, you've got to take your team out and practice. Like a wind leader isn't just born a wind leader, right? You've had to train them to do these things and be in wind yourself. Sure, it's the job Absolutely. for them. And yeah. it's, again, I'll put it back in human terms. If they throw you in a job, any job, that you haven't had an opportunity to learn, you feel insecure in that, you feel stress. But if you have an opportunity to learn an occupation or learn a job and then be there when push comes to shove, you know what to do, no matter what that job is in any field you pick. And it's the same with these guys. It's, it's not rocket science. It's giving them a chance to get an education. Sure, you might be an expert driver in L.A. or in New York where you can punch the gas and get in between two cars, but you try doing that on an icy road and you're going to look yeah. like a real fool out there. True. True. So again, it's just experience doing a, a certain task. We see Rober Sorley here um, trying to drive his sled, which is easier yeah. done standing up, but also trying to get down out of the wind. We've seen his hood flapping in the wind a little bit. We're getting a little bit deeper drifts. You see that his dog's starting to drop down a little bit deeper in there. Um, their, their legs will punch down a little bit deeper, so the drifts seem to have been building up. Maybe this other side of the mountain has had a lot of, a little more intense weather. I'm also seeing some, it looks like we have actual snow up there, perhaps. I, I, it's hard to tell what's, uh, what's blowing and what's in the air. But yeah, I am seeing dogs kind of dropping down a little bit deeper in the snow, which tells me their downhill speed's gonna need to be a little bit slower. And th this is a perfect example, Greg, of what you were bringing up of how fast you let them go. You've got to read this trail where, where we were talking about it's hard and then it gets punchy. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine if a dog 
was at its maximum output, maximum speed, and then they hit that, it's just like us tripping on something. But if you've got them a little below maximum, they have a chance for recovery and to not stumble and hurt themselves. So that's a perfect example of that that we just saw. And again, it's Robert knowing these dogs and taking them to the appropriate speed for the terrain that they've been trained and know. Now uh, we have you, Nina, in from uh, Orko Bogen, the checkpoint. Yes, Maria, I'm right here at the checkpoint to Orko Bogen, uh, still here after some hours, still waiting for the team. Well, what I can tell you is that I'm pretty happy about my fur hat at the moment because these weather conditions are really changing. Like 30 minutes ago, we had really nice sunshine, blue skies, a little bit of wind, and then in uh, five minutes time it all changed and we got some snow we got more wind and it's all gray so the weather conditions here down at Orkelbogen is quite changing which means it will be even more challenging for the teams coming into this uh, checkpoint because that'll be up in the high mountains we know it's been almost uh, 13 14 uh, meters per second that's Norwegian or European standard meter per second and it's been a lot of snow drifts the trail is uh, difficult to find, uh, so it's extremely challenging and changing. But we know the first teams in the 650 or the best, or the, the experienced team, they will have no troubles in this kind of weather. They're used to training in bad weather. Right now, I have uh, Duarte Nielsen on my side and also Knut Birkeng. Uh, those guys are in the security team of the race. Duarte, what is your... Uh, what is your uh, main task? What is your assignment? What are you doing? Oh, the trails uh, is the most important one. Uh, it has to uh, be good conditions and um, uh, markings uh, and trails have to be in the place. And uh, we have to take care of everybody. And um, if someone is missing, we have to go and search. Tell me, Edouard, has there been any action today? Actually, we have been um, looking for one dog. Um, and I hope they find him. We, we didn't, but uh, I hope he's back in, in place. <clears throat> so what I heard is that there was actually one dog getting loose from the team in a 450 class. Somebody having trouble in the bad weather. And maybe the team was tangled up and they lost the dog. She lost the dog. Yeah. And the dog is still... Uh, loose, not found yet? I don't know actually. I have been in the mountains now and checking the conditions. So uh, the condition is uh, good. So everything is fine. Do you think the dog will keep to the trail or do you think the dog will move out of the trail? Is there a lot of loose, heavy snow outside the trail? Do you think the dog will follow the trail? Yeah, he will follow the trail. Uh, there was something about the, uh, Michelle losing her team as well, another Michelle losing her dog team. How is that now? Uh, we have been uh, checking it and uh, everything is uh, fine and uh, all is together. So all dogs are fine yeah. and the Michelle is fine. Yes. yes. Knut Birkeng, you are also in the security team. What are you doing? I mean, uh, what do you do? What we do? No, we are uh, keeping the trails okay and the sticks are up and... <laughs> And we are go out and checking the weather up on a thousand meters at the highest point. So keep everybody safe. So you guys are basically on the snow machines all day and night and making sure these legs of the feminine race, this part of the feminine race is all ready for the machine, making sure the marks are uh, along, the marks are at the trail, not blowing down. Yes, yes that's right. But uh, it's not on the snow all the time, but, but yeah, a uh, lot of time. <laughs> Have you guys got some sleep? Uh, two hours since uh, yeah, last morning, Saturday, and Saturday morning. morning. So do you know which day it is today? Uh, no. <laughs> 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 we have been driving uh, 300 kilometers now since uh, Saturday morning. So. Are you finished now? No, we are going uh, back to Tinset also. Are you guys having a? Uh, go, are you going to work tomorrow? Mm, don't know yet. We'll see. You need some sleep, <laughs> huh? Maybe. <laughs> but why are you in the security team? Are you like a very, very experienced uh, snow machine drivers? Yeah, we have been driving snowmobiles for about twenty years. So 
we are at and we are uh, also selling snowmobiles and we are uh, a sponsor in Family Lab also. What about you? Your experience uh, driving snow machines? Yeah, we have a lot of experience, a lot of years. I have to ask, are you guys working for the Tinset uh, MC? Yeah, that's uh, right. That? Okay, right. <laughs> <laughs> I heard of you. <laughs> that's good. But do you, have you been doing this many years? Uh, we started uh, driving every since we were six years old, I think. Six years old? Yeah. yeah you so, mean uh, in the race? In, oh, yeah. Uh, oh, okay. Since uh, 2006, I think, yeah. All right, so we've been into the Femme race as a snow machine uh, or the security team yeah. since 2000, uh, 2006. Yeah, not the security team uh, all the time, but the last years. But we're building the, but we're building the trails. Are you dog mushers as well? Yes. <laughs> you have a kettle? Dogs? No, 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 <laughs> no just, uh, just trails, dog uh, tra Make trail uh, makers. Yeah. You have dog? No, I don't have. I don't. I'm. <laughs> no, I don't have. But do you like the atmosphere in the competition? Oh, that, that's a good part of it. Uh, that's why we are here, and uh, all the good people, and it's fun. You guys gotta be neutral, I suppose. But do you have a favorite musher? Favorite musher? Mm, Robert Surly, I think. It's a lot of. Them. We know too much. We know too. Uh, too many of them. Um, I think uh, Robert is uh, my favorite this year. You heard what they're saying. They are in the security team, and maybe they should be neutral, but they do both have Robert Surly as their favorite musher. Well, as long as you want to talk to a lot of other people, the spectators, the crowds, the handlers, I can't find anybody not having Robert Surly as their favorite. He is such a popular musher here in Norway. Okay, back to the studio. Thank you, Nina. Well, it looks like uh, Robert is there in only a few kilometers now. Yeah, I think uh, I had a, just over six miles or a little over eight kilometers, right, according to the tracker. But, of course, yes. there's a plus or minus margin with that. So he's getting close. Uh, and then, Bruce, he ends up with a six-hour rest when he gets there. The clock will start. And then he'll be planning his next moves right over these six hours uh, on his strategy to get to the finish line as fast as he can. Yeah, it'd be fun to see him come into there and then hear from his own voice about the run and how the dogs are doing. Yeah. And and that that's a chance to really get it from the musher directly of how, how they see the race unfolding. But the first thing we'll see him do is get in there and take care of those dogs, not be out chit-chatting. He should come in, get those dogs bedded down, booties off, get them fed, and then there'll probably be a chance to hear from him a little bit. But uh, it's still a pretty exciting race. They're still very close. I mean, yeah. we've all we've analyzed this. That team looks a little better, a little stronger. Uh, he's managed them well, but it's still a close race, which makes this really exciting. But it's also exciting to get to see a team excel like this. Oh, amazing images. And Robert's still fighting that wind and the blowing snow as he's getting close to Oracle Buggin and his six-hour mandatory rest. Now, uh, maybe you, Dallas, can uh, take us through the map uh, so that we can see where the dog teams are. Absolutely. Let's take a look at that uh, GPS trail map out there. So we see Robert Surly up in the front there. Um, all right, we'll start at the back. All right, so we got Rodney Frindenlin and taking us uh, rounding out the top 10 right behind the Rogne. But Ronnie Frindenlin in 10th uh, place, and he is about 49 kilometers behind our leaders. As we work our way up the trail, we see Nina Volen in ninth position. We saw her go by uh, Tristel a little bit ago. Nice looking dog team there. Daniel Hagenson is in eighth place. Um, actually, this has it back to Pete Johansson is in eighth, and Hagenson is that back in seventh. Um, they've been kind of very close together for a little bit here. A uh, little farther up the trail, we have Thomas Werner in sixth place. Uh, we saw his team got go by Trestle, and they looked very good after taking a little extra rest. It seems like that team is back up on step and rolling down the trail. A bit of a gap as we go up the trail to Ralph Johansson. Um, we saw him on the trail earlier, still a very solid looking team, but it appeared that he had a dog riding in his sled when we last saw him on the trail. Farther up the trail, 
we have Barbara Inuin, a uh, nice looking dog team here as well. And fourth place, she's doing having a very nice race with a nice looking team, but there's a big gap between her and third place, Petra Carlson. Um, and that we haven't seen that uh, distance between those two change a whole lot. Petra Carlson with a nice looking team is kind of in a bubble because behind him, he has quite a bit of distance. And then going farther up the trail, there's uh, a lot of distance before we get up to Birgitta Ness, um, who is now kind of nearing the, the summit of the mountain, has kind of crested over that and working their way down. Um, she's in second place. When we last saw her, she was about 12 to 13 minutes behind Robert Sorley, who is leading us in this race. He is crested over the pass of the mountain, heading down the other side, struggling through some very difficult windy conditions where it takes a lot of physical sled driving abilities. Brigitte is in the same conditions right now, but Robert Sorley is leading us with a beautiful 12 dog team heading into the checkpoint of Orklerbogen, which is our sixth checkpoint um, and probably the last place we're going to see these top mushers have actually stop and rest the dogs prior to the finish line. So here we have Robert going through that uh, kind of challenging conditions. You're having to use a lot of your upper body strength and core strength to kind of twist the sled around and keep it uh, on the solid packed trail when both a little bit of a side hill is trying to shift him to the right hand side of the trail as well as the wind. Also we're seeing the dogs kind of punching through a little bit here so it's going to be a real trick for Robert to get the team through this mountain terrain as quickly as possible and even more importantly as safely as possible. And, and it is interesting to watch these top five teams spread out. Uh, those gaps between them get bigger and bigger as we get deeper down into the race. And that's pretty typical as the specific capabilities of each team start to show themselves. And they get these bigger gaps where in the beginning we were very close together and arriving at their first six hour checkpoint fairly close together. But as a little bit of speed, a little bit of management, a little bit of conditioning of the dog starts to show after days and days of travel. Those gaps expand and that, that view that we just had of the map shows that even in these front teams, things are spreading out now. And you can drastically see the different conditions. That's Oracle Bog in there, the checkpoint that Robert is heading towards. And he's not that far away. I mean, just a few miles above this checkpoint, he's running through that blowing snow and, and all of that wind. And, and it looks very calm down there and actually looks warm. Uh, that snow looks like it's melting to me where these teams are parked or were parked. Right. People aren't dressed super heavily. Yeah. And, and, and it's, yeah, the dogs will rest really well down there out of the wind. Now, we must remember that they don't have to rest at the... Uh, True. Tr due to the rules, they don't have to rest at uh, the Orkelbogen. They can rest at Tolga. But uh, uh, hearing what you say now, they most likely to, to rest at Orca Vogel. That's true. They do have the choice, and someone could surprise you, but just analyzing the race. Look at these conditions, these images. Not only is it windy and snowy, and we just saw they're, they're on a big mountain climb, it's also one of the longest legs of the race. So this is where you want to put some energy back into those dogs. In miles, this run over here, uh, as we've calculated, it's about 60 nine miles so it's one of the longer legs and they it's been a while since they've had a big break also it, I mean it's a longer distance back to where they had their last six hour I would be really shocked in a strategic aspect of looking at the race if anybody would go farther I think that'd be a mistake but you can also just look at these conditions and go maybe it's time to give these dogs a rest right now and then have that energy for that final sprint if one of these contenders were going to plan to go past Orkelbug and, and go to Tolga before they take their six hour, we would have seen them stay longer back in Savoyland. True? They would have sat there longer and got a bigger rest or somewhere in between these checkpoints we would have stopped. Probably. Have Whenever you add mandatory rest into a race at any point, you are kind of restricting what the musher can do strategically with run rest cycles. They there's nothing unfair about that there's ways you can approach that rest but still they're locked into these time periods and then they have so to manage that here, I'm, I'm gonna cut in real quick here guys we've got a, a live shot of Ronnie Frindelund uh, coming by our camera here and man there's a little bit of snow here but it's a pretty stark uh, difference we got sunshine and no wind and uh, a few snowflakes down here 
Uh, just, I mean, he's about 60 kilometers from Orkubogan, so only 50 kilometers away. It's an entirely different weather pattern down here, it seems like. And it's that golden golden hour for a photographer with that sun setting. Oh, and my goodness. Yeah. All that golden light. Beautiful. Northern light. That's a really pretty shot there. A nice looking team as well. I mean, they're just scooting along down the trail, making good time. Um, it looks like just a comfortable gait for everybody, just moseying down the trail. So that's a nice looking team. And this is a, just a picturesque situation that this musher is in. These, these are the moments that you say, man, <laughs> I love being a dog musher. Now in 50 kilometers, if that wind picks up, <laughs> he may have a different <laughs> outlook where he's wondering, why am I a dog musher? And it's fa amazing how you can experience those kind of extremes just in one run. Especially getting up there in the night where maybe the markers don't show up as well and yeah. the spindrift kicking up in your face and you can't see and your lights reflecting off of it. Yeah, and, and in no that. time he could be up there and just having a miserable run. But yeah, we're, you're we're just running one mile at a time. Yeah, 30, 35 mile difference here, right? I mean, look what Nina's going in versus that team that we just saw. And again, it's indicative of what a musher can face in any 24 hour period in any of these middle to long distance races. And what makes it so interesting. Yeah, it's actually a bit get the nuts there. Yeah. Closing up. Oh, it is. The, mm -hmm. Yes. To the checkpoint. And looks like she's yeah, it's now interesting seeing summited and was, heading down. Yeah, I was just going to say, it's interesting seeing her team. A little bit easier gate. You notice how these guys are all kind of standing a trot, and every once in a while, one will kick it into a lope. But it's keeping a much slower pace down here, and it seems very casual for the dogs. They're able to kind of walk through those drifts where we saw Robert holding a little bit brisker pace coming down. Um, but, yeah, you see these kind of holes where it's very soft snow or drifted snow, and the dogs kind of sink into that. But this is a pace here where they'll navigate that terrain with no ill effects. They'll just kind of mosey on through it. Very comfortable pace for the dogs. And, uh, yeah, I think we did see Robert doing this section a little bit quicker, a little bit brisker, at least uh, especially farther down. But this is a comfortable team in this terrain, but they're probably not making as good a time on the trail. I've always been told that the team in front of a team leaves scent on the trail, and I'm wondering... Uh, if she can't see Robert's tracks, and obviously there's trail markers, but is the scent still there? Does it blow away quicker in the wind? Well, it might blow away quicker in the wind, but dogs have so much better scent. Any animal that has an elongated nose, part of that is a bigger chance for absorption of smell. And you'll notice, you know, all of us ex that run dogs have experienced our dogs kicking into a higher gear, running faster, and you go, what's going on? And you come around a corner and there's a moose there. Mm -hmm. They knew it before you did. Or all at once you'll notice your dogs picking up speed, going in, and they sense that the checkpoint's there because of the smell of campfires and stuff. And that's, they'll kick up in that higher speed and then a mile down the trail, you'll start noticing you're smelling wood smoke. Mm -hmm. They smelled it before you. So their scent, wind carries scent away, of course, but they, they're they just so much more sensitive than we are to those little differences. You know, in this landscape yeah. here, I, want, I just wanna say, I just thought of something. We talk about training wind leaders and what it's like getting dogs out in this landscape. But I wanna go back to the early days of the Iditarod when we had great mushers like Herbie Nyokpuk, who came from the Bering Sea coast of Alaska that lived, his dogs lived in this their entire lives. And when they came in from the villages to first run the Iditarod and they saw trees for the first time, the dogs were scared to death. They were afraid to go down the trail because there were these giants along the trail. Mm -hmm. So from people that come to those Arctic environments, they do the opposite of how a lot of people are looking at this. It's not training them to run in the open. They had to get their dogs down to the race early to teach them to run through forests because they had never seen things that big before. Yeah, I know we're seeing uh, Brigitte having to lean pretty hard to that left-hand side to try to keep the, tra the sled over there. Um, and that is, again, it's, it's physically exhausting. You know, not only is she pedaling and helping the dogs, but having to keep pulling the sled over. You know, it keeps kind of these different sections. There's a little bit of side hill. Right now, she's in a bit of a bowl. But then when you get on the ridges and you get a little more wind, it wants to push the sled over to the side. And this is tiring mushing for the, for the musher in here. Um, the dogs, they're able to slow it down. And this can be a little bit tricky for them, too, despite the slower pace. When they hit that soft terrain where their feet kind of sink down a little bit, 
makes it harder for them. And, you know, I would say also say on that scent thing, you know, some of the dogs are peeing while they're running, so there's that scent on the trail. I do think the dogs can pick it up. And, I'll, you know, believe it or not, there are mushers on the Iditarod after, you know, eight or nine days on the trail, but I'm pretty sure I can smell them from 12 miles away or 12 <laughs> minutes away in those conditions. So we are on day four or five here. So there's, there's uh, some strong smells in some of these musher cabins where they all go to sleep. Um, it can be pungent. Yeah, if you've never uh, walked into a musher yeah. cabin where everybody's gear is drying, you've never experienced aroma. <laughs> now let's head over to Nina at the checkpoint Orkelbogen. Uh. Yeah, here I am. A lot of people are coming here now. A lot of the handlers of the 650 mushers. And uh, I got it. Take this out. <laughs> and uh, we are expecting a little interview, a little talk with uh, Birgitta's handler, uh, Chris Halvorsen, coming here pretty soon to uh, get interviewed by me. And uh, Chris is the boyfriend and uh, partner of Birgitta. And he is very familiar with her dog team. He is uh, one of the one, one of the two of them who trains these dogs. It's just Birgitta and Chris training this dog team. And Chris is a very experienced musher as well. He's been raised the Finnmark and the Femin race, positioning and placing really, really well. Maybe I should have a turn around to see if I could find Chris. Yeah, he's right behind me, but I need to some, get somebody to call him over here. But Chris is uh, uh, very familiar with the dogs. He would uh, know how Birgit is racing. He would know how long she should rest on the different checkpoints. He would know, you know, everything about the dogs in the team. He knows them as they're, he's actually one or two persons training the team. We're waiting for Chris right now. I'll just turn a little bit around. And maybe I should uh, walk over to him. We'll find Chris. He's right in front of me. Yay! Chris Halvorsen. Hi, Chris. Hey. You're the boyfriend of Birgitta and uh, also one or two people training the dog team. Yeah. Do you know these dogs of Birgitta very, very well? Yeah. What, what can you say? Do you train 50 50? Like you do half of the training or do you most of the training? Oh, it depends uh, now before the family race. B Birgitta is taking the main team all the time. But uh, earlier in the season, I do the main training on the main team. And she's, yeah, she's helping, but she has the kids more than me. And yeah, but we, we divide it uh, so we can, it works for us. You know, in the Norwegian races, you're allowed to have a telephone, a cell phone. Yeah. Does Birgitta call you when she's racing? No. She's calling after like one hour and telling me if something is uh, good or if something's very bad, but sh she's focused on the dogs. And then if she is starting to talk in the phone all the time, the dogs are not running as well. <laughs> <laughs> so has she been calling you since she left the checkpoint of Seville? Yeah, once. Tell, what did she say? What did she say? She was happy and surprised that uh, Robert wasn't uh, going as fast as we thought he was going to go. We don't have the same speed as Robert normally, but she, she, he is not going so much faster than us right now, but she was happy and, yeah, and uh, <laughs> for need. <laughs> yeah. But Chris, you would absolutely know pretty much about Robert's team and Robert's racing as well, because you used to be the one of the ha uh, handler for Robert Sterling, living at his kennel, doing an amazing job with his dogs. Uh, do you f know much about uh, Robert's weaknesses? Uh, I don't think he has some weaknesses here in the famine race. It's perfect for him and his team. His team is ex extreme in the speed downhill but may maybe if the race are like uh, 200 kilometers longer he will maybe slow it down a little bit but he has to the, his team is more extreme than our team but uh, if the races are longer that doesn't have to be the best thing that they are going so fast and hard but Big Gritty is not that far behind and the race is not far from over. I believe it's around 200, less, a little bit less than 200 kilometers left, 170, I believe, yeah. kilometers left. Uh, and uh, in a dog machine, everything can happen. What are your thoughts? Is she going to take him? I hope so, but uh, 
We have to see. I think it's uh, going to be exciting to look at the time from Tolga to the finish line. And uh, I think maybe if, if, if we have a team that can take Robert on uh, this race, it will be on the last stage. The mushers need to do two six-hour mandatory stops in this race. And the last one has to be taken here at Orkelbogen or at Tolga. Yeah. Will you uh, uh, tell me if Birgitte is going to stay six hours here or at Tolga? Is that a secret or not? No, she's going to take it here. What do you think the Robert's going to do? I know he's going to take it here. If not, I'm going to be very, very happy. <laughs> What do you think is going to happen if somebody's going to do the six hour at Tolga instead? It will go slow. <laughs> it's too long. So, uh, no, I don't think that's a good idea, but yeah. But Birgitte will soon be here, and you are the handler. You have prepared her depot bag with maybe new plastic runners, maybe some uh, dry clothes for Birgitte. Um, are you going to give her some food? Do I plan anything for her to eat? <laughs> Yeah, I'm going to buy something in there. <laughs> and I have draw dry clothes in the lavo there. So she will rest and sleep and get out and do the final stage. Where is she going to sleep? Uh, in the lavo there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and a big gitty is known to be a very happy, smiling musher. Is she still in a good mood? Yeah, very good mood. She's uh, very, very glad and excited over the race. We was, it's a new dog team, and we was uh, not. We, we hoped it was a good team, but uh, we are very happy so far. Well, Chris, thank you very much. Good luck to the last part of the race with the team of Birgitte and you. Yeah, thank you. Over to the studio. Thanks, Nina. And we hear that uh, Chris say that uh, most teams will take their rest six hours <laughs> and uh, laughing a bit. Uh, okay. yeah. If Sir Lee was taking it at Tolga, the last checkpoint, he'd be pretty, uh, pretty <laughs> slow. That wouldn't be a good move. And he, and he knows that because he's a musher and he's studied this race before. But one of the things <clears throat> that we could see in those shots bes besides the interview before when we were looking at the checkpoint, it was calm. It looked warm. And there was a lot more wind and it started to snow now our first two teams are over that pass but for those teams that are following it could get a lot more challenging going over that pass if if there's any relationship to what's going on at the checkpoint compared to the wind up on the mountains like we saw it could get pretty nasty up there for those fourth fifth through tenth place teams and they're going to come through in the dark so I was looking at that going, whoa, what's going to happen up there later tonight? It could change the dynamic because <clears throat> we'll see if that weather moves up there. But it wasn't snowing and blowing like that in the checkpoint before. And I've heard with Nina that actually sometimes during the family race, some uh, dog teams must wait out the storm to cross this uh, mountain here. Well, if it got bad enough, yeah, we see that in all the races. If there's these places, there's wind tunnels that the wind gets concentrated, it can completely change the dynamic from the front of the race to the back of the race. And But it could also change it going forward. Yes. Right, depending on how much snow falls between uh, Orkelbogen and the finish line and whose team can go through deep snow. We, we have no idea how much snow will fall or how big this system is. But, you know, does Brigette or does Robert have a better team if they're if three, four, or five inches of snow does accumulate on the trail? A lot of unknowns. And when the snow starts falling... That's drama being built for a guy like me. So we keep the drama going forward as we look at another dog team. Uh, this was earlier today, I, I guess, and, and that's Brigette's team, I believe. And there are other, I believe, if I'm reading these charts right, there's a, there are more mountain, at least one more mountain pass coming up heading to the finish line, and we don't know what the weather dynamic is in that location. But... I'm just pointing out that there's going to be there's possibly going to be a strong difference in trail conditions mm. for those teams, say, fifth place back to 10th versus what these guys got to maneuver in the daylight. If the wind picks up, it wouldn't be that odd for Mother Nature to change the outcome of a sled dog race. No, <laughs> happened a lot. And, and I also heard that her husband, Chris, said that if they were going to pass uh, Robert Surly, they'd probably do it in the last hall. The last leg. 
and I and what I heard him analyzing with their team, <clears throat> that's a flatter stretch, and that would be that she has enough speed and reserve to maybe catch him a, a higher gear. But uh, but he hasn't seen the dogs, or the teams moving the way we have that's all true. day, right? So mm. he won't yeah. know that for sure well, until I he gets read there. Into that a little bit. What I would read into that a little bit is if they're going to catch him, it almost is predicated on Robert sorely slowing down on that final leg. You know, if um, the pace that he's been holding is a little too high, I don't think the indication was so much that Brigitte is going to speed up dramatically. I think it's kind of a hope that Robert might slow down as they were, you know, he was indicating in that interview he was already going slower than they thought he was going to be going. But, uh, of course, we have a lot better information where we're looking at the GPS trackers here and also seeing the teams on the trail. Um, yeah, I think it, it would Ooh, require... Okay, yeah, I just want to come back in here. We got a, a live shot of Rober Sorley coming Pretty down steep. this slope here. I mean, these guys are stretching out. That's a 12-dog team looking really, really nice there. Um, I'm not seeing Robert slowing down significantly. Of course, there's still many miles to go, and it wouldn't make a, it wouldn't take a huge mistake to slow Robert down by 10 or 15 minutes. And now Brigitte is right with him. But when I see these two teams, you know, side by side on a foot race coming to the finish, I like this team right here. <laughs> you know, too. these guys are rolling. I feel like they've got a little more pep in their step. Uh, they can stretch out on these downhills. I mean, that's, I don't think we're going to see Brigitte doing this speed going down the hill just because I think her dogs are going to be a lot more comfortable in a little bit slower pace. Now, we do have these soft holes. Now, this is a steep enough slope that I think Robert's doing about all he can to keep them slowed down. And you see those dogs still pulling, kind of um, accelerating the sled down this hill. Are you yeah. kidding me? I mean, let's wax on right now for a moment about what we're seeing. I mean, look at the look at the pitch of this hill that Robert Sorley is going down, and we're watching it on live television. Holy smokes! <laughs> and he's standing on the, isn't he's standing on the brake with both feet there, trying yeah. you know to to manage that speed. He's not just letting him roll. When I when they, we had the sideways shot, he was actually standing on the drag brake, slowing him down so that the leaders didn't get over run the leaders are the first one to run through any drift and it's easier for them to trip so he must be here, passing here one of the other pass coming from behind it looks like he's gonna pass a couple of them here whoa um, stacked up that's gonna be fun yeah <laughs> looks like we have a little bit of issue so we have two of the eight dog teams more than two at least three of the eight dog teams trying to conduct a pass here and some of the lead dogs got a little stalled in the process uh, perhaps, or maybe they're just clearing the trail for Robert as he's coming down here. But I think they were trying to conduct a pass of their own. He's coming along, makes a nice clean pass by these guys. There we go. That's a whole stack of these uh, <laughs> the eight dog teams right there. And I would I would look at that in two ways. One would be excited to see a champion team like that roll through but it also would be kind of debilitating to think but why do you think they're sending there those uh, <laughs> because teams? probably their dogs are having trouble negotiating yeah. the fact that they're all there it's like they're probably finding a leader that will go down that trail yeah. it's speculation but i would be going oh man i can't wait till the day i can get behind a team like that and <laughs> You know, I think that's a great observation, Bruce. And one of the things is, you know, when you see a pack of four mushers like that, they're comparing their team to the other teams around them. They're probably taking turns running in the lead and the other team's following. Maybe they're trying to switch which team was in lead and they got stalled in the passing process. And it points out to them that having a team like Robert is driving right now is possible right when they're used to seeing other teams that are similar to theirs they think this might be as good as you can get with a dog team and then robert comes rolling by and they say that is possible with a dog team and that sets you up to keep driving and keep improving and aspire to a team like that and talk about it appears to be a headwind right here talk about uh, a dog team moving into the wind versus the wind coming from uh you know their lateral sides well, the wind from on the side, like we saw before, tends to make them drift downwind. It's 
takes some tough-minded sled dogs to put their head down and go right driving directly into the wind. And you can see that main leader there on the right wow, side. Wow, look just at that. Just not hesitating, just driving right into it. And it's also more difficult for the musher because this type of snow is like sand. It's like grit, and it's going right into your face. It can be like needles. And, and more importantly, that's when you really want to have good goggles so you can keep watching those dogs. You don't want to be turning your head away from the wind. You have to keep track of what's going on. And you see Robert's kind of bent over. This is when a good rough comes in. Yeah. It can really make it more comfortable for the musher. Now he's getting down out of the wind. But it, it takes a heck of a dog team to, to perform like Guys, a, a how, leaders. How rare is a leader that can bury his head like that and just barrel right into this wind? That's a unique dog that we're seeing in the front. In the entire dog world, yes, but a lot of these top sled dog teams around the world have leaders like that. But it, there's there's two factors that I would see in that. I, I think you're right. There's a lot of dogs that'll do that out in front, just lean into the wind and cruise. A lot of them will do it, but how many of them will do it at that pace, right? Because mm -hmm. there's kind of a balance. When the trail gets more difficult, a lot of times the dogs will back off a little bit to make it a little easier for them. So I think it's pretty common to have leaders that will go, but the, I'm just seeing that lead dog on the right particularly, yeah. the one on the left, which kept kind of backing off, letting the other guy take the lead. He's, you know, wanting a little reassurance or maybe confidence by letting that other dog be half a step ahead of him. But having that dog that will set that pace in those conditions, that is impressive. And Dallas, another thing we should mention here is that that is, there are a lot of dogs that will do that if they're well rested, like on a training run. But mm -hmm. we've got to realize we're at the end of day three of almost continuous exercise and the dog is doing that yeah we're at about 500 kilometers into this race for Robert Sorley there so that's a lot of ground covered so here we're looking at our camera from Tinset uh, we're coming around the corner here we have Ronnie Friedenlund um, yeah let's see here we, you see these dogs? Oh, that's what they're perking up. I was noticing all the dogs perking up, tails oh, coming up, and now I understand sides. why. <laughs> I'm head He's on past flanked. a couple other dogs there. Yeah. You see, yeah. Uh, I'm seeing the third dog up from the sled on the right-hand side. His hackles are up a little bit, you know, a little bit of posturing going on there. But these guys are clearly perky and aware. They perked up when they saw another team. They're about to cruise up this hill here. I was kind of doing the Everybody same thing, now. going, what's what's going on with that team? They seem distracted. They're not. And all at mm -hmm. once, the other team came into view, and it's like they were ready for what's going on here with this pass. <laughs> but moving nicely now. Oh, yeah, that's a nice-looking team still, yeah. So he's a little bit farther back in the in the pack here, but uh, or in the, this kind of this top 10-pack. Uh, he's uh, bringing up the rear of that, but... You know, still in the top of the race, um, looking really, really nice. A few hours off the pace set by Robert and Brigitte near the front there, but running a solid race and a nice-looking dog team. Yeah, I wonder what kind of weather they're going to have when they get up there tonight. There's probably going to be some stories told when they get into the, the checkpoint later on tonight. I guess uh, I'm, I would guess that you're probably right on that one. It seemed like that weather was moving in. We saw the helicopter shots from up there when we were first kind of checking out the mountain pass before Robert climbed it. And it was pretty clear up there. You could see a little bit of weather in the distance. And then now these more recent shots that we've seen from those top mushers, it's windy up there. It's blowing hard. And that could make things very challenging for these guys come evening and on into the night. It may affect some of the, the schedules and where people choose to rest along the way. You know, we've talked about the mushers taking their six-hour mandatory rest in Oregon, but it's not required. They can take it in Tolga as well. So I think the only scenario that we would see that play out is some of these mushers. Uh, here we got another nice pass going. Real smooth. Nice. I think the only scenario that we would see mushers actually stop in Tolga for the six would be if they take this, this run that the mushers are currently doing that's about 112 kilometers long and actually stop a little bit short of that mountain pass, camping somewhere a little bit farther down the trail than Trins, uh, Tin Set that we see right here, um, stopping before that mountain pass, camping the dogs, going over the mountain pass, um, and going kind of pretty much all the way to Tolga to kind of break up these runs instead of doing a 70-mile run followed by an 88-mile run. Sorry to keep switching between metric and standard here, but breaking that into three runs of approximately 50 miles, that might be a scenario where we see a team later in the race decide to take that six in Tolga.
All right. Here we have Drina Lyric uh, running uh, the team that her daughter was planning to run into this race, but got a little bit sick. And so her mother, Drina, decided to take over that team, or they decided for her to take the team and get the training on the dogs. You know, we know that this team is primarily being trained to run in the Finmark later in the year. This race is being used as an important part of their preparation. And here again, we see a, a really nice performance from a team that's using that as a training run, a very good a training trip. Seeing 12 dogs in that team. I'm sorry, 11 dogs in that team that are all looking pretty solid there. Yeah, they look really good right now. A lot of speed in that team. And and you often expect that from the teams that are farther back. They've rested more. So, yes, uh, yeah. that's, that's true there, Bruce, for sure. We see these teams that are a little bit farther back have a little more rest and do well. But another thing to remember for all these teams is the relative experience for the dog. If it's a maybe a genetically not at the same level for the sled dog. Maybe it's in a mushing kennel that's less experienced. Finishing this race in 20th position can be just as challenging for them relative to their preparation and their genetic ability as it is for the mushers that are winning the race. You know, relative to that, it, it can be just as hard for them. So oftentimes we do see some really nice teams in the back of the race that could have been farther forward if they elect to use it as a training run. But what we'll also see is teams that really did their best on this race, they were really focusing on it and trying hard and racing hard and, you know, pull off a 25th place finish which is as challenging for that team and those dogs in the musher as Robert Sorley winning the race. And again, using our human analogy, you know, if I run a marathon and I can get it done in three and a half hours, that's a real challenge for me. <laughs> you know, that's really pushing myself. Meanwhile, somebody else just did it in just over two hours. Are you kidding me? <laughs> but it's a different physical ability. So it's that relative experience. And those mushers can be very proud of a 25th place finish. Yeah, we've had three days so far with the uh, mushing. And uh, today we've really seen a whole lot. Like yeah, every yeah. day has been very different. <laughs> Different terrain, different challenges, yeah. different ways of handling the trail, uh, a variety of aspects going on. And that's the dynamic of basically every long distance marathon sled dog race in the world, which is what makes this so intriguing. And also what we've learned, you know, we had dog teams running through wind and snow on day one. But with the expert analysis from Dallas and Bruce, we've also learned today uh, how it's different for a dog team this far into the race going through the same wind and snow and how it can impact the team and how it can impact a leader or a driver. And so, again, the educational opportunities that we've had over these three days have been uh, immense as you have, you know, a blizzard on the front end and now uh, here. And again, as we saw the images there of the storm and the snow dropping down on Oracle Boggan, one has to wonder what the next 24 hours or 12 hours will be like for these dog teams if that snow substantially falls and creates a slower track to the finish line. Yeah. It'll be interesting. And Dallas uh, explained that some mushers might want to rest before the, the mountain and so that you're not, you don't need, you're not required to rest at the checkpoints. No, there's no requirement. It's just some place of those two checkpoints you have to take a six hour. But that doesn't mean if your dog team needs a break somewhere else, you can't give it to them. And if you've got a, a tired dog team before you would, charge into a big pass or a difficult trail section, you might want to give them a little rest, maybe get a little more food or hydration into them, and then go over that in good shape versus tired. Yeah. So meaning if they're going to camp outside of Oracle Boggan, they're going to go through Oracle Boggan all the way to Tolga, right? They'd have to break yes. it up differently. And uh, now we see the checkpoint at Oracle Boggan where we're supposed to get uh, Robert Serlin any minute now. And it, it's getting darker, yeah. it's getting colder and more snow. It will be a challenge for the upcoming mushers. Yeah, and I'll give a shout out for those f pictures we saw <laughs> up on the pass. I mean, you looked at the dogs and talked about their challenges and the snow and the face of the musher. But I guarantee you who was the most miserable up there was the cameraman. <laughs> <laughs> Just standing there yeah. taking that over yeah. that long period of time yeah. to bring us those shots. That's not an easy thing to do. We all know you get cold. If There he there is. is. That's the uh, guy. Hey. Yeah. 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 Shout out to that guy because <laughs> yes. to capture those they just stand still and you got to remember that they're out there like that <laughs> for a long those. time 
And who is, do we have here? I think we have teams coming in from yeah. our shorter races and coming into the same checkpoint. That's why we're seeing so many passes and dog teams on the trail. It's kind of that big slinky or big spring is kind of all coming down to this point. So we're seeing a lot of passes and teams going. I, I can't tell which other race they're from, but... Uh, no. Because uh, on Friday, 161 uh, dog teams yeah. were registered to start in four different classes. Yeah. And now we're just looking at the longest distance, uh, 650 kilometer. So I would guess, Robert, it's probably within a, just a couple miles now. I think this is our image yeah, from before, really, really showing the speed of the dog team, even though he's holding it back with the brake, just how fluid they are coming down off of this mountain pass. Like a herd of buffaloes coming down that mountain pass. There we see some uh, slalom, some swings there. I know that if I were going to ski down there, I would definitely make some turns. I yeah, this was, this was fantastic. And so is it possible that whoever the first, you know, smaller team is here, it, the leaders wouldn't go in this wind, so it stopped. And then the other teams going by, those dogs are like, well, if they're stopping, we're stopping. And now there's a chain reaction going up. Well, that's what happens. It's like, well, your team goes faster, you go up front, or mine don't want to break out this trail. And that's why I said it must be both rewarding to yeah. see Robert's team, but also kind of, oh, man, I really have a lot to learn yet. Yeah. Well, they're like, well, who is this guy? What a team. And then they pull by, and they're like, oh, that's Robert. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a fantastic image. or they may just be giving their dogs a break too yeah. like we just need to rest but again that's conditioning compared to roberts that just blast through this yeah. stuff it never ceases to amaze a musher when you get out in difficult conditions whether it's wind or water or deep snow to see what these dogs can do i mean greg we saw last year and i did a ride where there were tens of miles that the mushers ran on the Yukon River, a major, huge ocean of a river, and there was overflow, and how hard those dog teams mm -hmm. work to get through broken ice and water, and then they come into the checkpoint like, okay, now what are we doing? Yeah, <laughs> big deal. It, it, meanwhile, the mushers all busted up and, you know, thanking the Lord that they got there safely and all is good, and it, it doesn't affect the dogs at all. Now we see this perfect example of the uh, of the dogs here. So impressive to watch this running through the wind. But how would a, a less experienced dog react to the wind and the cold? We just saw 14 <laughs> <seven> <laughs> back yes. there. That's kind of what it's like. Yeah. But I mean, uh, for you looking at this, I mean, it's probably the first major sled dog race you've really or uh, yes. most people have got to see. <laughs> it is. You can see how amazing and captivating these dogs are imagine doing that yourself right now that one lead dog just yeah, stepping just out into nuts. that it's the one on the right there the closest to us it's a thing of beauty and so as a musher and you see that dog and, and this video will will live now forever are you calling up robert and saying hey look let, let's breed Let's Actually, get... if I was going to Iditarod, as soon as he got to the finish line, I would See, go, how much? How much for that dog? <laughs> <laughs> it's priceless. Yes. It's priceless. Yeah. It truly is. Yeah. Even to lease that dog and have yeah. the chance to use it in a race, but to buy that dog. Or, yeah, to get a breeding. I mean, le you're more likely to get leaders breeding really good dogs like that. But So this must be our checkpoint yeah, coming in Yeah, I believe here. this is Oracle Buggin'. And again, look at the That's size. That's a really nicely laid out looking checkpoint it here. Is. You see yeah. kind of how the, the mushing area is corralled off. So those little dots you see are the posts that the dogs will be, or the team will be tied off to. And typically there's going to be a bale of straw sitting next to it that the musher will use for bedding. And then the snow fencing, it gives a, you know, a good boundary that the fans can come up to there and watch from there. The handlers will be watching their team, you know, or their musher and their team come in and they'll be watching from that, that post as well. Um, or behind that line. It's a really nicely put together checkpoint. You can see there's been a lot of effort put into that, getting everything mm -hmm. lined out and set up for these teams coming in here. You know, that's a lot of volunteer man hours putting that thing together. And as a musher, it's really appreciated. You know, from my perspective, when I come into a checkpoint, it's laid out nicely and there's a good place to hook your team off and the straw's right there and it's organized. It's just, it's a very welcome sight, especially after we just got to see what the mushers are running through to get there on the way to that checkpoint. 
So it's uh, it's very nice to see a well laid out checkpoint, and that's something I've been continuously impressed with and really pleased with watching races over here and then also competing in races over here is they've got the checkpoint figured out really, really well. And checkpoints are what they are when you get there because everybody, every competitor has to deal with them equally. But from a musher standpoint, we so much more enjoy these remote checkpoints than a big busy one in, in the middle of a village because the dogs rest better and you're more outdoor people anyway, but there's just less confusion. It's more aesthetic of a setting. This is less, as Dallas is saying, it's laid out nicely, but just the whole atmosphere is a lot better for the dogs and the musher. And earlier this week, we, uh, you were at the Bear Gris, John Bear Gris Sad Dog Marathon in Minnesota, and we saw a lot of trailers and cars mm -hmm. at the checkpoints. It's pretty different from this, right? Yeah, and that is certain checkpoints that you got that view, because there were fairly remote checkpoints that only the mushers were there and the trucks weren't. And the mushers, to a person, all told us those were their favorite checkpoints. Just camped out with their dogs without all the... I mean, we all appreciate fans and the support, but just to be out with your dogs is a special thing, and there's just less distractions. Nothing like coming into a checkpoint that is busy and having somebody hand you some warm food. But to just be... There's just a mellowness and a chance to relax when it's just you and your dogs. And you have to look at this image and understand that these checkpoints are orchestrated, right? This isn't just a field in the middle of the woods somewhere where somebody started putting poles in with a, a, a big bale of straw there. They have to orchestrate it around an in and out trail, like one coming in, one coming out. So it's safe for teams coming back and forth. They have to orchestrate it uh, to a point where it's close to where people can sleep or where people can park a vehicle. So it's not a simple process. And again, these are all volunteers, people who show up and put their brains to, to work and try to organize these things. And it, it appears with a race that's been around uh, since 1990, I believe, that they've really got this one dialed in. And these checkpoints are running like, you know, a, a Oh, we'll bring up Adele, like a great Adele song. Right? <laughs> yes. Just, just we, yeah. we had the troll earlier today. No, it was a dog that the was howling. barking. It was Max. <laughs> yes, how do I forget that? Max that was howling to an Adele song. But yeah, it, like we, we just can't lose sight on that. There's so many people uh, doing such a tremendous job for events like this. And, and these checkpoints are well orchestrated. Yeah, we heard from a lot of them today, like yeah. the, the veterinarians. It's so many people and the handlers and also volunteers. Now, um, but the handlers will probably have the, the hardest job right now. Well, the handlers get tired because of just the time of, you know, their job isn't just this checkpoint. They've gone to all these checkpoints and they're driving in between and the challenges of driving in a winter environment and taking care of any drop dogs. And then having the, in this particular race, having the supplies ready, the musher is not going to be real happy if they set their supplies out there and something's missing that the dogs need. So they've got, you know, they got to go over these checklists and make sure everything's prepared and ready in a, in a very uniform way because the musher is going to be tired and not thinking as clearly as they would have been, you know, say at home with rest. So, yeah, they have a very challenging job as well. We might be seeing yeah, Robert up a shot here. Right. here. Yeah, we've got, we've got Robert in sight of the checkpoint. It's pretty cool here again. We're getting a glimpse through the trees. I believe this is Robert Sorley. It looks like his hood. Ah. And those are his lead dogs right there. I recognize those guys. Yeah. Coming into the checkpoint. You know, it looks like some nice, uh, or some pretty soft trail. You see the dog's feet sinking in, a little less of a base here, even though it's not drifted. But the team's looking good coming into the checkpoint after accomplishing a 112-kilometer run in this one stretch through some very challenging conditions there. And they cruise right into the checkpoint. Coming on here. Yeah, you got to stop here and get signed in. Now, this is going to mark the official start time Rangers. of his mandatory rest. <laughs> it was crazy. <laughs> it was so crazy. It was... Um, what do you mean by crazy? Up and down, uh, no snow, windy. It has everything. I think the helicopter made a good picture. <laughs> <laughs> but too much up and down for an old man, huh? Yeah, I'm thinking about that, but I, th I think I shall not uh, uh, excuse me that uh, because I'm old, but it's a tough, 
tough trail, very tough trail. I'm thinking about everybody. You, do you think you're going to keep Birgitte behind you? Yeah, she's behind me now. <laughs> Is she still going to be behind you at the next legs? Yeah, I hope so. Hopefully. <laughs> good Mark, luck, Robert. Ne never Go. know. Never know. Go, Robert. Things are looking good, Robert. Hmm? Things are looking good. Looking Your good. dogs are looking good? Ah, they're looking very good. No problem. How long time are you staying? How, how long? Six hours. Yeah. You're taking your six hour yeah. here. Yeah, yeah. Take care of our dogs. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Okay. And the round of applause there uh, for the first team in to Oracle Boggan in the 650. Definitely is a little breezy, even right there. You could see where he was signing in the pages and of the clipboard were blowing up a little bit. But he said the helicopter should have gotten some good shots, and indeed they did. <laughs> We've been enjoying those for a few hours now. And Bruce, talk about going through tough trail like that, reaching the checkpoint. It's a time for the musher to just to take a big sigh, right? Relief, and now just to get the dogs bedded down and fed. Yeah, it's kind of a letdown, and it, it's not like, for me, it wouldn't be like, oh, I got here as a reward, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's kind of like, okay, I've been focused this whole time. I can let down a little bit now and go into a rest mode. And even though he has six hours, it's critical that he do this in a very organized fashion and get the food into those dogs and let them get not only the nutrition but the sleep that they need to complete this race. And it can be, when you're tired, it can be very distracting also to have all suddenly all these people around you and conversations and your, 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 your window of focus when you're out on the trail is very narrow. You're just you and those dogs. Now there's all this other distraction. And when you're tired, it's easy to get lost in that. And that's why I always prefer to leave a musher alone, let them do their job and talk to them later on. What he's doing here, there's an extra snow hook. This is a safety thing to take pressure off of your leaders. You hook that onto the front of the line because right now the leaders have the responsibility of keeping the whole team lined out. They've been taught to do that. So when he puts this in and he'll pull it out in front and securely anchor the whole gang line, that kind of means the leaders can say, okay, guys, I've got this now. The other guys aren't going to yank around on you. And it also is a safety thing just to keep the dogs in a large parking area like this from drifting over to the team next to them and maybe getting one of those, you know, getting in a, in a fight or one of those unexpected breedings. But if I was had a dog in heat and I could park next to that leader, I might just let that happen. <laughs> <laughs> Robert Shirley said it was a crazy uh, race uh, over the mountain there, yeah. thinking about the, the other ones behind him, too. And you can't lose perspective when a guy like Robert Sorley tells you that it was a crazy run, coming over a mountain like that and win like it's the real deal. Uh, it wasn't somebody with, with uh, you know, lacking experience or, or maybe not a lot of situations where they've been through that. This guy has seen it all in his mushing career. So I think those are real legit words. Here we see the dogs, they want those booties off. As soon as they start running, there's probably with the drifts that they ran through, a little bit of snow piled around the tops of those booties, and that can be a little discomforting to them. So they're taking off their own booties. And, and that's an important thing to do after they finish exercise, because then the foot would tend to swell a little bit. And they want to stretch that out, pump all that fluid out of there and get those off. And they're anxious for it once they get stopped. It's like well, if you're going to hang out and talk, I'm taking my booties off. And it can be annoying, too, if you want to leave and they'll take them off. But you can see the dogs there pulling on those Velcro straps to get the booties off. And Robert spending time with those leaders. You and Dallas were able to comment on how special they were coming over that. But Robert knows as well as anybody how great those dogs were in that storm up there. Oh, yeah, he has to be really proud of them at this point and just... You want to give them the reward that they deserve no, I, I from recognizing the amount of effort and work they went through to deal with the win and to find the trail and to keep the whole team stretched out during that, that run. <laughs> What is he doing now? He's changing the rope? At that point, so he can unclip the, the 
tug line from the harness and that gives the dogs then the freedom to curl up or lick their feet. They're not restricted at all. And then when he puts down the straw, they can curl around like you see dogs do and make their little bed. So, But they're still connected by the neckline. There they're still see. connected, secured to the yeah. line, but you want to take that back line off so that they can just comfortably stretch and curl up to sleep, whatever they need to do. And, and that's also a, a signal to them. Mentally, the dog goes, oh, we aren't just stopping for a snack. We're actually going to rest here. And then they know what to do. Dallas still there? Do we still have Dallas on? Yeah, I'm just uh, kind of observing and listening to what you guys are saying here. Um, you know, I, I think... Uh, I... All right, do we have Birgit? No. Not yet. No, this Big is one, is one of the yeah, other what races. What I'm seeing here is, you know, when you pull into a checkpoint like this, the first uh, first process to get your dog into camping formation, and I guess that's what I'm thinking of when you're talking about switching the lines, right? You're disconnecting that tug line, the line coming from the back of the dog, leaving the dog just connected by the neck line. That's the one that attaches to their collar. Now they have the freedom, like uh, Bruce was saying, to walk around in circles and kind of get comfortable. They're going to be eating their food. So the process of getting these guys into camping formation quickly upon arriving at a checkpoint is very important especially when they've been out on the trail i think this run uh you know took robert about eight hours and 37 minutes to d accomplish this last wow. section of the trail i think we're going to see mm -hmm. that as a very good run time on this course of the trail they pull in he gets the lead dogs anchored out let the lead dogs know that they're off duty their tug line is no longer connected get the boots off the rest of the dogs and start getting food to these guys I would be focusing on getting as much rest as possible for this team uh, in this six-hour mandatory rest because from here, it's a long haul to the finish line, and I think Robert's sitting in a really, really good position, and obviously he's very pleased with how things are going. And I know, Dallas, throughout your career, you start that process even before you arrive at the checkpoint, right? Either whether it's a mental <laughs> checklist or if there are things in the sled that you can reach and organize and get ready so that when you park in and you pull in there, it's, a, it's an orchestrated bang, 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 quicker the better. Yep, and here's a here's a great example. We just saw these guys mushing over the mountain pass there. You know, once you start getting into those trees and you know you're close to the checkpoint, um, I'm going to start getting myself ready to, to handle my chores. Sometimes the only thing that we can really prepare is mental checklist. What am I going to do as soon as I arrive? What's my priority? So every step I take is taking me in the direction of the next task and it's efficient and it's kind of, you know, it's been uh, pre-planned and it's purposeful. The other thing that I'm going to do is get my physical gear ready to go. So if I've been wearing a big over parka as I've been going through the wind or I have my big over boots on, I will take that parka off, stuff it inside the sled, assuming that I'm warm enough underneath, of course. Um, I'm going to take my big snow pants off. I have my light snow pants underneath we saw i think robert's wearing uh, like the the over shoes on his boots oftentimes i would take those off and have my lighter shoe on my foot so i can move quickly in the checkpoint then you saw him putting on those smaller gloves that he's going to use to you know be able to manipulate the booties and take those off and have better dexterity a lot of times i'm going to want to have those gloves or something like that already on now i might be wearing those underneath my mittens so that when i pull in i'm ready to rock and roll but Right here, this a six-hour break is a long break, and I'm going to guess that Robert's a little more relaxed. He's got a lead. This isn't his uh, – it's not like this is going to be the first time he's ever won a dog race if he is able to pull off the victory, which I would put uh, pretty good odds on Robert right now. So I think we see him being a little more relaxed. I think he's kind of feeling like, I've probably got this in the bag. He's jovial. He's talking to the volunteers and the people out there, and that's great to do as well. And I think he has the time to afford to do that. But, Greg, that's – that checkpoint after checkpoint, that efficiency that Dallas is talking about, it's only minutes at each checkpoint. But when you've got multiple days mm -hmm. of traveling and always being organized like that, it adds up. And does it make your dog team go any faster? No. What it does is allow the musher to sleep and rest more and therefore be awake and aware to take care of that team. And I've had the privilege in the last few years since I haven't been racing to work with you out on the trail. And often I will set back like we're viewing here mm -hmm. and I've timed mushers just so I could see what they were doing. Look at my watch. And again, I've seen people like Dallas come in and 45 minutes to an hour, they are done. They're not just done with chores. They are done and inside eating yeah. and sleeping. 
and I've watched other mushers come in and then they slowly get undressed and they walk to the front and they put out a snow hook and then they do this or that and they chit chat and they are there for two hours. Now that's two hours and it's an hour of interruption on sleep. When I would come into a checkpoint, I always had a little notebook and if I had any doubts of what was there, I'd pull it out and I'd think, okay, I'm going through here. I want fresh batteries, I want gloves, I want the bag of beef and some kibble, and I'm out of here to be organized. The same thing with leaving. <clears throat> I'll often walk out of a checkpoint on an Iditarod for a mile or so. Uh, and I distinctly remember a few years ago, I walked out of the Rhone checkpoint, totally remote, and I went out and sat on the river, and Mitch Seavey went by me. And loudly, he to himself, speaking out loud, he went, batteries? two bags of kibble, mm. gloves. He was reciting that. So if yeah. he forgot something, he could go back and get it. And that's a musher that is very well organized and getting set up to succeed and not getting out on the trail and go, I don't, I forgot my kibble. Yeah. And that was a real lesson to me. And when I talked to Mitch later, I said, do you always talk to yourself leaving the checkpoint? He goes, what are you talking about? <laughs> and I said, well, I was sitting out there on a stump yeah. and you were reciting what you should take with you. And he just started laughing, yeah. you know, that, yeah. that I'd noticed that. And he never saw me as he went by. But again, it just illustrates being prepared going in, being prepared leaving. And if you want to be where Robert Sorley is right now, yeah. that's what you have to do. And Dallas, I know you know this, and I brought it up during the Bear Grease coverage. It was Doug Swingley who once said that these are not really dog races. They're time management races as we, let's, we let's look at real increasing quick, turn, turn our attention over yeah. here to the screen real quick. Uh, wow. We've, we've got uh, Petter Carlson, I believe, coming through this storm. Wow. This is turning into a real storm. <laughs> we see a headlamp there. You know, it's still, uh, man, I mean, that's, that is a whiteout. That is the yes. definition right there. And that light uh, is probably not helping them see the trail too much, but it is a safety thing if there's any other snowmobiles or anything, because anybody moving on this trail, obviously what we see here is a light and uh, kind of the rough outline of a human trying wow. to uh, help the team out. And now we can start to see this outline of the dogs. Um, I believe he has the GPS in his hand right there because he wants to know right away if he gets off this track at all, making sure he's on the right course. And now we understand why these stakes are so close together, right? Before, when it's a nice, beautiful day, it seems like they put way too many stakes out there. You can see a hundred of them at any given moment. But in conditions like this, how do you know where to go? I mean, you're very thankful that those stakes are only, you know, maybe uh, maybe 50 meters apart in this section. So whenever I'm looking at a trail and I see stakes like that, it tells me that this right here is possible, right? Look at that shot. That's amazing. And you can see the broken sky above. And so we see this oftentimes on the Iditarod where it's just a ground storm and 200 feet up, it could be a bluebird day. But this looks like it's right down on the ground. Yeah, there could, in a wind tunnel, you could have planes flying. Their conditions for aviation are good enough that a plane can fly. But down on the ground, there's a 50 foot ground storm going on. Look and at that it, live it, picture. It's where the topography drives these fronts, these weather fronts in and creating wind like that. Nice looking dog team, by the way. And then we cut to this, right, like now, this you, is somewhere in Ohio. To <laughs> <laughs> coming over to Brigitte, coming into the uh, checkpoint here. Ah. Is this Brigitte? I'm trying to see. No, no I, I think it's another eight dog team, but we should be seeing her coming in any minute now. We've had 14 minutes have elapsed. This might be another one right behind her here, so let's keep our eye on the trail. This could be those been, four no, teams following, minutes. too. This could be those yeah, four that teams that we saw up on the mountain finally yeah. coming in following Robert That might now. be a good read there, Bruce. I think that's likely, but... Uh, we have three that I can see in sight right now. There come three spans on the back. Come on, Birgitte. There are three eight spans. We heard uh, Nina saying it was three uh, three dog teams with eight dogs. Okay. And then maybe Birgitte will come behind them. And man, these guys made it out of there uh, just in the nick of time, huh? Yeah. <laughs> it's looking like I don't it's think those. Up on top. <laughs> I don't think those teams would be real happy up there right now. Yeah, they may have been getting their sleeping bags out. But uh, again, so, the, the difference in what, what it's like at the checkpoint versus a few kilometers back. Mm -hmm. 
This is the 450k. Can you guys hear me? Yes, we yes, can, can, Nina. All right, I'm here. The Oh, great. We just had three teams from the 450 class coming in here. We thought it actually was Birgitte, the first one, but uh, of course they're not because Birgitte is raising more dogs. I just want to tell you a little bit about Birgitte while we're waiting for her. She's about 43 years old. She's a registered nurse. She's got two children, 10 and 14 years old. And the father of the children is actually Thomas Werner. Birgitte is the most positive, positive musher I've ever seen. She has a really tough, competitive mind. And you guys, she has been in some really hard cat fights before in fr uh, running in the front of the race. She <laughs> You know, she, she's been to the most, uh, all the long races in Norway. She's been having cat fights with a lot of male mushers, and she sure knows how to compete. You know, this girl has been competing in sprint races, mid-distance races, long-distance races, Nordic skiing or Nordic uh, mushing races as well. And she's been living in Alaska. She's been breeding sprint dogs, and she has a lot of bloodlines in different kinds of uh, kennels in Alaska, in Scandinavia, to together with her ex-husband, Thomas Werner. And you know, to, uh, Birgitte has the most amazing ability to stay positive, focused, and at least, uh, or at last, smiling and being happy. And I think that's so important for the, 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 um, uh, the, the, the team, her dogs, because they always feel they have a happy musher. I mean, the team is, what do you say? Well, a happy team as well. Of course, we'll meet some tired dogs now. But she's sure going to do her six hour here as well. And, you know, I know Robert is a really good uh, 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 accomplished musher. But, I mean, you can actually beat him. He is beatable, actually. <laughs> you guys have any questions for me? I, I do, do actually. I actually do. This is Bruce and... Uh, we're, we saw images here in the studio of how stormy it is up on this pass, this mountain that they just got into. Can you go forward from here? I mean, they're going to take the six hour. Are there other open passes to climb on this trail to the finish line? Give us a description of the topography in the next r two runs. Uh, yeah. I'll sure do a description, but if Birgitte is coming, I just got to focus on her coming in. Uh, going down now to the next checkpoint of Tolga, you do actually do the same trail all the way down to Tinset, and then the last third of the leg is new to, over to Tolga. So this means you'll go all the same way down to Tinset, beating teams coming up or it's head on all the way. And uh, that means that like, going to Orkelbogen is like one way back and forth. Going down to Tinset is easy peasy because they're not going to go, the first part now is a little bit different. They will go straight into the wood or birch and downhill so they'll be out of the weather uh, the, the tough part of the weather that's finished on this leg now uh, going down to the small city of Tinset going alongside Norway's longest river of Glomma all the way up to the checkpoint of Tolga which is in a, a, a sports air arena um, the ones competing they're for sure not going to stop they're just, just going to grab a bag of snack maybe sign in and out and then just leave as fast as possible heading for the finish line but you guys i checked a little bit the last leg from Tolga to Dödos, you got to pass uh, one half mountain, so to speak, with a little bit of vegetation. And then you're going to cross, well, go like on a hillside, about three level, quite a long way. And then you're going to pass over a mountain called Norskofte. And then you will hit down in another valley, which is the valley and the trail they had on the first leg of the race. So which means when they get down from Norskafte, to the valley of uh, Nordjude, Nordal, they will ha go into vegetation area with farms and the dogs will recognize the trail because that's where they went on the first leg out of Rödos. So now they're actually going the right, right back to Rödos in the same trail. And then about 10k, 12k before the finish line, they're going another, over another mountain pass 
which means it is going to be still very very exciting on the last leg they'll do that leg during the night hours getting into the uh, to the finish line in daylight uh, early tomorrow morning i guess about well nine o'clock i would guess eight nine o'clock maybe 9 30 they will have daylight the wind is gonna uh, decrease it's gonna be a lot more uh, less um, a lot more less wind and it's gonna be really nice going the last leg except there might be changes really, really fast in the weather so there might be pretty windy in the mountains although it's quiet downtown Rödos. So we still have some possibilities for weather changes and some, call it action, before the fin measure hit the finish line. I gotta look for Birgitta. Oh, right now it's cleared up a little bit. I mean, the weather is changing so fast. 10 minutes ago it was blowing and a lot of snow drift, but now it's more clear. Probably meet her every see Birgitte any minute, so stay tuned. Studio. Yes, we're excited to see uh, Birgitte coming. And yeah, I'd be real so anxious well. to see what her team looks like coming in here. And uh, she probably caught the tail end of that storm kind of picking up, but uh, she should be in here pretty quickly now. She wasn't that far behind Robert, and it'd be interesting to see how these dogs come in and how she handles getting her dogs bedded down if she's really focused like robert just immediately taking care of their booties and stuff uh so that's going to be cool to see here in a little bit so we got a we got a live shot from the trail here with uh uh intends it uh, this is trina lyric i believe that we got coming across here yeah and cruising underneath the bridge here shortly there we go nice looking team we got 11 of them cruising along. Everybody's looking good, just charging up that hill. Yeah, a lot of speed. You can see they're starting to get a little snow back here, and earlier today it was uh, pretty mild in this area, so this, this weather system is picking up. She yeah, out that's another, another nice-looking team. She yelled out something to the cameraman, and that's often what people tend to do when they're racing is any bystander or cameraman around often asks, how far is the team ahead of me or what time did they go through is as the competition heats up it's always nice for a musher to pick up any little tidbit they can but yeah we can see the weather has changed here as far as it's snowing here and it wasn't before she just picked up a little litter on the trail good for her looked like a booty may have been a booty yeah, I remember uh, the first uh, ditter on I ran, I think I picked up about 200 booties as I wasn't <laughs> racing. I was in the very back of the race, and I had enough new booties to run uh, pretty much the whole next season with, it seemed like. <laughs> but are they allowed that, to know anything about, get any information from photographers, <laughs> from people standing by? Well, it's just the reality. If people are there, you're going to ask them a question. You're not allowed to have planned help outside of the race like you couldn't say tell your friend hey go drive to this or pull your snow machine up to this point and then let us know what's going on but bystanders fans and often in a long competition and year after year the people like in our crew with the camera people get to know the mushers and they'll often ask how you doing or you know how long ago did they go through or just trying to get some little bit of information that's not planned help that's just conversation and often i mean you have mushers go by to a cameraman and go hey you want a candy bar because and toss them something so that's just the friendliness of these races but if you were to have planned help like send a group of people out there to do something for your your you or your team that would actually be considered a rule infraction and then the race marshal who we've seen before would have to adjust a time or a penalty for that okay so they might get a time penalty they could get a time penalty if usually a time penalty will be given by the race marshal if the musher did something that caused them to get an advantage to put them back equal now if it's something like let's say I'm going to pick something like litter, which they shouldn't have left. That's more likely to be 
a financial penalty. Okay, so but let, they don't get disqualified. Mm. Well, there are things that can disqualify you from a race, yes, but that would be a real extreme to ever have that happen. Like, for instance... Like, for instance... Uh, it depends on the race, It right? depends on the race. I know too. a few years ago in the Iditarod, they had a rule that said you can't use any sort of device, right, that, that could connect to a cell okay. or connect to a Wi-Fi as you're going through a village. And there was a musher one year that was seen pulling one out, and he was subsequently disqualified from the race and had to go home. So there are certain things, and I think every every race is a little different in that area. And if you don't have enough dogs, maybe? If you don't have enough yeah. dogs, you would be asked to withdraw from the race gracefully of your own choice. Or if you don't, then the race marshal will say you have to go home. So things like that, you know, that rule infraction that Greg's talking about, really, in all fairness, knowing the situation in the musher, it was an accident. He brought a two-way communication device, which happened to have his music on it. Mm -hmm. But regardless, it was capable, and it had been discussed in that rule. He wasn't trying to cheat. He was just getting his music out, but another musher saw him with that device and reported it. So it was a clear rule, and the race marshal had to uh, uh, enforce the rule, yeah. in fairness to all the other mushers. Yes. But as far, the only thing I think normally would make a race marshal withdraw a team from a race would be something to deal with the health of the dogs, because they're there to protect the event, the sport, and the individual dogs in the race. And often a musher is very tired and very exa exhausted, not often, always, and maybe their vision of what's going on isn't as clear as it would be with the vets and the race marshal, and that's why they're there. It's a safety net for the dogs. Also in the Iditarod, there's a rule that says the last team has to be within a certain amount of time or, or mileage of the front team, and if you can't stay within that window, they could ask you to leave the race as well. So it's just different on every race. Yeah, because during the feminine race, they are allowed to have cell phones. We already sure. have seen that mm -hmm. in cameras. Yes. Mm. yes. There's a lot of races with a lot of different rules. It's been a year, it's been a few years now, but I once added up everything I could look up everywhere. In Europe, in the lower 48, in Canada, <clears throat> and in Alaska. And some of them were just friendly races, but I came up with about 2,500 races worldwide in a year. And all of them will have completely different rules, completely different numbers of dogs that can be run, completely different prize money or no prize money. Maybe you win a turkey and a rifle, <laughs> but it, whatever it is. So there are a lot of races and there isn't one answer to how the rules work. You have to know each one individually and they change from year to year. Example of that, I did a rod used to allow 20 dogs. Now it's tw now it's 14. Now Nina, what's happening over at Orkelbogen? Well, Birgitte is expected in any minute now, so we just keep on rolling from here, I believe, until she comes, because I just had a word, some words with her handler, Chris Halvorsen, and he actually told me Birgitte was off trail, a little bit up the hills into the mountains. She lost trail, actually. That's why she's suddenly a bit behind, more behind Robert than uh, earlier. She lost trail, and she probably made a call down to her handler, because uh, as I heard you were talking about devices here in the Norwegian races. The mushrooms are allowed to have cell phones and we do at this place have pretty good connection, cell phone connection. So she called her uh, boyfriend and told him that she had been off trail but now she's on trail again. She had uh, problems because of the weather and the snow conditions uh, because it's not that far up here where you don't have any trees so it's uh, just going straight downhill from the mountains. So she's going to be here any minute soon and uh, uh, and that's why she lost some time right now to the leader, Robert Surly. And according to the Let's tracker, see. she's 2.8 kilometers out. for me, you guys? Kilometers out. It is the 30th anniversary of... Um, oh, yeah. Do you see him? You, you have any questions for me, you guys? Yeah, I wonder, uh, it's the 30th anniversary of the Feminine Race, and so I wonder, do they do anything uh, uh, special this year? Uh, as for uh, as for us, and I know they have like a, a starting banquet with a lot of uh, 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 
things, uh, cultural uh, things going on when they had the opening ceremony in the uh, very famous church, actually, of Rødos. And they do have some activities on each checkpoint. Um, right now, I don't focus so much on the 30 years uh, jubileum. jubilee. Uh, I've been focusing mostly on the race, so it's a little bit hard for me to know what's going on outside of the race. But I sure know that today they had like a family day here at the checkpoint. The children had some games they could play out in the snow. They made different kind of activity for the children. And they've had horse here, as you probably might have seen earlier today, with a sled. And you could do different kinds of things while waiting for the measures to arrive at the checkpoint. We are a bit curious why Birgit is not here yet, but if she must have had some detour on the trail now, losing trail in the snow white or there's, uh, the weather. But right now, the weather is much, much better. But as I told you earlier, it changes from minute to minute uh, in these areas. You know, guys, I want to say a little bit. I had talked to a man who works in the mountains, uh, like uh, mountain police or what do you call it? Like, um, uh, I don't have the right word in English. I'm sorry for that. But he said this is an area with a, a lot of wolverine living here all year, wolverines. And there are some links in the area as well. Actually, cool. this man I talked to, Ingebrig Stole, he had a family, a lynx family, visiting his farm a couple of uh, about 15 kilometer no 15 miles up from this checkpoint he lives on a farm and he had some a lynx family actually visiting the farm last night or was it friday night i'm a little bit confused about the days right now so this area is pretty well known for a very interesting wildlife and then you know wolverines are not as common in norway as they might be in alaska or canada so it's pretty cool to know that there are lynx and wolverine in this area and there yeah, has can, been can we, as well. Can we, we do just take a look at... Uh, I want to just to take a look on the screen here if we can see Birgit when she was up on top there and her leaders were having a little little trouble finding the way here. So we see in the this screen here where they're getting a little bit confused as to where to go. And this is before the wind got super uh, strong and we had very little visibility as we've seen on this mountain more recently. So this is a, a little bit earlier. We see uh, Brigitte having a little trouble getting in the right direction here. The dogs all seem perky and everything. Uh, lively, and we got our the black leader there trying to get over there, and now the tan one's coming along with. And it seems like she was having a little trouble staying on the trail. The dogs may be getting a little confused or distracted by you know, the snow machine that's with the cameraman, or just also just windy, and there might be other tracks up here. And sometimes, when the wind's blowing like this, we get bare patches of snow, or where the snow has been blowing away, and it exposes the dirt, and it can kind of look like a trail underneath there, and that can be really confusing for the dogs, where it looks like the ridge line that the snow is blowing away from is actually where the trail is. So here she gets going again, and then pretty quickly, the dogs start to get a little confused once again and start swinging back over this way. A little bit of communication difficulties here. <laughs> a little bit of uh, like, where are you guys going? What's it, what's over that way? Kind of communication for Birgitta, but it's uh, done well. Again, she can call the dogs over, and that the black one kind of helps pull the other one over there. Some wagon tails get them a little untangled, and head back on the trail. But this can be really, really challenging conditions. And again, just to keep it fresh in people's mind, this was a while ago. This was before the storm has really picked up. So we still have fairly good visibility right now. And some of the later images we saw from these guys, it had gotten significantly worse. So we're seeing some trouble back there, but now they're running in conditions like this, um, where it's a much stronger wind. It can be much harder for the dogs and the musher to see the trail and understand where they're supposed to go. Even more recently than this, we saw Petter Carlson up there, and we could hardly see him. We could see his headlamp through the, through the conditions, but how are you supposed to see where the trail is there? So I can see how it'd be very easy for a dog to take a wrong turn, for the musher maybe not to recognize that, or even if you recognize it, you might only be, you know, 50 yards or 100 yards off the trail. But in conditions like this, it's hard to know where the trail is. So as soon as you realize, you know, looking down from as the musher looking right at your feet next to the runners, you may recognize there's no trail underneath me. I haven't seen a stake here. Um, but then you will go up to your lead dogs and you don't even know where to steer them to. I've had times where I've had to set the anchor and start walking in one direction, hoping to catch sight of one of those uh, bamboo stakes that you see by the musher right now that indicates the direction that we're supposed to go. Those are the trail markers that we're following.
And this is a good example of where the musher really depends. The musher and the musher's safety is really in the hands at times of these lead dogs because the lead dogs can see and find the trail. The musher probably can't even see all the way up there. So this is where those dogs really earn their reputation of being so important to the musher. Your safety, as he's saying, you might be off and have to walk around, but that leader's up there saving you time. But also in a real life situation, just out traveling, those dogs find the trail. You can't see that far. So this is an example of the dogs taking care of the musher versus everything else we've talked about of the mushers caring for the dogs. And there's a live picture. It's possible that she's coming in. According to the tracker, she's still uh, 1.4 miles or 2.2 kilometers away from the checkpoint. Uh, of course, you know, there's a plus and minus Delay. margin of error with this, with this tracking system. But we have the live picture, which makes us believe that maybe somebody saw uh, the head of the musher or something moving down the trail. But... At when we do see weather, Brigitte, weather. this is the, the angle we should be seeing her coming from, coming into the checkpoint here. And I'm always watching the clock here. I'm seeing uh, already Robert's been here for 36 minutes. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a significant amount of time. He left the previous checkpoint four minutes behind Brigitte. So he's made up, I mean, right now he's made up uh, over 40 minutes on this past run. And that's where that speed factor is a big factor. When we look at somebody stop for 40 minutes extra rest, it almost seems like they're kind of seeding the race. But when you see him make up that much time in a single run, and that some of that could certainly be the conditions and the weather element that Brigitte is you know, struggling with. Maybe Robert made it through just in time before it got really, really bad. Although we saw Robert uh, contending with some strong wind up there as well. But that's a major time difference. And every second that Robert's sitting here taking care of his dogs and hasn't seen Brigitte come in yet, he's feeling a little more comfortable. There his team is laid down, sleeping already. Um, you know, if I was him, I'd be looking at the trail, looking at my watch and just counting the minutes and hopefully as many go by as possible for, before Brigitte shows up. And even those little things like we just saw in that where Dallas was describing her working with their leader, those are minutes lost in getting into this mandatory six. So that's part of this time period that she's losing, approaching 40 minutes. That's why these leaders here, are so critical. Here we critical. have sight of a dog team. This one's looking like a big one. Yep, this is... Uh, this is Brigitte coming in now. We have her arriving in the checkpoint here. Those are her lead dogs, same two lead dogs she had up front, or she may have gone down to single lead there. Recognize that tan guy for sure, but here she is coming in the checkpoint. You can see she's got her parker kind of back on just the suspender portion. Yeah, so she switched up into just uh, with the one single lead dog up there coming into the checkpoint. Yes, I can. I, I believe maybe she might have a dog in the sled. She has a dog in I the sled. I think so. I was just looking at the same yeah, thing. I think you're right there, Nina. Sled. Yep, I she's think that was the other the lead dog that she had up front. Birita, <laughs> what happened just up on the mountain? Uh, I had to use my GPS to find uh, the way. It was completely white and no, no sticks. How long time has the dog been in the sled? Uh, uh, just uh, from uh, when we lose the trail. Was it really bad up there? Yes. Really bad. <laughs> Welcome to the checkpoint. Thank you. It's good to be here. Okay. <laughs> She looks a little tired, a little sweaty, yeah, and, a little, and relieved, and a little relieved, and a little frustrated. Yeah. She kind of looked a little red-faced, sweaty there, dealing with that. That's a frustrating thing to work through. So, to our two champion mushers, I mean, it's a little over a 40-minute lead. Is that insurmountable, or is this championship going to go to Robert Surly if he just continues uh, his consistent run? If he continues his consistent run and they don't get balled up with weather like him losing a trail, it's, I, I mean, I always go to the phrase, it's his to lose right now. But these are our two top teams. I would be with teams. you on that, Bruce. I would be with you on that one. You know, 
Uh, we're looking at a, about a 39-minute lead just from my, my quick looking at the clocks here, so that may be wrong, but I'm looking at about a 39-minute lead. Robert uh, left four minutes behind her at the previous checkpoint, so we're seeing a yeah, difference of about 43 minutes, and I might be off by a minute here or there, but that's a pretty significant lead at this point in the race, especially since they're going to get a six-hour break. Huh? They're both going to have a bit of a speed boost from that. Now, we don't know which dog positively this is in the sled bag, but if that is the leader that we saw trying to follow the trail the most versus the tan one. And I'm suspicious of that because she came in with that single lead. That could have a detrimental yep. effect on this team because that is the lead dog that looked the best to me up there. Yeah, if the we, we don't know that definitively, but we did just see her pull the dog out of the sled there. And again, dog's perky and happy, but uh, obviously she feels like she can get to the checkpoint quicker and more effectively with, with carrying that dog in the sled. And again, these are all champion teams, but these little things matter. So, you know, that dog was just more responsive in the wind, but we don't know, I don't know positively that is the dog. She might have pulled that leader back for some other reason and loaded another dog, but. Uh, sure. We, we just got a glimpse of that team there, and it was not the same dog that was in lead. So she was rearranging her lead dogs, maybe mm -hmm. trying a different combination. And, and Bruce, I'm sure you've experienced this, where you have two lead dogs up there, and each of them looks at the other one and expects them to do it or is confused. Maybe they're a more passive dog. And if there's another dog in lead with them, they're going to be somewhat uh, deferential to that dog. So either one of them may do better on their own rather than a, in a pair. Yeah, I, I like a good lead dog single, so there's not a discussion. It's like baking a cake with two cooks, and they're debating how to best put the recipe together, whereas this, it's just the musher and, and the dog. And again, immediately getting a snack into these dogs. Now, there'll be a meal later, a big meal, but she wants to get some energy into them that she feels that they need after coming over that pass and doing that immediately. Everybody has a little different routine, but it's basically a combination of things that uh, that most everybody does. Again, securing her line out front to take pressure off that lead dog and also to just secure the line so they don't wander around. And what we what I what I do read from that uh whether she wants to give the snack now or in 10 minutes is that they're eating it, right? We see these dogs chewing on that. Um, they're, they're getting those calories in. They have a good appetite. And that's really encouraging to see at this point is that the dogs are still very interested in food, which means they're not tired. They're not too fatigued. They have a good appetite. She's having to keep that dog from eating his neighbor's food. You know, that's a really positive thing to see as a musher. You know, they've been on the trail for some time. They had a good run. And now we know that they're going to eat in this checkpoint. Some of that now, and I'm sure she'll get them a big meal here in a little bit. Yeah, get those booties off. What a day on this trail. Yeah. And you can see the sun setting now. Her headlamp actually needed to illuminate uh, her job and her duties here. But what a day it's been. Uh, the images that we've, we've been able to get off this trail today have been epic. I mean, nothing short of epic. And we, we at this point, if Robert goes on to win this, we also caught the winning pass uh, live on, on television. So uh, just an amazing day, I think, on this track. Yeah, it's uh, and uh, now the weather looks a little bit better too in the mountains there. Or it's hard to say. I mean, yeah. that all the weather conditions become more complicated at night for these following top ten teams because with your headlight on, you can even see in her headlight when she turns around, you see the snowflakes more. So sometimes it's it's advantageous to turn your light off so that it doesn't just make this explosion of white of snowflakes in front of your face. It's, it's a hard balance. It's much harder to get through that drifting, blowing snow at night than it is in the daytime. So these teams, if unless the weather changes that are coming behind them, are going to have a real difficult time. And see here, caring for the dog, stretching out those muscles, trying to get that dog to relax. Maybe she senses it's a little stiff in the back. Do a little yoga. Let's not forget, we also met a troll today. Yes. And we also had Max howling to Adele. <laughs> I and mean, uh, all the way around. I surely call this day crazy. <laughs> and uh, throughout uh, the night, we will see more mushers coming in to checkpoint Orkelbogen. And we'll probably all take a six hour rest there because six hours is mandatory either at Orkelbogen or at the Tolga checkpoint.
the 450 uh, uh, class in the feminine race are starting to get into the over, across the finish line tonight in uh, the streets of Rörus. And uh, the longest distance race, the 650 that we've been following, they are coming in early, probably around 8 a.m. tomorrow morning. Uh, we will continue to stream the finish uh, of the 450 tonight at krillpass.com. Uh, and we will update you during the whole, whole night with a, a live tracking. And uh, we will actually get the winner tomorrow. So it will be extremely exciting to see how the mushrooms of the longest distance will do uh, throughout the night. Now we're finishing off uh, with a, a look at uh, Dex uh, Carrington, our stunt reporter, and see what he is up to. Hi, this is Dex Carrington, and just like actors in Hollywood have personal assistants, just like Formula One have people who screw the cars when they drive into the side, the mushing world has something called handlers. With me is Thomas Werner. Can you tell me a little bit about what a handler does? With F55 dogs, I need help with everything. To train, to clean the dog yard, to treat the dogs, and uh, yeah, give them care, actually. So the handlers actually help me to make better care for the dogs. So there's two aspects to handling. There's when you're not racing, and there's when you're racing. What do they do when you're actually racing? Actually, then they are just providing me help. You know, the, all the things I need on the checkpoints, and uh, they're just following the race. But I have to do all the work. But they can give me food, so that's good. <laughs> but when, when you're not racing, does it feel like you have a personal assistant? Yeah, of course. It's very important. You know, if not, I have to do all of my work myself. That's a lot of work. That's a lot of work, and there's the proof itself. Mushers are basically the same as Hollywood actors. Done deal. <laughs>